Uh, good morning, everyone. We'll uh, get started with the April 25th, 2022 Community and Public Services Committee meeting. I'll start the meeting by acknowledging that we meet on the land, the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory, and acknowledge the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, including the Cree, the Dene, the Soto, the Blackfoot, the Nakota Sioux, as well as the Métis Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. I'll move to a roll call of committee members. Councillor Jans. Councillor Jans. Oh, we might have a tech problem. Just a second. Okay, just a sec. We've got a technology concern here. Just hang in there. Good morning. Good morning. Ah, there we go. Thank you. All righty. Uh, Councillor Tang. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Rice. Pardon, Councillor Rice. I'm sorry, Councillor Wright. Good Rice. morning. Apologies, Joanne. That's okay. Monday morning, very much. So. Didn't want to speak out of turn. Uh, uh, we're also joined by several other councillors today. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Stevenson is with us here. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford is also here. Good morning. Councillor Principe. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, and I believe that's it. Very good. Uh, I will... I might just do these motions myself since I'm here. So I'll move adoption of the agenda and uh, that the, I'll move that the April 25th, 2022 Community and Public Services Committee meeting agenda be adopted with the following changes. The additions of 6.2 snow and ice control, options to increase service standards, and 6.5 homelessness and encampment response strategy. Please vote. Second. Oh, oh don't need a second. We don't, but it, your enthusiasm is appreciated. In favor. Thank you, Councillor Jans. We have four votes. Please display the vote. And that is carried. Uh, approval of the minutes. I'll move approval of the minutes of the April 7th uh, Community and Public Services Committee non regular meeting and the April 11th Community and Public Services Committee meeting. Uh, please vote. If there's no corrections or changes. We have four votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Protocol items, I'm not aware of any. Uh, selection of item, oh, yes, selection of items for debate. Uh, I will start by selecting uh, 5.3. Uh, and 6.1, pardon me, 6.1 and 6.2. Uh, Councillor Jans. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, before I move them, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, I recall talking with you earlier about 5.2, that you wanted a specific due date for that item. Is that is now the opportunity to raise that or do I need to select 5.2? Uh, well, we have another inquiry request to select 5-2, so I'll, I will select that as well on behalf of Councillor Stevenson. Okay, um, excellent. Then I just wanted to make sure that um, uh, 6.3 and 6.5 were selected. Okay, I'll mark you down for those. 
Uh, anyone else? I see no one else on the table. Very good. Then I will move uh, that all items not selected for debate be approved. Please vote. We have four votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Madam Chair, can you please summarize what we've passed so far today? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This morning, Community and Public Services Committee has passed the recommendations of the following reports without debate. Item 5.1, amendments to bylaw 14614, public places bylaw, restorative justice practices, with a revised due date of November 28, 2022. And item 6.4, Edmonton Arts Council, grants and investments for organizations 2022, will be going up to council for a decision. Thank you very much. We'll move now to requests to speak. And I will move that Community and Public Services Committee hear from the following speakers in panels where appropriate. On item 5.3, uh, bylaw 19985, amendment to fire rescue services bylaw 15309. Uh, Perry Logan from the Canadian National Fireworks Association. On item 6.2, snow and ice control, uh, Stephen Rates from Paths for People. On 6.3, sidewalk maintenance renewal process, uh, Stephen Rates from Paths for People. And on 6.5, Homelessness and Encampment Response Strategy, Christy Morin from Green Alleys Edmonton, Jim Garnett from Edmonton Coalition on Housing and Homelessness, and Natalie Napier from In With Forward. Please vote on hearing from those speakers. We have four votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Uh, requests for specific times on agenda. We uh, do not have any requests, but I will note that the agenda as passed has uh, item 6.1 as first item, item 6.2 as second item. Uh, and depending on how our day goes uh, in discussions with administration, uh, 6.3 6 could be moved off to a future meeting if uh, we find we're running out of time today. So with that, we will move then to uh, item 5.2. Uh, now, uh, I selected this, uh, and I believe one of the concerns is that uh, there is not a specific due date for this item. And so perhaps if there's some commentary from administration about when we might see that. Yeah, Councillor Cartmel, thank you for that question. We're leading this work out of urban planning and economy. And at this time, there's no due date out um, on this because we're working on two things uh, that we don't have certainty around yet. Uh, the first is the governance review um, of the work that's happening out of the Office of the City Clerk. And we want to bring this for, uh, report forward at the same time as the Child Friendly Advisory Committee bylaw report. The second thing is that we are working with the federal and provincial governments on the child care funding agreement. And uh, we don't have the exact timing on when we'll have all those details worked out. Uh, but as soon as we have those details worked out, we've been in a better position to bring that report forward. But what I do want to um, uh, let committee know today is that we continue to advance this work. We understand the importance of child care for um, our city and for our economic prosperity in our city as, uh, as well. And so we are working right now, <clears throat> excuse me, with a number of stakeholders um, to discuss and find opportunities to support early, early learning and childcare in our city. Um, this work includes the zoning bylaw renewal, district planning, and our economic action plan. So the work's underway. Uh, and when we have more details, we'll be in a better position to get, put timelines on when this will come forward. All right, thank you, Ms. McCabe. Is there any other questions? Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thanks very much for that. Um, just just feeling a sense of urgency. Um, so wondering wondering if you could speak a little bit about any ongoing conversations with the Edmonton Council for Early Learning and Care. And, and just it seems too that there is some, 
I, I believe that some of their recommendations focused on a, a policy framework and action plan for the city of Edmonton that, that seems that it could be apart from the other considerations you were mentioning. Just wondering if that work could uh, carry forward while, while that other work is in progress. The work with the uh, ch early learning child care group is continuing uh, to be advanced. I'm not sure right now if we would do a policy or a strategy work. My latest meeting with them, I said one of the things we discussed was that there really is the importance of action in this space and um, as much as I think policy is extremely important um, coming out of a poly in policy intensive shop, we want to make sure that we've got the right actions for the city to carry out. Uh, especially in light of uh, the provincial and federal, uh, the federal government's uh, commitment in this space. And so we want to make sure we're focused on the right things. We're very much committed to working with them though. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. And I think, I think some of the questions were really around um, some of the land use decisions that we're making right now, the land use policies. So thinking of the zoning bylaw renewal, again, if there was a sort of a city policy that uh, you know, adequate childcare spaces had to be incorporated into new neighborhoods and that, that helps inform uh, the zoning bylaw renewal, which I think is just that timing question. Without a policy, we're making sure that we've got all of the childcare, um, all the ways that we can be a childcare friendly city in the zoning bylaw. I can absolutely assure you there's a number of people on the team who are very committed to that on, on that specific project. For things like uh, the number of spaces uh, or spaces within new neighborhood design, that's another body of work uh, that a policy could inform, but we want to make sure that we're as enabling as we can be in the zoning bylaw. Okay, so so right now we still don't have a sense of when we might might get an update? It's dependent on the two things. One, the governance review coming out of the office of the city clerk, because uh, we want to advance um, the Child Friendly Advisory Committee to Council um, at the same time as this report. Uh, the second um, thing is dependent upon um, uh, the work that we're doing with the federal and provincial Virtual, governments yeah. right now. And as soon as that's ready, I, I commit um, to committee and council that we will advance this, this report. The challenge with bringing the report forward without having um, bit more work done in that in those two spaces is that we want to be really clear about what the city can do and what the city can't do in this space and really focus on our jurisdiction and focus on some great recommendations that council can uh, help advance in this space. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that um, like who who are the the stakeholders or, or partners that you're um, uh, consulting with? I, I just want to make sure that sort of the unique needs of maybe um, non traditional hours, um, those working shift work in the in the trades or healthcare and that that their needs are also being looked after. Uh, or considered? Yes. Uh, they are being considered through that and we are working with Child Friendly Edmonton, I believe is the group uh, that we've been working with. Uh, we also work with any group that it, uh, comes to uh, it, uh, that comes to administration. We've had a number of um, actually applications for our economic recovery grant um, in the child, spare, child care space for people looking to be able to open new child care spaces. So uh, we work with businesses that come forward as well, Council Wright. Okay, great. So if, if I do have some interested in parties, I, interested parties, I can just uh, send them your way. Yes, please do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So that uh, I will move then the, the uh, essentially the recommendation at item 5.2 that uh, this will return to committee once uh, the uh, information and the further input that uh, Ms. McCabe uh, outlined is received. So I will move that. Please vote. We are just missing one vote, Councillor Tang. Uh, yes, for me, it did not show up. Thank, Thank you. you. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Uh, item 5.3. Uh, I only selected this because we did have a speaker registered, uh, but I'm not sure if that speaker is with us. Is Mr. Logan here? Because it noted that he would be in person. 
So, uh, not seeing uh, Mr. Logan here, then uh, I'll move the recommend or I'll move the rescheduling of this item uh, 5.3. I'm going to suggest a B uh, first item of business on May 30th, just to, to acknowledge that speaker. Please vote. We have five votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Uh, I'll just acknowledge before we move further that uh, Mayor Sohi has joined us this morning. So we have a full complement of five for committee today. Good morning. Uh, that takes us to item 6.1. Good morning, councillors. We are pleased today to bring this report and to share with you the Memorandum of Understanding with Big Stone Cree Nation. Administration is pleased to be joined today by Big Stone Cree Nation Chief Silas Yeloni and Mr. Clayton Oje, CEO of the Big Stone Group of Companies. In June of 2021, City Council approved the Urban Reserve Strategy, a framework for the City to better understand its role in the urban reserve process and to enter into discussions and relationships with First Nations who seek to establish urban reserve in Edmonton. The strategy emphasizes the importance of engagement between the city and First Nations early on in the process. In mid-2021, Big Stone Cree Nation officials informed the city that the nation was interested in looking at potential urban reserve developments in Edmonton and in sharing its ambitions for other forms of urban development. Conversations have continued since that time and Big Stone Cree Nation and City Administration officials have concluded that entering into a shared Memorandum of Understanding Agreement could serve as a helpful framework for further discussions. In line with the guidance from the strategy, City Administration worked together with representatives of the nation to develop this MOU. The Memorandum of Understanding is a non-binding relationship-based agreement. I would now like to invite Big Stone Cree Nation Chief Silas Yeloni to say a few words about this agreement and its importance. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank the Creator. Without uh, acknowledging him first in the mornings, that's one thing with the First Nation people, as we always make sure we put him first. First of all, thank you, Mayor and Councillor, for the opportunity to speak to you today. I want to thank you for passing the Urban Reserve Strategy in the summer of 2021 to provide us an opportunity to work with you in creating one of our own members for our members to live in the great city of yours. We acknowledge we are in a Treaty 6 territory and thank you for always being hospitable. As we all strive to true reconciliation, we all have a role to play. It is too early to think it's time to look past it. We need to look at it holistically to find the gaps and help fill those gaps to build communities and an individual both on and off reserve. Working together on the urban reserve strategy will help us with these gaps. Build true partnerships. We need to implement the United Nations Declaration of Rights on Indigenous Peoples with all our partners to build relationships, partners, including the City of Edmonton, to help us improve the lives of our urban Indigenous members and other First Nation members by providing a land base on this beautiful city, creating employment by building business to provide a better life for them. We need to invest for the future as our First Nations are the fastest growing population in Alberta. Our plan for investing within the city in the form of affordable housing and building economic enterprises. This endeavor will not only help build city capacity for our nations, but also bring much professionals back to our community and to improve our retention and recruitment strategy. We will help increase Indigenous participation in the labour market, increasing Indigenous entrepreneurship and support the growth of Indigenous-owned businesses. We have 9,000 plus members and only 2,000 live in our six reserves. We have an estimated of 2,000 members that live in the city of Edmonton. So we need to go where our members are and not expect them to come back to the reserve. We need to reach out and improve our services, making these challenges with them. Not for them, but we have to have them involved. We believe that investing in development, we can close the gap on labor shortage and be initiative, innovative to fill these gaps, to anchor from the city 
to the community. Think outside the box. Not only can we bring in resources, but also contribute to the city and the economy directly and indirectly of purchased goods and services. So again, I want to thank you for this time. If uh, you do have any questions, my CEO for Health Holdings would be willing to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as the Chief has indicated, we are now pleased to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you very much for your presentation and wonderful news. We uh, really appreciate you bringing us uh, and sharing with us this uh, memorandum of understanding. And it's great to, to have you here uh, to speak with committee. Uh, looking to my colleagues to see if there's any questions. Very good. We'll uh, go to Mayor Sohi. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Chief, for being here and uh, all the work that you have been doing with, uh, with the administration on this. I'm, I'm really looking forward to actually uh, uh, rekindling that relationship. Uh, uh, my questions around the, uh, the economic growth opportunities uh, by establishing uh, an urban reserve Want you to elaborate a little bit more on that, right? And my other question is related to the other items that we're going to be discussing today. This is an ongoing issue in the city and how we can tap into your wisdom and your uh, uh, practices in dealing with uh, some of the social issues that we're facing uh, because they are really holding us back. They're holding our community back. They're holding our members, uh, your members, and other members back as well as, and, and uh, they really tie into that uh, economic growth opportunities as well. So I just want to know from you how we can seek your guidance and your uh, your uh, your knowledge in in uh, in tapping into your wisdom uh, to uh, tackle those societal issues at the same time turn them into economic opportunities. Uh, thanks again. Uh Mayor, for the invitation here. And, um, we at Big Stone Cree Nation, uh, the government, our chief and council, you know, that protects and strength is spirit and intent of the treaties um, and the traditional lands for today and tomorrow for all our members. And um, right now, what we have is uh, we get funding from the federal government. Now, the stipulation of that is we have to spend that funding on reserve. Yes. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, red tape as to the do's and don'ts as how to spend that money. So with that, when having an urban reserve would help streamline some of that funding back to assist the members that live here in the great city of Edmonton. Mm -hmm. Something currently we cannot do, even though there are cries for help from our members. Yeah. Um, it's just something that we cannot do, which is why we create companies to help fill in those gaps where we can't use federal funding for. So we create our companies and any profits made by those companies is our money. So we use that funding to help fill in those gaps and those needs. And not only that, we also dedicate some of our trust funds that we've gained over our traditional land entitlement for access of these funding to assist them. Now when it comes to economic development, that is why we create economic development, we, why we create these companies. Our intent again is to find affordable homes for our members. And building affordable homes will create jobs, will create employment. And along that as well, we also have uh, sometimes startup companies established from that. Somebody has to own these houses. Somebody mm -hmm. has to pay rent. So again, that's why we create Big Stone Lot 25 Corp. It's the real estate arm within the nation. So sometimes we were able to charge marketable rent, market rent, sometimes it's affordable rent. We just got to find that balance. Okay. We would like to, what we do on reserve is something that we would like to offer to okay. our officer members so in if, So if we are able to create urban reserve, the potential to tap into federal funding for members who are living in the city. Yes. Uh, recently, federal government also announced uh, additional resources that they will allocate for indigenous housing. Right, so, so does that open up those opportunities as well, right? Yes, that'll open up those opportunities as well. Okay, good. Uh, thank you for that, and uh, you know, look forward to learning more uh, on this and engaging with you more. And um, I'm really excited about this. This is uh, uh, building on the work from the previous council, 
uh, on, on creating this. So thank you so much for being here today. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councillor Tang. Uh, thank you, and thank you so much um, for being here today and presenting on this really exciting, uh, I think, step, a milestone forward. Uh, and the relationship build. I also want to acknowledge, you know, we've seen some really strong support also from the business community. Um, the, the chamber has a wrote in a letter in support of this. So really happy to see this. Um, so just a couple of questions in terms of the MOU wording. Um, I'm wondering if the Big Stone uh, First Nation helped to create the wording as it stands and, if you're in, and assuming you're in support of the wording as it stands. Uh, yes, that is correct. Uh, we have been working really hard with uh, the staff of the city, and yes, we were involved. That's that's great to hear. Um, and then, uh, just in terms of the the properties and the land, I in the report it mentions that it's currently used to administer some corporate functions and to deliver programs and services. Uh, so I just want to confirm um, and curious if there's any future plans. Uh, uh, in addition to some of the housing services you had just mentioned? Yes, currently we have uh, a corporate office out on 163rd, 16310 and 100th Avenue. Uh, that's how uh, a lot of our programs, especially in our health area. We also purchased a building out in Inglewood on 12407 and 112th Avenue, uh, Big Stone Inglewood Health Center, where we have our Big Stone Inglewood um, our medical clinic. We have space for dental that's available for rent. And we also have our pharmacy. Now, the reason why we picked Inglewood to begin with in 2013 when we first purchased it was because it had the highest Aboriginal population in Edmonton. And it also had the lowest income within the city. And that was the reason why we chose that location. Um, just to help the community that way. Now, we do understand those are the only parcels of land that we have currently in Edmonton. Uh, we hope to expand. Uh, we are looking for land, um, again, for the affordable housing, for all the additional plans we do have. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, uh, I, I just learned something new today about Inglewood. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and I guess the question to administration then, uh, so as we move forward, say with Indigenous housing, like Mr. Mayor was saying, uh, I'm assuming that um, there will be continued involvement from the Big Stone First Nation as well in, in this regard. Is that, am I correct? Uh, <clears throat> yes, Councillor Tang, absolutely. Okay, well, thank you so much. Those are, those are all my questions. Thank you so much for being here again. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you very much. I, um, I, that was sort of one of my questions was the um, what urban land holdings that you did have available. So I guess my other question would be for um, administration. Um, is there, are there other memorandums of understanding with any of the other First Nations? Um, yes, uh, uh, Councillor Wright, uh, the City of Edmonton also has a memorandum of understanding with um, the First Nation, the Enoch First Nation, as well as the Confederacy of Treaty Six Nations. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions I had. Great, thank you, Councillor Stevens. Yes, thanks very much. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I know uh, it sounds like you've been having a lot of good good conversations with uh, city staff, and I was just wondering, um, you know, how we as councillors can uh, can support you and and the work that you're doing. Is there anything that you need from us that we can help with? Yeah, I think. Uh allowing us to be here today is a first good step. Um, again, working on that truth and reconciliation and uh, continuous dialogue between two governments, mutual respect. It, it's a very good step. And again, I thank you all for, for the invitation. Really appreciate it. Great. Well, and hopefully just the first of many, many meetings between us. Thank you. Uh, just to, on more practical matters, I'm wondering if, um, I know sometimes coming, coming to a new city, uh, there can be challenges in that transition. I know that we're looking 
to do some of that, just, just helping folks who are new to Edmonton to connect to services uh, and know what resources are available. Is there, is there anything that would particularly help your members as they're coming into town in terms of having, I don't know, information a ahead of time before they move here or, or services um, that make it easier for them to, to connect into town? Yeah, and I think uh, we we uh, would definitely use some help in that regard. Uh, we do have, when we send our members to school, uh, we have our post-secondary counselor that actually sits them within their school as well as introduce them to the Aboriginal um, liaisons within every school that they, there is. And uh, But any information about the city would be greatly appreciated that we can share with our members because I know it's a big cultural shock. I know it was for me when I came to school and uh, I'm not going to mention the year I came to school. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was definitely a big culture shock. And it's something that I do really radiate back to our young individuals that do come to Edmonton. And again, once they leave the reserve, once they come to Edmonton, it's really hard to convince them to come back to uh, work for us. And we have, we wish them all the best. If they choose to sit and live in this great city, so be it. How can we help them? And this is the things that we're trying to do right now because there are certain services we can't provide and this is one of the steps we can do to fill that gap. Yeah, I, I think it's a wonderful approach and I, I'm so excited that that, uh, that can happen, but, but uh, maybe just to administration, are there, are there any resources under development in terms of sort of, an, I, I know Bantero runs the New to Town program. Uh, is the city part of developing resources with them or do we have any of our own independent resources that can help with that, with that culture shock as you mentioned? Um, Ms. Miller is on the line and she can respond. Of course. Um, sorry, Councillor, can you, can you repeat the question? Of, of course. Uh, just, just really interested in, so knowing that Bentero runs their new to town program, just thinking uh, whether the city is developing any, um, I want to say like resource mapping, so just sort of like a welcome to town information package just to help connect people uh, into the services that the city offers and that, that other social agencies may offer as well. Um, education opportunities, employment opportunities, just any any of that information sharing or, uh, you know, a resource hub for folks that are new to town. Of course, yeah. No, thank you very much for the question. Um, so we do have an Indigenous Relations Directory um, that our office puts out every year. We try to, we try to update it annually. Um, it's something that is available on the Indigenous Relations website, so edmonton.ca backslash Indigenous Relations. Um, and it really is a very comprehensive directory of all of the health, education, workforce, um, you know, all of those um, services and programs and, and things that are out there in Edmonton to support people. And um, yeah, and so we definitely look forward to updating that obviously this year. Um, if there are, of course, other programs and services that are new, we, we try to add them as we can. We also have a community bulletin that it's an e, it's an e bulletin we put out daily. And it's also you can subscribe to it on our website. Um, and we really just uh, get submissions from directly from the community about job opportunities, grants, um, bursaries, you know, event and just community events going on in the city. So um, so those are kind of two resources that we, we do have. Yeah, no, that sounds fantastic. Uh, and it, uh, is the Indigenous Relations Directory, um, is that available in printed form to, to distribute or is it all, all online at the moment? Currently it's all online. Yeah, so it is a, it is a PDF that uh, you can download. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I think that concludes our speakers. So uh, again, thank you very much on behalf of committee for... Uh, for being here today. We really appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us and having the opportunity to, to have this conversation. Uh, I'm going to move the recommendation in the report and that is that Community and Public Services Committee recommend to City Council that the Mayor on behalf of City Council sign a memorandum of understanding between the City of Edmonton and Big Stone Cree Nation as outlined in Attachment 1 of the April 25th, 2022 Community Services Report CS01151. Uh, I'm not sure that anyone cares to speak to that. Um, so with that, please vote. Yeah.
We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that is carried. Very good. Thanks very much. You're welcome to hang around and talk about snow clearing if you want. So on to everybody's favorite springtime topic. Snow and ice. Over to you, Mr. Sebrick. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, good morning, uh, members of council, members of committee. Uh, this morning we are here to provide an uh, update on the snow and ice control program and options to enhance service standards. The snow and ice control program enables Edmontonians to experience a safe and livable winter city, ensuring the residents can safely connect to and access spaces, services, facilities, and transportation networks, no matter how they travel. In January, we committed to bringing you an analysis of the snow and ice control program, as well as options to enhance service standards. The options today are informed by a jurisdictional scan, GBA plus analysis, as well as counselor, community, staff, and stakeholder feedback. Every program and service has trade-offs. We believe the options in front of Council today balance the safety, mobility and livability of Edmontonians with value for taxpayer dollar. This past Friday, we received a snow and ice control report from our QP Local 30 Union. While we had hoped to receive this report sooner from the Union in order to incorporate it into our findings, we appreciate those who volunteered their time and commit to reviewing it in greater detail in the coming weeks. We've also conducted our own frontline staff engagement sessions and informed the options outlined today in today's report. Many of those findings are the same in both reports. With me today is Craig McCowan, our branch manager of Parks and Road Services, along with Eddie Robar, the branch manager of Fleet and Facility Services, and was formerly the interim branch manager of Parks and Road Services. We also have Val Dasik, Acting General Supervisor of Infrastructure Field Operations, on the call with us. We also have a cross-functional integrated team from across the corporation available today. This includes law, finance, communications and engagement, and community standards to help answer questions as needed. Edmontonians live in a winter city, and this is an incredibly important body of work that impacts everyone, no matter how they travel. Over the past few months, we have used a new lens to look at our performance, our service levels, and how we can improve snow and ice control service delivery and the experience for Edmontonians. I'll now ask Craig to walk you through our findings and present some of the options to enhance service standards. Thank you, Gord. <clears throat> this is our roads report card for the last winter season. It shows how we're performing compared to the service levels in our snow and ice control procedure. Our service standards are based on an average snow event and an average number of weather events per season. And we recognize that weather events can be atypical and so that includes successive intermittent snow in a short time frame, or rain and freezing rain uh, followed by snow, or significant temperature changes uh, resulting in freeze-thaw cycles. And we saw quite a bit of these fluctuations over this last winter. To address changing conditions, our crews need to be nimble and adaptable to adjust tactics to whatever is needed. So on this chart, you'll see in the first two columns uh, they show the type of road by priority level on the left-hand side uh, and the service standards identified in the snow and ice procedure uh, that need to be completed uh, to complete that type of road. The third column shows how much of our roads in that category were completed within that time frame. So just to note, the priority two roads, which are primarily cleared by hired equipment, have a lower percentage of completion than the other categories. But we don't receive a lot of inquiries or complaints about these types of roads. 
We face some challenges with our contracts, <clears throat> namely with inconsistency in ensuring that sufficient services are available during and after a snow event. It can take, it can take days to mobilize contracted services. Contracts would need to be reviewed and adjusted if further changes uh, to those service levels need to be made. The current service standard for priority four residential roads is to maintain a five centimeter snowpack to be completed within seven to nine days after a residential blading cycle has been initiated. So this past winter season, uh, we've been directed uh, to pilot blading residential roads to bare pavement. With this enhanced snow clearing standard, the city was not able to meet the seven to nine day time frame. This winter, we did receive a lot of inquiries and complaints uh, from residents about priority four roads. The service levels listed in the snow and ice procedure are based on an absolute level of completion. So 100% of the roads in that category. And we know that this is not achievable target, especially with peak heavy snow events. Based on the snow and ice audit rec recommendations, we're evaluating the performance measures and targets. And so part of the discussion we wanna have with council is about setting attainable expectations and seeking that direction. Along with setting new expectations, our biggest challenge is having enough available equipment and staff to meet our current service standards. Uh, these two key resources are intertwined and at our present staffing and equipment levels, they're not currently aligned. So without enough of one or both of these, our ability to provide consistent quality services to Edmontonians is limited. Uh, so just go to the next slide. Uh, one back, thanks. To accompany our roads report card, this is our active pathways report card. Just like the previous slide, it shows how we're performing compared to the service levels in our snow and ice procedure. Similar to roads, there are not enough available equipment and staff to meet our current service standards for active pathways. The first two columns show the type of pathway or public amenity by priority level and the service standard to complete these areas. The third column shows how much of that inventory was completed within that time frame. Our crews were successful in, clear in clearing most of the priority one areas within our current service standards, having a higher number or percentage cleared for priority one active pathways compared to priority one roads is not the result of cr crews placing a higher priority on clearing bike paths than arterial roads. These are maintained by different crews and equipment. The higher percentages show here uh, are in part a result of having fewer priority one pathways compared to priority one roads. Although our completion levels are high for priority one areas, they are lower for priority two and even lower for priority three. And just to note that our lowest percentages for completion uh, are the priority three areas. This 41.9% you see on the chart indicates the challenges of clearing uh, a large number of paths and surface areas, which take considerable time to maintain. Considerable numbers of staff are needed to complete the work, and this includes areas around city maintained bus stops and stairs. Percentage of completion for refilling sandboxes is also low. And so that 57.8%, uh, that gives the increase uh, given the increase in numbers of sandboxes over the past five years, and, and we'll get into that a little bit more in the next slide. Uh, active pathways also face some challenges uh, with contracted services who maintain selected priority one and two areas, such as civic facilities, parking lots, and walkways. There needs to be a minimum accumulation of snow to initiate a call out, and so response times are longer uh, than they are for city crews. Let's flip to the next slide. Here are some of the details of what has happened over the past several years and how we arrived at our current state of operations. Over the last five years, there's been a lot of conversation around how we maintain Edmonton's roads in the winter months. We have worked with council and provided follow-up on questions, shifted priorities and piloted new approaches. A combination of factors has presented us with new challenges, new changes and challenges about how to best use our finite and existing resources. And so these include multiple transitions and reorganizations across the corporation, uh, larger growth uh, in the number of Edmonton's roads and pathways, pricing inflation, budget pressures, increasing levels of service expectations, and changes in operational direction and service standards to meet those expectations. And so some of these changes and challenges occurred shortly after the formation of the Parks and Road Services branch. And the advantage we have now uh, is that we're mature enough in our reporting systems and as an organization to accurately measure our program to inform decision making to, rem to remain uh, steady through these changes. To summarize some of these changes within the last five years, our inventory of roads and active pathways and areas requiring service across Edmonton has grown by about 21%. We've also seen a 13.5% decrease in staff. And in order to keep our operations responsive and running up to 24 hours a day, our total number of staff are spread across five districts across the city and organized into a number of shifts, 
uh, four within roads and four within active pathways. There's currently 769 community sandboxes. And so this is an increase of over 400% in the last five years. This program is currently under review and may need to become an individually managed program if it remains uh, the same size. The snow and ice budget has decreased. Part of this was due to a reduction in revenues from the automated enforcement, uh, which resulted in a $5 million decrease. So in the report, they also noted uh, that there has been no net growth in our equipment inventory. We currently have 130 vehicles in total for roadways, and ideally 104 of those vehicles uh, should be on the road at any given time. But due to not having enough staff, we were only able to use an average of 57 trucks after a snow event. So that's equivalent to a 43% utilization of our entire inventory of vehicles, and that's not enough to meet our current service standards. So the key takeaways are that the service expectations uh, have continued to increase, but our resources have not kept pace with the demand in an ever-growing city that aims to provide an accessible, walkable, and connected mobility network that benefits all Edmontonians. Just flip to that side, thanks. In February of 2021, the Snow and Ice Control Audit Report was presented to Audit Committee. Administration accepted the 12 recommendations. Completing the performance management framework recommendation this past fall allowed us uh, to better evaluate our performance measures under current service standards, which enabled us to bring forward uh, the report cards uh, you saw in the earlier slides. So this work has provided us with new ways of looking at our operation, evaluating our successes, and where improvements can be made. And so we continue to work through the audit recommendations this year. In particular, uh, a number of projects are in progress uh, to develop cost reduction and revenue generation opportunities. Next slide. As a part of our comprehensive analysis, we conducted a thorough jurisdictional scan that included eight other Canadian municipalities, as well as Stockholm, Sweden. Key findings from this scan were that every city manages snow and ice control programs a little bit different, based on their unique weather, climate, density, infrastructure, service priorities, and other factors. Service standards, such as how long it takes to clear roads and pathways, and tactics to ensure accessibility are also uh, varied accordingly from city to city. Edmonton is closer to Ottawa, Montreal, and Winnipeg than it is to Calgary in terms of an average amount of snow on the ground. Uh, and Edmonton is mid-range in terms of budget and per capita spending. Based on our resources, uh, resourcing analysis of what it might cost to bring our current service performance more in line with these service levels in our administrative procedure, our budget would be uh, comparable to that of Ottawa. Next slide. Administration conducted a GBA plus analysis and significant engagement. We engaged with the public, frontline snow and ice staff, stakeholder groups, partners, and counselors to gather feedback about current and potential future enhancement options for snow and ice services. Our engagement included meetings, workshops, and surveys with departments throughout the city and several external stakeholder groups, such as the Accessibility Advisory Committee, Edmonton Seniors uh, Coordinating Council, Women's Advisory Committee of Edmonton, uh, and Edmonton Transit Service Advisory Board. Residents also had an opportunity to provide feedback through an open link survey. Uh, the word cloud that you see on this slide represents uh, key themes from comments received in that survey. So through our engagement process and GBA Plus analysis, we learned that the biggest concerns from stakeholders and the public were in regards to windrows and snow and ice covered sidewalks, safety and accessibility, and equity of service. Persons with disabilities, seniors, and users of public transit are most affected by barriers resulting from snow and ice. There were overall concerns about consistency of service across the mobility network, including bus stops, sidewalks, and bike routes. Results of the public survey showed that respondents were evenly divided whether the city should continue blading residential roads to bare pavement, and respondents were also split on the support of a tax increase uh, to enhance snow and ice services. Residents would like to see more real-time map updates or notifications during uh, residential road clearing. Before we delve further into the results of our comprehensive service level analysis, it's important to note that the snow and ice control operations provides a continuous level of service throughout the winter. Although our service standards have specific timelines for completion, the timer only starts when the weather event ends. So here's a visual representation of the snow and ice control operations and how this represents, or sorry, how this relates to our service standards. And just to note, our crews are always out, even before it stops snowing or raining. Roads and active pathways are categorized by priority level based on safety, and our service standards are measured by the time, uh, are measured by time from the time it stops snowing or raining. There's a sequence to how these priorities are cleared. For active pathways, priority one areas are started first, followed by priority two and three. 
for roadways, priority one and two roads are started first. This is possible because priority two roads are completed by contractors. Uh, as city crews complete priority one, they move on to priority three and then priority four roads. Completing priority levels in sequence allows us to be more efficient with our resources, and it's important to understand that when we look at our service level performance uh, in the next two slides. So we completed a comprehensive analysis of the equipment and staff needed to service our current inventory of roads and active pathways. And so this slide shows a summary of that analysis. Roads along the top and active pathways along the bottom. The first set of columns on the left show our current service standard by priority level. And the next set of column, uh, columns show how long it takes to complete these areas with our current resources, labeled as the current state, with the base budget at the bottom for what our current resources cost. So for example, priority one roads have a service standard of 36 hours. With our current resources, it would take on average 127 hours or 5.3 days on average uh, to complete all priority one roads. So one reason for this is that we do not, ha we do not currently have enough staff to make uh, use of all available vehicles. For active pathways, this slide shows we're meeting our priority one service levels, but it takes much longer to complete priority two and pri priority three areas. This is due to a shortfall of both staff as well as equipment. The next, two, the next two sets of columns show proposed options to increase staffing and equipment resources that would bring the program closer into alignment with our current service standards. So options R1 for roads one and AP1 for active pathways one represent a range of 40 to 70% increase in service delivery by shortening the time it would take to complete roads and active pathways. The annual budget increase for these two options would be a total of 42 million for a proposed total annual budget of 99 million. Currently, the snow and ice budget is 57 million. Options R2, roads two, and active pathways two represent a range of 60 to 75% increases in service delivery and would bring service delivery fully in line with our current service standards for an annual budget increase of 106 million and a total annual budget of 163 million. <clears throat> in order to shorten the timelines for completing priority, ro priority four roads and priority three pathways, Timelines for completing the other priority areas would also need to be reduced. So as noted on the previous slide, these are completed in sequence by the same crews and equipment starting with priority one. So although, the, although these are presented uh, as option packages for information and consideration, uh, there's also an opportunity to discuss a spectrum of services and resourcing requirements uh, and to adjust current service standards accordingly based on uh, availability of current and future resources. As per the council motion, administration provided a series of proposed options for new service enhancements for consideration. These are presented here, similar to an a la carte menu of possibilities. En enhancements have been divided into roads and active pathways, as well as a couple of options related to bylaw and parking enforcement. And so these enhancements are presented at a high level uh, of what that service would entail, the proposed service standard and a costing estimate. So these costs are presented for information only uh, as they're based on standalone costs for the individual services. Most of the costs listed here uh, are operating costs only uh, um, for a single season, with the exception, uh, with some exceptions, uh, such as residential windrow pickup, which is calculated per pickup, and senior centers, uh, which is a cost per facility. Only one of the enhancements include capital cost estimates for purchasing new equipment, and this would be uh, a proposal to purchase larger uh, trailer snow plows to increase snow clearing efficiencies on priority one roads. Uh, capital costs associated with other enhancements would need to be determined uh, depending on which ones might be selected. So in order to calculate true costs for these enhancements, uh, we would need to return with a programmed approach that would include those specific enhancements taking into account any efficiencies to be gained um, from shared staff and equipment. And it's important to note that several other business areas such as community standards operationally support the snow and ice control program. So any enhancements or increases in service for the snow and ice program would also need to factor in resourcing requirements uh, from these supporting areas as part of that fully programmed approach. And so many of these uh, enhancements would result in increased accessibility and safety, such as increased clearing of areas around bus stops and sidewalks along bus routes adjacent to private property. Uh, but there's some trade-offs. And so, for example, blading to pair paper Blading to bare pavement produces large windrows. These would need to be removed or managed differently, which would require additional resources. Any additional or any residential ca catch basins may need to be mapped and clearly marked, similar to fire hydrants uh, prior to next winter season. 
increased services in residential areas would lead to longer hours of work uh, and larger, number, larger numbers of equipment uh, noise complaints from residents. Uh, increased grooming of residential roads and cul-de-sacs mean that residents would need to move their vehicles more often. Uh, increased service for shared bike paths could result in increased seasonal parking restrictions uh, or more noise complaints. Uh, and there's, there's further details listed in attachment six. We're committed to delivering a service that will make a difference to Edmontonians. Supporting a safe mobility, we're supporting safe mobility and accessibility. In order to evaluate the success of any changes to service standards and resourcing, we would need to be able to measure our program consistently over the next few years uh, before making any large scale changes. This would also help manage the expectation of Edmontonians with clear and consistent communication. Further direction and work would, need to, would be needed from, for administration to return with a proposal on recommendations regarding an assisted snow program. So as we move forward, we anticipate returning to council with a report towards the end of June that would, that would provide an operational programmed approach with costing and resourcing requirements that would incorporate specific changes to baseline service standards and service enhancements pending to today's direction from council. This would require setting clearly defined outcomes and service standards for the next winter season, ensuring that service standards are attainable and aligned with available resources. Any funding requests that may be needed as a result of service changes and enhancements would be submitted as part of the 23 to 26 uh, budget de deliberations later this year. We'll continue to work, uh, we'll continue with work that is currently underway, uh, which will address some of the concerns we heard during engagement process and work towards continua, uh, continuous operational and service improvements. This includes improved 311 notification communications uh, and a workforce development project. So with these new ways to evaluate our work, additional resources, and a clear path moving forward, we can improve the experience for Edmontonians to live, work, and play in our winter city. And just quickly to go off script before I finish, uh, I just wanted to quickly recognize a few individuals who work tirelessly around the clock to uh, make this report, do the research analysis and investigation. Um, specifically, Jenna Frost, Oria Siemens, Sarah Jackson, Valerie Dasik, Stuart Kayrig, Andrew Grant, under the leadership of Eddie Robar. I just wanna say thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thanks very much for that presentation. Uh, we'll now hear from our speaker, and that's Mr. Stephen Rates, who's here in person. So we'll just let uh, Mr. Rates get down to a microphone. Right, so I think I'm coming through. Well, uh, good morning, Mr. Good morning. Uh, you've been here before, but just so everybody's on the same page, you got five minutes to speak, and there's little lights on that podium in front of you, so green for four minutes, yellow for one minute, and red means your time is complete, and then we'll ask questions of you. Sweet. Please go ahead. Yeah. Well, good morning, members of committee and all other members of council who are joining us today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Stephen Rates, and I'm here on behalf of Paths for People, which is a nonprofit organization focused on safer, more livable streets in Edmonton and making Edmonton a friendlier place to get around actively. Um, snow and ice control is a really key puzzle piece in the broader picture of ensuring that Edmontonians have transportation options when it comes to commuting and being active during the winter months. In our engagement with our community members across the city, we hear a consistent desire to improve our community's approach to snow clearing to ensure that it is more equitable uh, to people with more limited mobility and also ensures that everybody has the choice to get around actively. Failing to maintain our active transportation network to a high standard means more slips and falls and more trips to the hospital. As per Statistics Canada data between 2011 and 2016, Alberta had the second highest rate of hospitalizations regarding slips and falls in wintertime out of all of the provinces. So it is clear that those with more limited mobility are more likely to slip and fall or may not choose to go out at all during the winter months. 
People understand that a higher level of service means increasing resourcing for this service, but many also see snow clearing as one of those key municipal responsibilities from the city. And they also understand that the connection between a more walkable city and the larger city building goals that we have um, for within the city plan regarding 15 minute communities. The potential options provided by administrations, uh, administration are excellent ways to improve moving around Edmonton in all four seasons. And uh, I'll also quickly note that we were really appreciative of being engaged early on in this process and are thankful for administration's efforts to include community voices uh, within this report. Um, I'll specifically note a couple of the features that we were quite excited about. Um, of course, the kind of central part, the options to enhance service delivery, clearing active pathways, um, the heightened clearing or uh, shortened clearing times ensures that um, walking, rolling, and biking um, is a more accessible option and that uh, snow and ice buildup is reduced. Um, it creates more consistent connections within our communities. And I think uh, many of us have likely seen that, you know, infrastructure like bike lanes and that kind of thing become shared use paths and the kind of only safe route through a neighborhood um, during a winter snowstorm. And so we're really excited about the potential of even ratcheting this up more. Um, we, we were also quite interested to see um, the clearing of all residential sidewalks as an opportunity. And I think it's a really important one to analyze and though it could mean really big changes for how our city clears sidewalks it's valuable to engage with the idea and um, include it within a full spectrum of options in the decision making. Um, we were also quite excited to see the opportunity for clearing around intersections and alley crossings. Um, this is especially important as our neighborhood design standards change and um, the changes may result in unforeseen ice buildup and that kind of thing. Um, and so we're excited about that meeting, how we're building our city differently. Um, also uh, excited about the clearing of internal paved pathways. Uh, I think that really enhances livability and ensures park spaces can be used in all four seasons. And finally, um, the increase to uh, the increases to bus stop service, I'm mean, ensuring that um, that transportation choice um, or option for transit is just as accessible um, as we would hope it to be and that um, it feeds into the broader active transportation network. So we see that one as a really important one too. And so we understand that trade-offs may need to be made by council um, in prioritizing this funding and resourcing. Um, but like we always say, every journey starts with a walk and a roll. And so that is why we really believe it is important to prioritize active transportation in this funding. And so we look forward to continuing to engage with members of council on this topic and are open to taking any questions that you may have uh, for us today. Great, thank you, Mr. Rates. There are some questions for you. Uh, we'll start with Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, and, and thank you, Stephen, for, for engaging with the city too and, and providing um, your perspective there. Um, I'm just wanting to know, uh, do the active pathways um, include um, like access around the schools and that? I've, I've spoken to some trustees that they're, they're concerned with kids, you know, um, doing the, the walking school bus idea. And um, I'm just wondering, does, does Paths for People and, and active transportation in, in include those areas? Uh, so yes, certainly we would perceive that those, uh, you know, sidewalks, shared use paths in the vicinity of um, city owned land or uh, public green spaces are part of um, that kind of heightened network um, that uh, receives, yeah, uh, snow clearing from the city. And so we see that as really valuable um, because it is that closest connection point to a lot of those community facilities where people are going to go to. So uh, we really see that as valuable, certainly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I think that's all I had in regards to that. Thank you very much. I'll let Councillor Rutherford go. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, just a few quick questions. First of all, um, one thing that I've learned through, through this process is that even though we do clear some active pathways, there's, we don't clear all active pathways. When you were engaging with the City of Edmonton, did you look at kind of a map of where we do currently clear active pathways and where we don't make any recommendations in that regard? 
So um, in our engagement, which occurred uh, back in February when we had the opportunity to chat with the city, I'm, I'm not sure if we looked at a specific map, but I think okay. we kind of understood that the service levels do kind of change throughout the city and we would really like to see them enhanced and ensure it's more consistent just so that everybody has the chance to move around no matter where they live in the city. Yeah, okay. And then when you look at this a la carte menu, it says clearing all residential sidewalks will cost 212 million and include you know really looking at challenging the city in terms of time but also that they'd probably have to do it outside of regular hours so there'd be noise complaints that we'd so this is what i've learned for sure with this pilot project is the the the, the to heed mm -hmm. some of the unintended consequences but but for sure i can't imagine there would be an appetite for a 212 million dollar increase just for the, just for that so I know you're recommending that but I guess what would be for your um, uh, you know from your organization's perspective you know if that's not feasible what from a residential clearing sidewalk is there anything that you think would be a, a real benefit that is on that a la carte menu from that that sidewalk space Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think from our perspective, we understand that there would be some pretty incredible cultural change for suddenly the city to take on all residential sidewalks. Um, and so I think, you know, from our perspective, we're excited to like engage with that idea um, because, you know, that acknowledges that there is this full spectrum of ideas available to us and that some may make more sense than others. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think kind of the outcome that we would hope to come from this point of looking at clearing all sidewalks is that, you know, we can recognize that um, the network of uh, active pathways um, can probably be increased, like especially around some of those school sites and that kind of thing. Um, I understand there's there may be some jurisdictional questions too about who's, whose responsibility is it, but um, I think especially when we look across the whole city and we want more Edmontonians to have access to safe, clear paths, mm -hmm. um, that you know, that likely can include um, a little bit more than what we're currently looking at, um, especially in the vicinity of a lot of those um, community facilities like schools. Um, I think that, you know, that is where we can maybe see um, the city either itself or work with partners to she ensure that that is done to a higher standard yeah. and yeah, ensures that there is those options available to folks. Yeah, because I'm really grappling with with that because I think that often when you look at the, we're just speaking, speaking of residential sidewalks right now, that often the, the sidewalks that are not cleared are usually either vacant, have somebody that's maybe has mobility uh, issues or there's lots of other, so I know a lot of other, you know, in the jurisdictional scan it highlighted some of those other programs that, because, you know, as a, as a resident, I'd say in my neighborhood, I'd say, you know, nine out of 10 residential sidewalks are cleared within 48 hours. Mm -hmm. and, and those that aren't are typically, you know, either like I said, vacant or have some sort of issue um, with that, that snow coverage. So I guess I just wanna know from your perspective, do you see a bigger problem there? Or because I also think about the sandboxes and how that expectation, it was a courtesy mm -hmm. service and now it's become quite an expectation. And so I, I'm trying to flip that on the, the side of, you know, doing for instead of doing with community from a community development perspective. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, the response to the previous question that we were kind of working through. And I think um, especially when we see some of those sites where there are really troubling conditions and, um, yeah, just people don't get to clearing their sidewalk in time because um, they may have more lim uh, limited mobility. Um, I think usually where we see the greatest concerns kind of build up is where there's really high foot traffic in a neighborhood and that's you'd see that along some arterial and collector roadways um, so maybe it isn't the city taking on that entire responsibility for the all, all residential areas but recognizing where we are going to see greater foot traffic maybe that is where the city steps up a little bit more and then i think you know because community capacity is likely quite limited sometimes dependent on the neighborhood. Um, and so if we're moving forward with some of those snow and ice clearing um, kind of community led programs like Snow Angels, um, you know, instead of the community having to take on um, all of the work for all of the sidewalks, um, it 
could be more focused on those more local areas where you might see more limited traffic and less urgency in clearing. Um, and then for those collector and arterial roads, uh, you know, in some key uh, locations, it may, might make more sense for the city to step up and clear those um, to ensure that, uh, yeah, the network is more cohesively connected. So lots to Perfect. mull over there. Yeah, sure. I'm out of time. Thank you so much yeah. for those answers. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mayor Sophie. Thank, thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much for your advocacy. I uh, want to get a sense from you. Have you seen a significant uh, increase this year uh, in the mobility challenges and the lack of uh, snow clearing and sidewalks compared to, say, last year when we did not uh, create the kind of windrows that we created this year? So uh, I think reflecting on... Um, you know, the community's experience in the last year. Um, I think there's been some factors out of our control that have made it more difficult and that, um, you know, we have more freezing rain yeah. events and um, greater dumps of snow and that kind of thing. So I think it was a tricky year just for anybody to face, but I think um, in some of the servicing changes that were implemented this year really fulsomely with the, the windrows, that was a pretty considerable concern. Um, and that I know it was like being experimented with for the first time kind of en masse, um, but it did have a lot of unforeseen consequences. So I think, you know, we would want to avoid that kind of stuff in the future where there is a windrow in the way um, and that's something entirely within our control um, to do. Um, and then, you know, looking at the service overall and um, resourcing it more fulsomely to ensure that it's really well positioned to um, respond to, you know, greater variations in weather and climate and yeah. freezing rain and that kind of thing. Because that's one thing that I, we have heard a lot, but it's not, if you create a windrow, if you remove them, fine, but if you don't, then uh, the freeze and thaw cycles mm -hmm. uh, and water has no way to uh, drain because the catch basin is blocked and sidewalks becomes complete thick ice, it's very difficult for, for people to clear that ice, right? So mm -hmm. I think that's one thing that we have heard a lot uh, on the residential uh, uh, streets, posing serious concerns for people with mobility challenges, people walking to the bus stop to get a bus, or uh, people with using uh, wheelchairs and all that. No, I just wanted to get a sense from you. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, that concludes questions we have of you, Mr. Rates. Thank you very much for your presentation and for joining us this morning. And uh, we'll hear from you again later today. Uh, that moves us then to questions of administration. Uh, and I'm going to start off, and I'm going to start by putting a motion on the floor. And I'll, uh, I'll first read that in. I've shared that with the clerk. And uh, then I'll introduce it. And while it's coming up, I, uh, I will move that administration uh, return to committee with a report outlining budget options to support the following. Uh, number one, road option R1, uh, increased enforcement and the assisted snow program as outlined in attachment six of city operations report CO00778. Uh, I probably need to reformat this, but uh, number two, a detailed summary of amounts spent on contracted work for the last five winter seasons. And number three, a summary of benchmarking and operation metrics that will be used to monitor the efficiency and effectiveness of the snow and ice program uh, going forward. So uh, I'll just briefly introduce this for my colleagues. I, I view this as a bit of a starting point. This is not necessarily a, a preemptive thing, but it's uh, maybe to just to set uh, put something on the table and we can go back and forth on that. Uh, recognizing this is a committee meeting and not everybody has a vote today, we may have to see, uh, read the room to some degree and see where we're at. I don't know that uh, we'll get to a, a vote today. We may have to uh, move this to council to uh, allow people to vote on uh, either the motion in its entirety or to split it up and vote on different pieces. I can see this being a bit of that layered conversation. Um, uh, from my perspective, I think that we need to do something with the road network, uh, although I do have questions about some of the information contained in the report, and I'll circle back around to that. Um, uh, I do think that there's a need to, um, move to uh, investigate the assisted snow program. Uh, there has been conversation around 
why we do get some properties that don't clear snow and is that a, a capacity and capability piece and you know do we need to explore that further I like Councillor Rutherford I've heard from people in my word that or in pardon me in the word I represent uh, that uh, struggle to uh, clear those sidewalks and, and even more so when there's uh, windrows involved uh, and I uh, I'm curious about the increased enforcement and if we get more uptake when we're trying to clear the arterial roads when we call those uh, those snow events and try to do that work. So that's kind of where I'm starting from. Um, I'll leave it there uh, and allow others to ask questions and then I've got some questions of my own. Uh, and again, not trying to necessarily preempt anything but just trying to get us started on an effective conversation today. Uh, I'll go to committee members first. Uh, and so I will start with Councillor Jantz. Thank you. Can I ask you, uh, the mover, Mr. Chair, questions about this motion at this time? Yes, questions, uh, yes, to me as the mover. Um, uh, and of course, if we get to amendments, then mover mm -hmm. amendments uh, and to administration. All is uh, absolutely permissible. So I'm interested, um, how many years have you been a councillor, Mr. Chair? 132. No, four. And uh, in in, uh, in in cat years, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, Counselor. especially in um, because this is this isn't a, a, a mea culpa, but this is a as a new counselor. I mean, we we really look to the veteran counselors who have been through the the you know the snow the snow journey before. So I'm I'm really curious just about the third bullet um, and what benchmarking metrics are you looking for and what do you think would help better communicate roles responsibilities expectations with the public so my my point here and i was going to uh, eliminate this with questions i have for administration is that i'm looking at the audit report from january 6 of 2021 and that report had 12 recommendations and we saw a listing of that in the presentation earlier this morning and uh, two of those recommendations spoke to benchmarking and spoke to performance metrics. And those are checked off as completed. Uh, so it's not my turn to ask a question because I'm answering yours. But when I ask a question, my question is, okay, that says completed, but I don't remember seeing uh, a report that outlines what those metrics and benchmarking tests are. So that's my bullet is to, uh, what is it we're measuring? What is it we're coming back to? What is it we're going to be uh, uh, testing against? So that's my answer to you, Councillor Jans, but it will also be a future question to admit. I'm wondering, so I see the second bullet about the amount spent on contracted work. Um, if, if I recall, one of the main concerns raised by, by frontline staff was around also the equipment itself, both the, the quality, capacity, and um, durability of the equipment. I was wondering why the mover didn't include maybe a bullet or, or a concern around equipment. Is the, is the mover satisfied with the, the equipment we have? Uh, well, I, not necessarily. Uh, my question is around the dollars. Uh, and, I, and perhaps that's my focus. I, and again, not to preempt any other uh, amendment or any other question. Uh, but we're talking, you know, primarily about how much money we spend on snow clearing, what our current budget is, uh, and how much we want to add to it. And part of my question is, uh, you know, around how much we're spending on contracted services. And I want to follow up on some of the presentation uh, material that was sent, is put here. So maybe you want to uh, let me ask those questions when it comes to my turn, and that might be helpful. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, that. Uh yeah, just trying to get a better understanding of the motion there. I'll, 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 uh, I'll leave my time at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Um, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just wondering, your third bullet there, the, the summary of benchmarking and, and operation metrics, are you thinking that maybe our, our standards are set, our service standards are set too, too high and the expectation of, of residents is is up there as well well I want I want clarity on what uh, just what those I mean we've, we're talking about performance standards I don't know that we're I don't know that that checks the box from the audit report that's my question 
Um, you know, so uh, in terms of, of effective use of personnel, effective use of equipment, what, what are our metrics and what are our benchmark standards? I mean, we've, this report speaks to a bit of a jurisdictional scan. Are we going to continue to circle back to those jurisdictions, for instance, and measure against them? These are my questions. And that's why, you know, through this motion, I'm asking those questions. Uh, and again, I would, I, you know, as I ask my own questions, I would inform that. So, uh, but I do think there is a question around um, our, our current performance standards uh, and whether those are attainable and whether they're attainable with the equipment that we have, either uh, the size of the existing fleet or the makeup of that fleet or the condition of that fleet. Um, but I also think that uh, to a certain degree, we need to figure out what it is we can do with the equipment we have before we start talking about layering on extra services. But now I'm not sure I'm answering your question anymore, so I'll stop. So now I'm not sure, do we have anything in there to, to have them look at the equipment? Well, I think Councillor Jans just asked that, and so I suppose you might direct that question and <laughs> offer an amendment to the motion. Um, so could I put a friendly amendment in there to a summary of not just the benchmarking and operation metrics, um, but also of the equipment condition and utilization. Yeah, if you want to, uh, if you want to craft a fourth bullet, I think, you know, from a prospect perspective, uh, uh, amendments are obviously welcome. Okay, I'll, so I'll work on that. If you have um, a bullet, I, I yeah. just want to go into your first bullet there about increased enforcement. Um, I, I do have some concerns with our enforcement and speaking with admin on other topics like the, the, the fireworks bylaw amendments. Um, it's been mentioned to me that um, we could face, and maybe this is to administration then I guess, is, is we could um, sort of face some liability if we put, in, put into effect bylaws that we are unable to enforce. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering, do, do we need to ramp up our enforcement to, to avoid that liability? Uh, Councillor, perhaps I'll uh, ask our law partners on the call to just provide a little bit of insight in terms of what our liability is in terms of our responsibilities, not only for enforcement, but also service delivery. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Council. Um, my name is Anna Turchakarhud, and I'm a litigator uh, with our law branch. And so with respect to our liability, uh, the City of Edmonton relies on our defense in the Municipal Government Act, which is a defense of gross negligence. So the city has to be grossly negligent to be found liable for a snow and ice claim. With respect to that, we also rely on our bylaw, which um, typically uh, sets out that the adjacent property owner has to clear the sidewalk uh, as part of that defense. So if the adjacent property owner doesn't clear the sidewalk, we don't enforce it. So the cases have held that in order for the city to be found liable, the city would have to know that the adjacent property owner had not cleared that sidewalk because of the amount of sidewalks that we have in the city. So liability will depend on whether the city received a complaint, a 311 complaint or otherwise with respect to that sidewalk. And if so, what at that point we did about that complaint. And what if those sidewalks are on city property? That is a different uh, consideration. If those sidewalks are uh, our property, it's still gross negligence. That is a very high standard. Gross negligence has been held to be a very uh, high level of negligence that has to be proven on, on the city. Uh, but in those cases, obviously, we're, we're not relying on complaints because we are the ones who are responsible for clearing those sidewalks. Thank you. And my time is up. I'll come back around. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Sohi. Thank you. So uh, questions to admin on the, uh, in, a, in a broad sense, we have seen the inventory go up by 21%. And then we have seen the budget 
decreased from 2017 to 2022, right? And then we have service standards that are maybe unrealistic. That's correct. Right. So when we design our communities, I'll start with the first one. Do we do life cycle cost analysis when we design communities, build new infrastructure, the impact of that on services? And because uh, that's exactly what we're seeing here, right? Uh, we haven't matched that inventory growth with uh, with proper budget. Uh, Your Worship, we, we do uh, factor that in when we're developing new pieces of um, the city uh, in terms of specific uh, pieces of infrastructure. If a roadway is added to a network uh, on a one-off basis, it's not always. Um, it, it, so for example, an, a, an a new piece of infrastructure would have an operating impact to capital if we're building it, uh, if it's part so of So if we do factor that in, then why budget did not go up over the last four years? I think part, there's probably a couple of things in terms of the budget, why it didn't go up. I think overall as a corporation, we were trying to hold um, a, a very fiscally prudent budget position across the corporation. So when there were incremental increases in inventory, what we tried to do was manage it through looking at operating efficiencies and doing things differently, yeah. knowing that there was balancing across the corporation in terms of different challenges for resources. So we really were trying to manage those incremental changes. If we were, say, for example, adding a very, uh, you know, as an example, if we were adding a new whole new neighborhood to a city that would be a significant one but if it's these individual ones those are the ones we've been trying to manage on a one-off basis by just being more efficient yeah because what i'm struggling with and i understand it i absolutely get it that when your inventory goes up you need to add budget to uh, maintain the service standards that we have established what i'm struggling with is that all of a sudden in order to meet those standards to live up to people's expectation we're looking at two and a half percent or more tax levy, which is not fair to this council. I think you've summarized something that everything is coming to kind of a, a head or a realization now, and it's been something that's kind of building up over time. The difference, I would say, Your Worship, today is that the assessment we've done is really looking at a base level of service for uh, and resources for today. And I think over time what's happened is we had a level of service that was built many, many years ago, 20 plus years ago, and it wasn't built on a, a ro as a robust analysis. And from there, over time, we would just look at an incremental difference, not really knowing if that base was correct. So we would always assume that the base was correct. I think today what we've done, and it, it, is, it is a tougher discussion because we've really looked at what the base is and what do we need to do that base yeah. work. Yeah. So can we take a gradual approach uh, in a way that over maybe three, four years that we look at service standards and whether they are matchable, I mean, uh, uh, reachable and achievable? And if they're not, then be honest with Edmontonians. And if Edmontonians still want, then there has to be a price paid or a tax levy that has to go. Because I think it's, we have other priorities as well. We have uh, other uh, challenges to deal with from housing to climate change and all that, right? So if we just look at doing this all at once, increasing the levy to a level that we won't be able to do anything else. So I just want to know, would this motion from Councillor Cartmel will allow you to take a gradual approach when you come back or propose a gradual approach when you come back that will allow us options to, uh, 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 to g slowly increase the budget instead of having... Uh, uh, one big jump. Uh, Your Worship, I, I think that the way that the motion wor is worded now certainly gives us flexibility to present a phased approach. Um, and, you know, the, the phased approach can be such that it's all at once or over a period of time, yeah. but we can certainly uh, take okay. that approach. Okay. We realized that there was certainly, you know, competing priorities for the corporation, and we know that what we presented today is a big... Uh, um, big number, but we also realize that there's some flexibility depending on discussion. So that's one approach. Or another approach could be that having a very comprehensive conversation with Edmontonians, uh, really talking about the realities that we're facing, maybe having a one-time dedicated 
levy that we can clearly communicate that if you want your roads to be cleared in 36 hours and 48 hours and 72 hours based on the priority areas, then we say, okay, this is what it's going to cost you, and this will be, will be one tax levy that we put in at top of what other stuff we need to do. Uh, I, I believe that is an option, but I would ask Ms. Padbury uh, just to comment on what that potential for a specific tax portion could be. Yeah. You, you are at the will of council free to dedicate any portion of the levy to build a base budget gradually. I'll come back to that in a second round, Councillor Cartman. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, next will be Councillor Rutherford. Great. Thank you for this. Um, so much to unpack in this, in this report. A few questions I think I'll start with is um, right now this motion on the floor, this is to administration doesn't include anything about the active pathways option AP one. So that would need to be added if we wanted to explore that as well. Correct. Okay. And um, what I'm confused about is when we have this report, it said that you needed sort of some direction today and then you were going to come back and, and discuss service standards and budget in the June meeting. So are all of, aren't all of these points mostly, aside from kind of giving you that direction on R1, increased enforcement or those kind of things, did the other two points, were they already planned to be discussed at that budget, at that report, or did you need that council direction? So those weren't specifically going to be discussed in that meeting. Okay, so you, did need, you do need that council direction to have those all in one package again? Yes, to present them. We were yeah. doing that work, but certainly to bring them back as part of that report, we would uh, welcome this direction. Okay, great. And then the service standards, you know, you, you, may, you made a comment there about the baseline, but the, the service standards were changed, weren't they, in 2021? The policy and those sort of target service standards? Uh, there were some minor changes in 2021, not significant though. Okay, I thought that my understanding was that that kind of those targets of, you know, 36 hours for P1, the 48 hours for P2, et cetera, that are in the expectations or those in that graph in the policy, was that not adjusted? Th those were, uh, I believe, maintained. They were uh, uh, that level prior to the amendments in 2021. So what was what was changed in? There were some minor changes. Uh, I'd have to go back and, and look at those specifics. We could get you that. Uh, okay. Over the course yeah, of that the would be. The, that would. <clears throat> just to, to jump in, sorry. The the largest change was taking the operational component and putting it into the administrative procedure, and then keeping the policy more at a at a policy level. So that that was the biggest split back in 2021. Okay. But the 36 hours, the numbers, like the quantity of time, that's been in place for uh, since 2009. So, but that's one of the big rubs, right? Because then I get calls to my office from people saying, well, you say you're going to clear active pathways within this time, and this pathway that I rely on hasn't been cleared for six days, right? So that's the rub that we're feeling right now. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. And another question I had is around the, the a la carte menu, specifically around uh, seniors' facilities. And sidewalks because I know again it's interesting and and Gord uh, sorry Mr. Severick or Mr. McEwen if you could uh, elaborate on this but not all seniors facilities right are are have enhanced snow clearing right now what categorizes a seniors facility that has snow clearing and one that doesn't Uh, Councilor Rutherford, I'll, I'll ask if, if Valerie Dasik would be able to describe that detail. I, I, I'm not sure that level right now. Thank you. Only city-run uh, facilities for senior centers are uh, have that extra level of snow clearing. So if you have a seniors, what about seniors' residents? Most of those are not included. So they're not included right now? Correct. Okay, because that was, that was very problematic uh, in terms of of that so I know it was actually a nominal fee the 2.1 million or 2.1 K it says 2.1 K so not even million I think that that nominal fee for 
those seniors because I heard so much accessibility issues and concerns with seniors. So um, again, I cannot make a motion. I cannot amend this motion. I'm not on this committee, but if this was to go to council, I think those are two things that I would like to see amended in this motion is around the seniors facilities and um, making sure we're also looking at the AP1 option as well since we're gonna what, since we're gonna go there, I think and we're, accessibility is a huge concern for, for our area. The last question I had is, uh, you said that contractors um, do priority one and two in terms of the active pathways, but they're only called out if there's a certain amount of accumulation, so it's not that, That's correct, there are some challenges with those contracts as well. So. Um, there needs to be a minimum level of s snow accumulation before those contractors are And what's that covered. minimum? I believe it's two centimeters, but I can... Okay. No, that's good. I'm out of time. I'll come back for another round. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Neck. Uh, sorry, just to check. Uh, did Councillor Tang have her first round on committee? Oh, sorry. I didn't see Councillor Tang not on my... Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Councillor Tang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Councillor Neck. Um, so, I guess... Just so we're clear, uh, with this option R1, oh, sorry, with a motion that's on the table, you're modifying what's the R1 with a couple of additions. Is that right, Councillor Carmel? Essentially, uh, the motion right now, uh, adding the option, the road option R1 to the yes. current condition. Yeah. And, and that would uh, maintain the the, the current blading policy, um, is that right? Well, the current blading policy is the five centimeter snowpack and that's what we would maintain. That that's what we will maintain, okay. Um, and so, okay, no, that sounds good. Uh, I guess to administration, first I, I want to, you know, acknowledge um, and recognize Mr. McGowan's um, Recognition at the end there, I know there's a lot of time and a lot of staff, you know, efforts and energy put into this. This is not a small report. It's a very, there's a lot of heavy lifting. So I want to acknowledge and thank you for that. Um, I think, you know, there's a there's a lot of frustration that came out of this winter uh, and uh, it's it's not to undermine, you know, the work that you have done. So thank you for, for, for this. this is very thorough. Um, I guess one thing I've been, uh, thinking about to, you know, can you, I guess, speak to a little bit of um, some of the stuff that happened this winter with blading? Um, I know that the inside survey, you know, Edmontonians are very split, uh, but your own report outlined uh, that the challenges outweigh the benefits um, and then the blading exacerbated the extreme ice on the road during freeze thaw that further impacted, you know, all the active and sidewalk system. Can you speak to this and how to prevent that from happening? And if you agree that blading was in fact some of the cause of, of some of the challenges. Yeah, thank, thanks for that question. So the, the blading to bare pavement this winter, um, we certainly got a lot of feedback from residents, um, from staff, uh, and there's trade-offs. So there is a safety benefit to blading down to bare pavement, um, and, and we do know that. Uh, but it, the trade-off is larger windrows. Um, and so there's ways of managing it. We do currently remove windrows in select areas, but we don't remove all windrows. Um, so there is a trade-off in terms of um, accessibility, uh, parking, um, and, and certainly when we saw the, the, the large thaw at times, um, the drainage issues as well. Uh, so it is an enhanced level of service. It does come with, with certain safety benefits. Um, but the, but the trade-offs were certainly very visible this year, and, and it was a challenging winter season. And, and Councillor, just if I could add to uh, the, the uh, comment around trade-offs, in terms of bare pavement, when we bladed to bare pavement in a residential area, the actual time that we had bare pavement was, uh, it was very short-lived because um, the bare pavement, uh, you know, isn't an ongoing or regular uh, event event so you know once we b b blade to bare pavement uh, after that snow event that's uh, maybe it's only one or two centimeters you do have some level of a snowpack again so the actual bare pavement is um, it's a very limited time frame okay well you know I've, I've I've also heard a lot of feedback from residents but also from frontline workers 
I, you know, we know that the QP30 uh, has submitted actually a very thorough report, uh, almost like their own program service review. I thought it was actually quite well done. I'm wondering how much of, um, you know, I know you've held your own staff conversations as well. I'm wondering if you've seen the report, what do you think about some of the recommendations there? Uh, you know, have you incorporated or consider some of those pieces, which are, I think are very important um, in terms of taking that frontline experience into consideration? Yes, so we, we did get it. We just got it on Friday. Um, we read through it. There was a lot of things we agreed with. There's some really good ideas in there. Um, for example, you know, redrawing district lines and things like that. A lot of operational improvements that we certainly intend to take away and, and continue to improve upon our business. Um, we, uh, we, we did get some, some feedback uh, from the union previously and we incorporated that verbal feedback into the report. Uh, and there were a lot of consistent messages from uh, the report from QP30 and what we heard from staff surveys as well. So uh, certainly a lot of, of uh, um, takeaways for us to, to continue to work on. Yeah, um, I'll probably come back for a second round. And I, you know, I certainly hope that communication keeps up because I think if, if there's a lot of alignment, I, you know, I think we really need to work much closer together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, for putting in all of the work into this report and providing the level of detail. This is, I think, the first time in, in my you now third, third term where I think we've had this level of detail. Um, so it's, it's good to see and to start working from this point. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about blading in the report uh, for the options. It talks about if we were to blade to residential and to bear payment after every snow and ice event, there's the total amount of 143 million. What I'm trying to understand is what's the delta between blading to five centimeters versus blading to bare pavement? Not, not after every snow event, but comparing one five centimeter event to one bare pavement event, not including windrow removal. Uh, Councillor Nack, we'd, we'd have to take that away and, and calculate that delta. That's not something we have on hand right now, but happy to, to look into that further. Okay, I, I think we need that information. And sorry, you're hearing me type, I'm making a few notes on that. Um, uh, because that that is a separate conversation from the, and I think this notion of blading to bare pavement, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's worth, maybe I'll ask probably, I don't know who's been around as long as I have now for this, but, but uh, even when we blade to five centimeters, which we didn't really do all last term, uh, we only really did it during my first term on council, still created substantial complaints from residents every year, correct? Uh, uh, Councillor, I think that's fair. Is that the majority of uh, 301 complaints and inquiries we get are focused on the residential areas? Yeah, so I, I and the reason I bring that up is that I, I don't think the issue is so much whether we blade it down to pavement versus blading down to five centimeters, it's whether we actually are willing to, to do the next step because uh, that will exist either way. And yet there was an added, so there was a, there was a new accessibility issue due to the size of windrows this year. Uh, because this is, I think, one of the highest snowfall volumes in 20 years that we saw. Uh, but there was a new and accessibility improvement in terms of being able to cross the street, as an example, which we didn't have in any of the years past, correct? Correct. This this year, uh, as part of the pilot, we did uh, commit to blading uh, the crossing points at the intersection. So that was a change in uh, service level. Yeah. So that's the other question I want to ask here, because uh, and I, I was a little surprised by the numbers. So am I correct in reading this and that the 47.6 million to remove a windrow, that is, it says up to four times per year, but the 47.6 says per pickup. So am I correct to saying if you wanted to do that just one time, we're about $48 million to remove windrows? Uh, no, it's... it's um... The cost is calculated on a per pickup basis, but that 47 is four times. So per pickup is around that 12 million. So and $12 million to remove all the windrows once, which okay. I think is a really important number then, because I think that's a very different conversation to be having with residents than four times a year. I think even if we had gone this year with the sheer volume of snow that we had and removed them all once, that would have made a world of a difference. And I guess I wanted to get your sense of that as well. I mean, I, I think asking to do it four times a year is way too much, but had we done this in 
you know, January, as an example, as we started to see so much accumulation, that likely would have made a measurable difference, would it not have? Uh, it, it likely would have, yeah. I, I think the um, I think the challenge would be the scheduling uh, of equipment sure. to people and building that into the program and what that would look like. So having the ability to, um, I guess, understand the quantity of rune wheel pickups per year um, would help us schedule that and be more effective, but uh, certainly sure. something we can... Absolutely, yeah. That's something I'd like to chat about as well on that. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank and, you. Uh, Councillor, if I could just add, also, if we, we were planning on doing a wind roll pickup, we would change the operation slightly in the way that we blade and where we create the wind rows so that uh, it would be easier to, to remove. Makes perfect sense. That's great. Um, I want to ask about the enforcement piece. Um, a number of years ago, we talked about how bylaw officers still can't use their smart device to submit all of the necessary paperwork for a bylaw infraction they still have to go back to the office and submit it essentially manually or on a computer at an office. Um, where are we in terms of addressing that? Because I, I worry about adding more staff when I feel like if we could simply make that process improvement, the efficiency of our bylaw officers would be multiplied by a, a, just a huge amount. Uh, Councilor Nack, I'm just gonna see if our, our by law enforcement team. We have uh, Chantelle on the line. We'll just see if we can have uh, her answer that one in particular. Thank you. Yeah, good morning. Chantelle Perizzolo with uh, Community Standards and Neighbourhoods. So we did introduce uh, a mobile app um, last snow season, which did provide some efficiencies where officers were able to conduct some work while in the field. Um, it doesn't provide us the tool to do all of our work in the field. There is uh, still some circumstances where we have to go back to the office um, to do some research, but certainly it has created some efficiencies um, well out in the field. Okay, I'll have more questions. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor... Jumped around to me. Councillor Principe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question for administration. Uh, as I recall, uh, during the fall supplemental budget, we had approved a snow site on the south side, is that correct? Uh, there was no additional um, sites created other than we have a, a satellite site that we were building, but that was approved prior to, uh, to the budget we had intended on moving that forward. Okay, so sorry, does that site exist now or is it being created? So that's an existing site that we were just making um, some modifications to use that for snow. It's our Ellerslie facility. Okay, or, so... Uh, was, sorry, Councilor, sorry? were you referring to the Ambleside site? Yes. Okay, yes. so the Ambleside site, that is um, that was uh, for the ultimate... A configuration for the design work and moving that project ahead but that wasn't anything that was implemented over the course of the winter no correct when will that be implemented when is that expected? so that the, that was included in the uh, 20 to 23 budget cycle um, the design work was scheduled to start to take place and then the capital work in the next budget cycle okay so we're still looking down the road for that Correct. Okay. Um, and then you had reported that we have 104 vehicles, but only 57 are being utilized at a time. Uh, and so in the, um, in the attachment six, we see um, buying six double wide trailer snow plows. Is it necessary if we have um, many underutilized pieces of equipment? Yeah. So the, the, Elevating the base level of service would be able to um, be putting people into the vehicles that we currently have. The, the double wide trailer would be an addition above and beyond elevating that base level of service. And what that would do is just create, um, uh, you would require fewer people to uh, plow or more lane kilometers on, uh, on some of the um, arterial roads. Okay, I see. So it's more of an efficiency piece. Yeah, uh, Councillor, it, it would allow us to redeploy other vehicles to other places. So 
it, and essentially we have a 69 hour window on R1s in that option one. And if we mm -hmm. use the trailers, we would be able to decrease that time by deploying the, the double wide trailers on our freeway sections and then redeploying those vehicles to other places in the city. Okay. Okay. I see. And, uh, so with the contracted services, what are we doing to ensure, uh, they're, uh, doing consistent, uh, good work, I guess, uh, in the, um, motion that um, Councillor um, Hartmell has put forward, will that include the service that the contracted work is actually doing, not just the cost, but the actual service they're doing? Um, what we, yeah, what we have is um, costs associated with increasing that service level for our priority two roads done by contractors. And so there is an element of inspection and uh, okay. quality assurance that would, that would need to be done there as well. Excellent. Okay, good. That's good. And then for staffing requirements, what what do you foresee as the need for how much staffing we would need in order to, um, if we were to go ahead with the uh, option that's in front of us here? And with sorry, and with those with those workers that we would need, would they be considered part time or would they be full time workers? Would they be contracted or like seven month or eleven month contract? Yeah, so with the option R1, it's uh, R1 and AP1, it was somewhere around 100 to 120 people in that neighborhood. Um, so we'd have to look at the difference between what just R1 would mean for that group. So we don't uh, we oh. can get you that number. Um, oh, okay. And on whether it's full time or, or, or uh, seasonal, uh, we're working through. Uh, the numbers on what that looks like, we'll obviously get some direction from council on what a programmed approach might look like, and we'll be able to bring that back inside the uh, the report in June on on what the FTE count would look like from a, a full time equivalent basis. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Salvador. Oh, thanks so much, uh, and thank you, Administration, for a very thorough and com comprehensive report. Um, I guess just to the mover. Uh, Quick question around um, not ex or not including uh, an option for AP. Uh, I guess recognizing I'm not not on the committee. Uh, is there an openness to to include that? Um, it was was this sort of a starting point to build upon? So this was a starting point to build upon. I have questions around uh, the AP, and I just haven't okay. had a chance okay. to ask questions yet. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Um, well, then I will I will ask some questions around around AP to administration. Uh, and I'll start with some questions around our manually cleared areas. So it looks like we're qual falling quite short on our service standards for those manually cleared areas. And, and my understanding is that those are areas around bus stops, uh, public amenities, and are quite important for equitable access. Um, so wondering what the limiting factor is here. Like, are there are there limitations when it comes to um, equipment itself? Is this a staffing issue, both? Because uh, that was one of the biggest gaps that I noticed. Yeah, the, the gap is largely uh, both people and equipment for the active pathways. Okay. Okay, and, and particularly for the manually cleared areas, right? That's right. And right. I guess, are there, are there capital investments that could help with that? I'm, I'm assuming when I hear manually cleared areas, um, if you could just paint a very, a very small picture of what that looks like, you know, around a bus stop, do we actually have individuals uh, going out? What type of equipment is that? Yeah, we, we do have, um, around our bus stops, there is, there are areas that need to be, you know, hand shoveled. Um, in particular, if we, if we look at, say, the sandbox uh, filling, we don't have machines, um, you know, customized to fill those community sandboxes. So there is a level of manual filling. Um, so just certain tasks around uh, some of those priority three areas take a long time. And so the quantity of inventory we have on our active pathways for priority one is relatively small, um, which is why the numbers uh, for completion and active pathways is, is quite high for, for priority one for active pathways, and then drops dramatically for priority two and priority three, just based on the nature of the work. Right, okay. Um, that makes sense. And then another question I had, um, both for, for active pathways and for roads, you know, I appreciate that we've been presented with options to enhance service delivery. Um, but I guess I'm wondering why there wasn't an option for simply meeting existing expectations kind of across the board. Uh, for example, you know, looking at roads, if we look at R1, for example, 
uh, expectations are exceeded for P3 and P4, but um, not met for P1 or 2. So was there an option that was contemplated that would just meet those expectations? Yeah, great question. The, um, the interesting thing is if we were to achieve the, uh, the service level standards for our priority twos and priority threes, um, just the, based on using the, the resources in sequence order from priority ones and then, and then flowing down to priority two and priority three, um, the way the service levels are structured right now is it's not that, if there isn't that great waterfall effect of being able to land on exactly the service levels. So in order to achieve the priority twos and priority threes, you would need to exceed on priority ones in order, um, in order to, uh, in order to tackle the priorities in that order. And so the order of the priorities are, are done out of safety. Um, so in order to keep that sequencing and to keep uh, the priority three completed on time, uh, you would exceed on that, on the higher levels. It, does, does that make sense? I'm not sure if Maybe that's I could it. add uh, quickly to it. Um, the linear, it's not a linear relationship between P1, P2, and P3s. Um, when we look at the way that the standards were set in the past, you know, we're looking at guidelines and approach, but when we look at the inventory levels of P1s, the amount of roads that we have to clear with the amount of equipment that we have, there's a lot more roads in P1 than there is in the residential neighborhood. So you're taking a lot more equipment and putting it onto less roads in P4. So you're not, to have a standard of 36 hours on P1s and us to attain that standard, you'd have a certain level of equipment hitting those roads. And then as you cascade down, it would be less roads at each level that we would be attacking with more equipment. So it happens a lot faster. Okay, I might I might circle back for some further questions there, but I, I just want to ask another in um, my remaining 30 seconds here. Um, so I heard a lot of concerns around drainage uh, from folks that I represent and yeah, wondering, I, I didn't see much commentary on drainage in the report, wondering if, um, you know, there's, there's opportunities to be a little more proactive in our approach. Uh, if we feel like most of the drainage concerns were caused by blading to bare pavement and the associated windrows, looking for some information there. Yeah, we certainly feel the, the, the windrow um, certainly contributed to, uh, to the drainage issues we had, but we can certainly look at, f at further um, marking and um, uh, tracking of different catch basins uh, to improve drainage um, when we return in that June timeframe. I'm out of time, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thanks very much. I think just echoing Councillor Rutherford and Councillor Salvador, I'd be really interested in seeing the AP1 up there as well. Um, uh, and I think I think the enforcement um, on sidewalk clearing is another really, really important one for us to explore further. I, I suppose it's a question to the mover and then maybe also administration as well, but in terms of looking at the benchmarking, I'm just wondering about any other outcomes that we're going to use to assess the success of the investment that we're making in this program. So particularly measures uh, around outcomes, uh, for example, do we look at accidents, emergency vehicles, travel times, traffic speeds, people using bike lanes, or even, even complaints? Um, just to see, again, I, I, my biggest worry is that we will continue investing in this service, uh, but it's unclear what we're trying to achieve in terms of the outcomes rather than just the, the service level benchmarks. So, Councillor, I think some of the things you uh, identified as um, metrics, we uh, begin to uh, measure those. For example, we have been measuring uh, collisions and injuries for a number of, a number of years now. So those types of things also uh, environmental impacts we measure. So there's certainly opportunity to add more metrics. Um, and, and I think one that we've always had a, a good lens on was the 311 inquiries. And that's a very straightforward indicator. And, and, and a lot of times there's, there's information we can draw out not only on service, but uh, programming in terms of where we need to put some resources. Great. Yeah, I think that would be that would be really helpful. I think that um, I think that often our our reactions uh, to to snow and ice come from they're sort of reactionary to those complaints. So having a sense of whether the changes we're making are actually moving that needle, uh, if there is a correlation between how much we're spending and how happy people are, I think is actually very important uh, to inform us moving forward. Um, you know, just just further to the mayor's point. Um, 
again, having to be really mindful of the significant impact that new road infrastructure has on operational expense. So what I heard is that when it's a city capital project, we include the, the capital, or the, sorry, the operational cost of capital. And am I correct in assuming that we don't do that when it's a developer built infrastructure? Um, not in the same way, but we do project, uh, you know, what those impacts are from growth as the inventory uh, grows. What we do realize, though, is that it's not necessarily um, a linear function. It is quite often a step function. For example, if, if we were to add, you know, 10 kilometers of, of road over two years in the size of the inventory we have is probably something we can manage. But over a certain period of time, if you keep doing that year after year, there's a point in time where we need to make an increase. Thanks, so that's a very clear explanation. So maybe, um, Ms. McCabe, I'll just turn to you to to ensure that this, this type of consideration would be considered as part of the growth management uh, framework. It would overall in terms of what um, the costs are to develop our city, but it, uh, it's very challenging to recoup the costs of operations from developers, the, but the understanding of what the capital costs are and who pays those capital costs absolutely are part of growth management. Right, and I think it's just like, where do we capture that operational piece? So even thinking, would that ever become part of our public hearing reports, the, the, the operational costs of land use decisions? I'm gonna channel Mr. Johnson in law here and say that's probably not a land use consideration, but if there's someone who could speak to that from law, I'm sure they could give you a more robust answer. No, and that that's a fine, that's a fine response, just in terms of pegging where, again, it's just sort of how and when can we apply that information to inform our decision making. The, the best place to do that is through the growth management framework, uh, through um, Urban Planning Committee and annual updates that we do intend on bringing forward to uh, Urban Planning Committee, and then uh, that will help you give the context um, as you look at public hearing uh, files. Great, thank you. Uh, and then maybe just finally around some of the climate change impacts. Um, are we looking at any other design uh, fixes to, to address, um, you know, again, icing on sidewalks? So have we looked at permeable sidewalk material or an upgrade to the design standards to, to uh, you know, prevent prevent, you know, sort of the bowls that happen with sidewalks? Is any of that sort of uh, infrastructure piece being looked at to potentially minimize uh, the challenges we see in some of our particularly active infrastructure? So I, I think at a high level, we have the city's design and construction standards, which are uh, intended to look at holistically where uh, or how we design the infrastructure in the city. And certainly the environmental changes that are happening um, you know, it, it is something that is being considered, but it's in the early days right now, so we don't specifically know what those changes and impact mean in terms of how we change our standards. But I think on an ongoing basis, uh, we are trying to look at opportunities where there is technology or changes, you know, for example, in, in you know, how we repair our sidewalks. And, and if we know that there's an area that there's some ponding, do we have some options in terms of changing the actual construction configuration to help that. Great, thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you. And just to follow up on that, and it's, uh, it's also related to uh, um, Councillor Salvador's questions. Uh, do we have any idea, probably not, about the uh, infrastructure um, impacts of, of pooling? Uh, you know, and, and if that would mean that uh, we would have to repair or replace uh, on an accelerated timetable? Uh, Councillor, we don't have that information uh, with us today, but certainly we could get, get that documentation and provide that to Council. Okay, sure, thanks. Now, um, uh, as to the motion on the floor, uh, I'm just, I'm assuming that we're going to get some dollar values, and I'm just wondering if we can make it a little bit standard to also have the tax implication uh, beside those dollar values. Uh, would that be something that you would need in a motion, or is that something you could just do in, uh, you know, just as a matter of business? I, I think we can include that in the report. I would just uh, ask Ms. Padbury for any comment on that. No, that's something we can include. Okay. Um, so, Andre, this is a little bit out of the scope, but could we do that for almost everything we do? Yes, indeed, Councillor, and uh, we're also having that uh, priorities and tax tolerance discussion soon as well. We'll 
certainly go forward with that. Perfect. Yeah, I think that with every decision we make, if we could see that number, I mean, I can do the mental math in my head, but it would be nice to just have it transparent and on paper. Okay. Um, so to the mover, I, I absolutely appreciate the narrowed focus of this motion. I think it's an excellent motion. I'm just wondering though, because the feedback I've gotten from residents is, uh, you know, as, as I'm sure you have, there's, there's two horns on that bull. And uh, one is, uh, I don't want to spend a lot more money, but the other is, I want R2 level of service. And so I'm wondering uh, if we should add R2 for compare and contrast, or if uh, you, to your mind, it should stay at R1, even though the preference for service is R2. So two thoughts. Uh, the first yeah. is that um, just my understanding in conversation with the administration is they want direction. So direction yes. to come back with two options isn't direction, um, right? So I mean, and you know, if, 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 it, if it requires a, a vote as to which direction we take, then this can bump to council in the appropriate way. Second thought is, uh, my perspective is that I wanna see what we can do with the equipment we have before we start talking about buying a bunch more equipment. And while we've got theories and, and extrapolations, um, I'd like to see a season or two of us activating every piece of equipment every minute we can before we go to a next step of layering on because we might layer on different stuff once we have that yeah. first nope. understanding. I wouldn't argue with that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, no, that's great, thank you. Um, so I guess, yeah, the reason I ask is because there is the public service demand, but then there's the actual fiscal cost of you know, capital and operating of delivering uh, on those expectations. And I feel that sometimes uh, the public doesn't have that information that they require in order to make uh, the informed decision that, uh, based on what level of service is acceptable to them. So if R1 uh, option gets us there, I'm all in. Um, now, the other, the other thing that I would mention is that uh, we have that suite of options as well. So I, I think that's probably in your contemplation. Is that right? Is that to me, Councillor Pigot? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, just I've... for because because the the motion itself is is uh, just sort of talking about R one, but we're not really talking about that suite of options that that uh, administration presented. I'm not, other than the uh, the assisted snow service, um, because again, I'd rather see what we can do with what we have before we layer on other pieces. But that's that's simply my perspective. Yeah, no, and and so to administration, like I guess that's my question. What we can do with R one is is a is fairly a known quantity. That suite of options is something extra. Um, do we have an indication from the public uh, at all as to uh, what of those options they would uh, be interested in pursuing? Uh, Councillor, I, I don't think we have a prioritized um, suite of options based on public feedback. We certainly know if we looked at that one um, engagement slide, it, it talked about what was important and, and you know, that basically sidewalks, uh, wind rows, um, you know, street areas in the residential areas, those were the were sort of the predominant themes that we heard, but certainly there was no specific prioritization in these options with respect to public feedback. Okay, so rather than trying to Frankenstein this motion, I might come back with, uh, well, I, I can't, but maybe someone else will come back with that motion, Mr. Chair. Yep, Thank you. Uh, happy to figure that out in whatever way we need to figure it out. Uh, I, you know, I. Uh, moving to the second round, but first of all, just from a bit of an agenda management perspective, uh, in the past we've had this conversation for several hours at committee and then had another one for several hours at council. So I'm hoping we can tease everything out today, even if that means moving it to council for final voting, that if we, you know, if we have a list of contemplated pieces, uh, that we can go through them methodically at council. That's kind of my goal just again from a bit of a time management perspective, not to preempt or uh, preconceive anything. Um, so I have a few buckets of questions. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, budget. Uh, 
my understanding is our budget is $65 million, but the reported budget is $57 million. Um, and I don't remember a, a downward amendment. So what did I miss? So over time, the budget has gone down. Um, primarily, one of the biggest hits to the budget was the reduction in the automated enforcement piece, the transfer of revenues. So that was a, a decrease. And then over time, uh, just on an annual basis, as we were faced with the 0% increases as a whole, or even when we were at the 2 point some percent, we were basically holding the program um, at a, a consistent level, but there were increased cost pressures, so the overall number went down. Well, I feel like we have a report somewhere, and I think one of my colleagues dug it out that shows the, the budget at $65 million. And even if automated enforcement went down, it went down 3 or $4 million, not $8 million. I, th I think that there was a portion that was, was from automated enforcement and a portion over time that came on on an, uh, an annual basis, but we can certainly get some more detail on that, Councillor. Thank you. I, I, I'm curious about that because it's a matter of what our start line is here. So for instance, I've, you know, the first piece of the motion I've introduced is R1 and that in your attachment six has a price tag of 27 million from current state. But if current state is higher than, you know, what is current state? And I'm, I'm not sure that I have a clear understanding of what our current state is in terms of a number. We, we can take that away and cl clarify that over the lunch hour. That's yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, I understood you to say in your presentation that, uh, just talking road, about roads first of all, that arterial roads, P1s are done by the city, P2s are done by uh, contracted services. And that the city moves from P1s to P3s while contracted services do P2s, correct? That's correct. So why are we stuck on a linear increment? If we're going to, like, if we put money into the program, why is it P1, then P2, then P3? Why don't we put, for instance, more money into just P2s and hire more contracted services? We could do that. Uh, absolutely. That, that's an option. Um, the prioritization is, is largely done out of, out of uh, safety. So for uh, speeds, uh, severity of collisions, things like that. So. But if our P1s are hitting, a, and I'm not saying they are today, but if our P1s get to an acceptable level, then we could migrate more resources to P2s and do those faster. Because you suggested in your earlier comments that in order to get, and it may be a more of the pathways conversation, and I have the same question there, that in order to do the P2s and P3s faster, we get a bunch more equipment and we do the P1s faster first. Why not just break those out, meet the acceptable standard of P1 and additional resources go into accelerating P2 or P3 on either network? So, Councillor, I think that could, could be an option. I think w with the uh, R1 option, the concept was that we would make use of all of the equipment that we have and then cascade the um, service improvements down. Yeah, that part I know. It's the additional, and yeah, I'm out of time. All right, I'll have to come back. Sorry, Councillor Jans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a couple of questions here. Number one, I was... Hoping to hear more a bit about uh, communication. One of the areas I hear a lot of um, uh, compliments about is the communication system around waste management, having text alerts, responsiveness, apps, et cetera. Uh, was wondering if there was uh, contemplation on how we can better communicate around snow removal. A text blast system, other notifications, manual signage. Yeah, so part of the approach when we looked at the R1 option there is also including uh, our technology use, which is the GPS option of having live maps that are uh, showing on on a website which uh, can look at the snow routes, completion, um, and, and, and providing that information to the public as well. So yeah. the intent is obviously increase the communication efforts uh, on our end to ensure that uh, they have live updates. I heard another comment about I would rather leave my car on the street, eat the cost of the ticket, and then have um, you plow around me because then I know at least in front of my house the car is still sort of like I've got a bit of a cleared space. Um, so I'll leave that with you as a comment whether our, either A, our tickets are sufficient or B, we need to move to some sort of a, a towing um, uh, model because because of the challenges there. Uh, Councillor, I, I think 
there is some some work we have to do around uh, the the towing piece and, and the communications around the enforcement. Just back to your previous question about the app in in waste, we do have that work under development in snow and ice, and the intent is that it is rolled out for next season. But that work is underway as well. Another question I get is about a winter tires bylaw that we should go back to the snowpack, which I agree with, and and uh, uh, having some sort of a bylaw regulation around winter tires. Is that feasible? Possible? Uh, Councillor, I'll just ask uh, our law uh, group to speak to that, but uh, my understanding is because it is a provincially uh, mandated uh, regulation, we wouldn't have that ability. Okay. Um, the other question was about the asphalt plant and the ability to get sand and uh, out. Uh, maybe that's one for, for free future, but um, that was also a, a concern I wanted to interrogate a little further, as well as just the the downstream literal issues uh, from salt and salt on roads and some of those other pieces too and just how it integrates into our our climate change plan and and everything else so councillor um to your three questions in terms of the asphalt plant that really isn't directly connected to the um the snow program the asphalt plant was decommissioned based on a program and service review and the life uh cycle management of that facility in terms of the sand program what we switched from was a process where at the start of each winter season we would uh, stockpile approximately 30,000 tons of sand in each area and use it over the course of the year and then uh, remove whatever was left at the end of the year to store it somewhere else. We switched to a model basically of just-in-time delivery that provides us with a sand salt mix uh, and it is refilled as we require it so we haven't had a situation where we've run out of uh, sand we do get low but that is part of the uh, overall supply model that we're using so um, that is there in terms of monitoring and impacts on environment uh, I believe it was three or four years ago now we did start uh, a pretty in-depth uh, uh, monitoring process working with EPCOR and monitoring drainage outfalls in terms of what we see from the impacts to our um, the materials we're putting down on the roads. So that program is underway and it continues on an annual basis. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Sohi. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. On the... Uh, on the R1 under the roads, the cost estimate change is from 27 to 65 million, right? Uh, that's correct. And for uh, API, it's from 15 million to going to 33 million, 33.6, right? Also correct. I oh, got it. Okay, so because I would like to uh, add the, because uh, we want to avoid a big conversation at council, so I would uh, like to add API somewhere either it's as part of after R, R1, Councillor uh, Cartmel, if that is okay with you, right? Uh, yeah, if it's friendly to yeah. all of committee, then. Yeah, right. Allow AP, AP1 into that, and as, as well as uh, the uh, the seniors' facilities, is that additional, in, uh, or is that included in, in um, uh, AP1? Uh, so the, um, in AP1, there would see um, an increase in service levels across all the different sidewalks um, that also run in front of senior centers. But if we were to specifically look at clearing the sidewalks in front of seniors' facilities, facilities. within 24 hours, so center and facilities—that's the difference, right? Uh, it would. It would actually. It would be the um, uh, d dedicating specific resources or or dedicating a certain uh, standard to clear sidewalks within seniors' facilities within 24 hours would be that a la carte menu. Okay, got Or it. specifically on AP1, increasing the base service level uh, for all active pathways. Well, then I would like to add that seniors' facility, that additional part as well, just uh, for the, uh, so we can have a deb good debate back when we're back in September, uh, in June. And I also needed to know about the sandboxes. Is that additional on, or is included in the API? Oh, sorry, AP, AP1. Uh, the staff that are, are used to fill those boxes would be, um, actually, just let me check. So the sandbox would be a separate oh, cost. Yeah, for so, us. so for us to maintain that at a specific level, if council wants to still engage on the 769 sandboxes, it would be a programmed approach we'd have to bring back with that as well. Oh, I see, okay. So if you could bring those three back along with this. Uh, I want to focus on to uh, consultation 
with their mentoring. As I know, June is not going to give you enough time, but this is a significant change in the uh, in the cost, right? They're having that conversation with Edmontonians, like what is their comfort level on cost and what kind of service do they want, right? When was the last time we had that kind of comprehensive engagement with Edmontonians? That's, a, that's a, a comment for me, I think, because this isn't specifically about snow and ice. We engage with Edmontonians annually to discuss their uh, tolerance for tax increase and their budget priorities. And we'll be doing that again in advance of the 2023-26 four-year submission. Yeah, but I wanna, I wanna know, did we have focused conversation with Edmontonians about are they willing to pay another $50 million or so in additional cost to snow removal? Or would they be okay with having lesser standards? I, I think that's kind of, thing I'm looking for, because this is kind of, this is a big ticket item. So the engagement that was carried out as part of this uh, report didn't go into specific dollar values or what their tolerance was. It was more of a generic type question. Do you support a tax increase to support um, a level, a higher level of service, but not to a detailed level of tax tolerance? Good. All right, I'm out of time. Yes, three minutes on substance. Oh, yes, rounds. of course. I told yes, you for uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. So just for clarity, I heard Mayor Sohi talk about active pathways, seniors' centres, and sandboxes. Um, I'm looking for those items here. Seniors' item, senior centres, though, is a per-senior centre thing. So does that give you enough understanding to add that? I think the the understanding we would just need is that it is all senior centers, so we would all senior. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. And then, same with uh, sandboxes. Correct. So if uh, okay, so to, is that friendly to committee? I, I'm looking at. Of course, it's friendly to you, Mayor. So yeah, I'm just looking at, looking for nodding faces, and I see a couple. All right, so those would be friendly amendments, and maybe to the clerk, maybe we should break out number one into A, B, C, D, E for after. Lunch. Yes, we will work on something okay. like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you. So just going with the, um, following up on the seniors' facilities, um, isn't the sidewalk um, adjacent to the facility? Isn't that the responsibility of the facility? Uh, under the current format, it would be, but I think what this uh, option isn't, in uh, contemplating is that the city would do that. Okay. Okay. Um, so then, okay, I'm just, if we go to option um, R1, as indicated in the motion here, um, that estimated cost of 65.7, is that the full cost or is that added on to the current budget? So the, the 57 million is our current budget for both roads and active pathways. And then adding R1 would include an additional uh, $27 million specifically okay. for R1. And then okay. adding AP1 would be an additional 15.1. Okay. And then so does the R1 on the menu, does that include, does that come with the side of windrow removal when we just go down on the residential roads to the, the five um, five centimeter base. So there, there is currently some wind, wind row removal taking place right now. There are dedicated wind row free zones, um, certain intersections in front of schools. Um, what this does not include is all wind rows removed in all residential areas. Okay. So if I want to decide a wind row removal, then I would have to take the, um, the clearing of the, the removal at a cost of about 12 million a pickup, right? Correct. Um, oh, there's just so much uh, here. Uh, uh, <laughs> just, to, just, to clarify, other, just to clarify that 12 uh, million per pickup, Councillor, was I'm for, sorry? the 12 million per pickup was, was related to blading to bear payment. So that would be the cost to remove all the windows at, at um, 
That's oh. only if if we were to blade a bare pavement, so it would be. Okay, so anticipating that the windrows would be smaller, we'd have if to, not we'd, blading to bare pavement, the cost would be less than. Yeah, for... and I guess the direction that we get from council, we'd come back with that programmed approach and and incorporate that if council so chooses to do that. Okay. Okay, so that might just include an amendment, um, and I would also like to see. Um, with that active pathways, I guess, um, around, around the schools as well, not just the, the, the seniors. I, I don't see anything separate for schools. No, the school, the schools are already designated windrow free. So we pick up windrows in front of schools. All schools and at, at what, what time frame? Val. Val can answer that. Because it school, sorry. wasn't being done. <laughs> Currently directly in front of schools are windrow free areas and I would have to return with the time frame that we pick it up in. But it's only directly in front of the schools that are the windrow free areas. Okay. And not across the street where many parents drive to pick up, right? Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. My time is up. Apologies. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I guess, I, I guess I'm just, um, I'm curious in, in all of this analysis, uh, recognizing that we have 6.3 site walk maintenance report, how much of that is cross-referenced with the work out of this report? Because this is coming up a lot, you know, in that, 6.3 report, you know, senior centers, schools are, are, are priority one. Uh, and I'm just wondering how much of that is being cross-referenced here. So, Councillor, in terms of cross-referencing, really, the the 6.3 report really s speaks to more of the uh, infrastructure condition, not the sort of ongoing cleaning type maintenance. But in terms yeah. of prioritization, there is opportunity to look at, you know, uh, a similar approach, and I think that's probably where we're not at based on the current um, current practice or current standards. Right. I mean, I do think snow removal, you know, factors into the physical conditions of some of these site walk conditions, and it just it's coming up so frequently, uh, you know, all morning. And I, you know, I, I am curious. You know, one thing on the communication front, so this is some of the suggestions that I've heard from the accessibility committee. Uh, sorry, not the committee, but the community. Um, from some of the community members, uh, people would like to see, you know, a marketing campaign to raise awareness about snow removal, recognizing that regardless of which options we go with, it's still very much um, everyone's responsibility, um, you know, whether it's on um, public or private and whether it's residential or commercial property owners. And some community members even offer to lend some of their time to help develop this. I feel like this is such a low hanging fruit. Has there any, been any conversation on this front? Um, Councillor, it's Katrin. Um, we are working actively with our colleagues in City Ops to ensure that for the coming snow season, our communication is more robust and that okay. we explain the why of communication to Edmontonians. The other thing too is we've been, Edmontonians have been clear that they like push notifications better than pull notifications. They like information being sent to them. Oh. What we're trying to do is rationalize all of those notification systems across the city so that yeah. it isn't a patchwork quilt, but one elegant way of getting information on everything from waste to snow. So that would be led out of the, that would be led by the communication department. Then, my understanding in partnership with city ops. Okay, sounds good. Um, you know, I think I think part of my frustration with this is that you know there have been so many revisions to the policy. There's been so many. There's a long history with the snow and ice, um, and we're continuing to I guess rejig a broken status quo system. Um, so I'm wondering if the, in, in the team has uh, ever done any analysis, like have we ever contemplated if we were to design a snow removal system from scratch based on climate trend, based on promising practices elsewhere, based on Edmontonians' feedback and lived experience and frontline experience, what would that look like? Have we ever contemplated that? So, Councillor, I think 
what today's conversation is is the start of exactly what you're saying. Um, I mentioned earlier in in the discussion that you know historically we've always looked at uh, an old base level of service that's many many years old and just looked at the increments, but we've never looked at is the base level correct and do we know what we're needing to do the work. And I think that's the point we're at right now. And then designing the program in a way that makes sense with all the different um, <clears throat> opportunities as well as, as um, outcomes that are uh, desired. And I think that's kind of where we're going at now. And, and one of the things we really want to get at is that we have a programmed approach for the next winter season and that we execute it uh, and then make revisions um, at next next spring, a year from now, uh, because I think the challenge has been in many cases is we start out in one direction and and n n not for bad reasons, we try to improve things, but sometimes we change things and we change expectations of citizens and then we also change our ability to provide the service. So I think this is kind of the first step in what you're uh, referencing. All right, I'm out of time, thank you. Thank you. We've reached our lunch break, so we will uh, reconvene at 1.30 and pick up questions there. Thanks, everyone.
Good afternoon. Welcome back to the April 25th, 2022 meeting of the Community and Public Services Committee. Uh, before we get started again, uh, we've got a bit of a rewording of the motion on the floor. So I'll ask the clerk to put that up. And you will see uh, once it's up that um, it's been rephrased to some degree uh, that committee recommend to council and then a list of parts to the motion. And so um, this allows us to have our conversation here today but ultimately uh, vote at council in two weeks and uh, likely separate the pieces out for voting purposes so that everyone has an opportunity. But let's not leave it to council to have the conversation. Let's have the conversation here and speaking to and questions asked and all that good stuff. We're just getting the wording up. They're there. Yeah, they will be. So that's a, it doesn't all fit on the screen. So what we'll maybe do is put that into the chat as well. Okay, so next up is uh, Councillor Tang. Uh, sorry, I have my second round. I believe others were, I'm on my third. That was my, that's my third. Oh, have you, all right. Yep. I, I'm sorry about that. Uh, then Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. So I, I wanted to dig into the sandboxes item a little bit more. Um, you know, <laughs> when you do the jurisdictional scan, it's kind of astounding that we have 769 and then Calgary, which would be the next, or St. Albert even, would be the next comparable at 34 and 29, but also um, we have almost one box per square kilometer versus, you know, under that for sure. So I know it says in here, the optimizing the efficiency of sandbox, uh, op including options to increase frequency and volume and streamline locations. But I'm wondering, like, because this is supposed to be, this is an example I think that I would heed for all my colleagues is, when we set something up as a courtesy and then it becomes an expectation because I received so many complaints about the sandboxes not being full. But this seems to be an unsustainable number so I'm worried about that, how it's written. So my question to administration is are you concerned with how, what's written here in this motion? And what would your thoughts be? So it says optimize the efficiency of sandboxes including the options to increase frequency and volume. So Councillor, when when you say concerned about it, I'm not sure, I mean, what we would present back is what it would take to deliver uh, a level of service and the accompanying resource. Whether we do it, I guess, would be the question we would need some direction on in terms of what level of um, courtesy service do we want to provide? Because as you said, it was a courtesy that's really grown into an expectation. And now we have to, I think, do the check. Do we want to continue that or or not, and if we do, we need to do it in a programmed way that makes sense from an efficiency perspective as well as um, a service consistency perspective. So the, co co I know I'm not on, on this committee, but it's a process question I have, because now there's an option in the amendment here, but I would actually be inclined if this comes to council, which it will, and I would probably make an amendment if it comes to council, to actually reduce that program so how, how does city clerk, I'm just looking to you, like how would that look in terms of this is coming to council, I, I A wouldn't support C to C, but I would actually like the reverse. I actually think we should be reducing the number of community sandboxes to be more in line with other municipalities. 
how, how do, from a process perspective, how does that work? Do I just wait for it to come to council and amend that? Or can I even amend it or do we have to vote on this one? So you can't have a motion that would effectively like make the reverse of what the, the other motion is. Okay. But if that's something that you wanted to look at including options, like this is still looking for options. So you could also, I'd say, add on the possibility to decrease sandboxes as well because we're still just looking for options at this point instead of actually actioning what's going to happen with okay. the boxes. Okay, thank you, that helps. So perhaps um, a rephrasing the, of that item that says increase or decrease. Frequency and volume. So you could look at it in both directions. And I think that's friendly, so we can make that fix. Uh, Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When it comes to active pathways and going to AP1, what I want to double check is does that, does that include the addition of the, the active pathways that are currently untouched by the City of Edmonton? Uh, no, it's, it's, in, it's increasing the service levels on the existing active pathways that we currently maintain. Any increased in, or new service enhancements would be on that a la carte menu option that we have. In so, that, so I would be looking to the, I, I'm just trying to figure out what I would even include. If, if we were essentially going to say all, all active pathways, what, what is that in terms of the additional pieces then? Maybe I'm not entirely clear. because some of it's increasing service. I didn't necessarily see something that talked about addressing our current inventory, unless I'm misreading any of these. The AP1 and AP2s are, are strictly to address the, the current inventory. Yeah. I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, is on, the, on the options for the enhancements, which, which option is adding existing city-owned trails but maintaining them? That, uh, for ones that currently aren't maintained. Yeah, the, the public squares in the, in the park internals add the remaining pathways. Public squares in, okay, so that's the 4.3 million one, yep. what you're talking about. Okay, so that would include every other trail currently in city inventory that is not currently being maintained. That's correct. Okay, that's helpful, because uh, I would be adding that when the time comes. Um, great. The other question I have on active pathways, and I know I don't have five minutes, I have a minute and a half left, um, is, is there, in some of the answers to earlier questions, what I was unclear about is that, let's say you didn't want to do six hours for priority one active pathway, but maybe we want to do 12. Does that allow you to then maybe do a bit more, uh, you know, so instead of six and then 40, can you do 12 and then 24? Or is, is there a, an option that allows us to look at something like that. Is there an option 1.5 that's, that's not on the table? Obviously, it's a, it's a spectrum in which, you know, we're looking at the, the snow and ice clearing, so how much we want to spend is, is directly implicates how, how quickly we move through the inventory. We still move through the inventory in priority one, two, three, but because of whatever we dictate priority one at, that same level of equipment then gets put on priority twos, threes, and fours. So depending on the level of inventory, we may move faster or slower through it. So increasing or trying to push the, uh, the equipment from, from one to the other and slowing down one is not necessarily going to speed up the other. So the, the equipment that we put on our priority ones and we move to the next priority twos, which is a less, less inventory, it will actually move through it quicker because we have that, that, uh, that equipment level on priority ones themselves. So what I'm hearing is, is that there isn't really a way for us to go, say, 12 hours for priority one, 24 for priority two, because it's it, the, the sequencing would not uh, permit that, is what you're suggesting. Technically, you want to go through the sequencing in P1, P2, P3. Yeah. But, I mean, we could deviate parts of that that uh, equipment to start more on P2 than P1. Okay. Um, to kind of address some of that. If now, I'm out of time, but I'm going to come back to that, because I think we need to talk about that as an option. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Principe. Uh, thank you. My question to administration is, uh, is it possible or even like practical or possible to have the uh, um, 
residential roads to uh, bladed to bare pavement, say twice a year, as opposed to after every snow ice event? Uh, yeah, that that would be an option. Um, it would come with trade offs, but uh, but that that direction we're certainly open to um, to looking at. Okay, and then if if that was an option we did choose, then we could also include the windrow uh, pickup, say like twice a year, with the um, bare pavement. Correct. That's correct. Those yeah. would be options. Okay. Another question: um, What what is our training? How do we train our staff? Is there, are they, are they licensed? Are they, is there a course that they take? How do we train our staff and how do we uh, retain our staff as well? I'll just defer that question to Valerie Dasik. Thanks. So currently staff are trained dependent on the tasks that they're completing. So our equipment operators have both an in-core class course as well as on in the field evaluation as well as in-seat time evaluation. Um, all of the City of Edmonton staff in Snow and Ice go through the orientation which they are trained on the day-to-day -day operations. So it's really dependent on what tasks they're doing and what they're expected to do out in the field. Okay, and then what is the retention rate for uh, this, this staffing? Do you, you may not have that information. We'll, we'll see if we can pull that information up um, during this meeting, Councillor. But okay, thank you. Those just, are my only questions. Uh, just oh. quickly, Councillor, I think in, in terms of the turnover rate we see uh, in, in this area, it would probably be consistent uh, with other level, uh, areas of the corporation, but uh, okay. we, we can provide more, a little bit more detail as follow-up. No, that's okay. That's, that's good enough for me. Thank you very much. Thanks. That's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Salvador. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just want to ask some questions around the, I guess, the ambiguity of our current snow clearing bylaw for sidewalks. Um, so I noticed that we're the only jurisdiction in the jurisdictional scan that doesn't have a time limit on our bylaw. Um, why is that? Uh, Councillor, I'll uh, just defer to our law team to just provide uh, some insight into the bylaw. Yeah, Councillor, this is Tracy Ash from Legal Services, um, and I see Ms. Perizolo is also here to answer any questions about that. We don't have a timeline, um, and that's to allow for a lot of discretion and flexibility in how the bylaw is enforced. Um, we can we can see that as a positive thing. Um, maybe I'll just ask Ms. Perizolo to also add any context to how that's dealt with by the officers. Sure, yeah, so it adds a little bit, as Tracy had mentioned, some flexibility to our enforcement response. The other issue that we have is we don't have access to snow data as it relates to snowfall across the city. So for example, you might get five centimeters of snow in the south side of the city, and you might get trace amounts in the north. And if we had a 48 hour timeline, what would happen is then in the north, it would restrict any type of enforcement action. And then the result would be a backlog. So officers are continually having to wait the 48 hours um, to be cleared before they can move ahead with enforcement. So what we would prefer to do is respond with discretion and um, just monitoring the snow within that area before taking action. Okay, okay, I appreciate that answer. Um, yeah, just stuck out to me, just knowing that other jurisdictions do take that approach. Um, and I guess some further information would be provided uh, given the motion and direction around um, sidewalk enforcement then? Is that correct? Correct. Under 2A? Yep. Okay. And then also a question around uh, any potential assisted snow clearing programs. My understanding is that we did have a Snow Angels program I think it was canceled maybe 2018, I'm not sure. Uh, what was the reason? And I guess, how do we ensure that this program, uh, if, we, if we do go ahead with it, is sustainable and more viable? So I can answer that. Uh, in 2018, the Snow Angels program was discontinued. Um, that was a recognition program. So what that did is it recognized neighbors for shoveling um, walks and it was just really a thank you for their contributions. And what we found was that there was really low participation rates in that program. 
And so the following year, um, community standards and neighborhoods did move forward with a pilot with a snow to go, where we did offer grant money to um, community le leagues to help support seniors and people with uh, mobility issues uh, to remove the snow and walk in those neighborhoods, or again, or I guess like, to their properties. Okay, thank you, I'm out of time. Thank you. Uh, so starting the third round then, um, uh, I'm going to leave the pathways questions I have to Councillor Nett because he's on the same track I am there. Uh, earlier today I asked about uh, budget reductions and uh, how we got to this budget reduction. Uh, do you have more information to present on that, Mr. Uh Yes, we do. Okay. Um, so I can I can walk through uh, year by year if you'd like. We have... Um, is, is that what you're look, looking for at this point? Uh, yeah, how did, how did we get here, uh, briefly, but how did we get here? And my, part of my question is, was it, did we reduce budget and therefore we lost qualified personnel, or were we losing qualified personnel so we just spent less money? So I'd, I'd start by saying that there isn't one, one reason. There's, there's essentially a number of different reasons that happened uh, since 2018. So in 2018, the budget was uh, just over 65 million. And then over that last, those five years to 2022, it reduced down to 56. Um, 4.4 million of that was due to the Taser Reserve. Um, but there's also a number of other factors. There's um, fleet replacement reserve reduction. Um, there was transfer from operating to capital due to Ellerslie interim. Um, there's, there's a host of reasons over the past five years, but it's gone from 65 to 63, 59, 58, 56 uh, since 2018. Okay, so maybe that what you have in front of you can just be distributed to council by way of a memo, and then we would have that breakdown just to, to move that offline. In, in summary, that's, it's 4.4 million for the Taser Reserve funding, uh, 2.6 million uh, budget reductions for targeted uh, efficiencies, and then there was a million dollars um, accumulated reorg impacts that were that were calculated. So we've effectively reduced our budget from 65 to 50, under 58. Uh, that's right. Yep. And in roughly the same time period that the we've increased the lane, the number of road lanes by 21 percent. Correct. Fair to say. Okay. So we can put that in a memo that summarizes sure. that as well as a couple of the other questions that have been raised today. Sure. Okay. Uh, earlier, uh, Councillor Manak was asking about the cost per for windrow pickup on residential, and the number thrown out was $12 million to pick up residential windrows. But I don't think that's the whole answer. So do you have a number of what it would cost to blade residential roads to bare pavement, blade cul-de-sacs to bare pavement, and pick all that up and take it to the dump? Because I think it's more than $12 million. So that, that $12 million is is just a, a one time, and that would be the windrow pickup. Um, that is not including the the cost of blading to bare pavement. Right. So incorporating all of those together, these these options for new service enhancements were really done in silos to to get that feedback and direction. And then in order to build that program based on based on the direction, we'd have to refine um, a more detailed a more detailed budget. So that might be something because you can't. You cannot pick up a windrow unless you first blade it into a windrow. That's right. And we've always had this thing between residential roads and cul-de-sacs for whatever reason. So I, um, I think we need a number that says if we're going to do what the average citizen would consider all residential roads, scrape them down and pick it up once, what's that number? So just to clarify, you're looking for what a complete residential blading would look like if we were to blade all the residential roads and the cul-de-sacs and pick everything up once. Yeah, once. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm out of time, but that would be uh, hopefully a friendly amendment if to the clerk to maybe craft in. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. I'm just going to go back to sort of the liability or, or legal issue. I'm just wondering, is there anything in the budget that um, provides for claims for property damage or personal injury? Where would that money come out of if the city had to had to make good on a claim for those? Um, hello, Councillor. So this is Anna Tricha-Carhut from Law Again, and that money comes out of our 
risk management fund. Okay, so nothing out of the, the snow budget. Okay, I've had a few cases of that, so I just wanted to know if that was included. And I've um, requested the friendly amendment um, in regards to the equipment utilization and that, and that pretty well stemmed from the report um, that uh, that QP30 had put together um, and provided to us on Friday. Um, my concerns there is um, with regards to the staffing, um, our, our underutilization of, of that equipment, is it a result of the staffing? Um, is it a result of the uh, the outside contractors that we have maybe doing the work that some of our equipment would be doing, how that's dispersed? Um, and and I understand from the presentation this morning that um, that admin is is looking at, at working with with following up on that QP report. Is that right? Yeah, councillor, to, to answer the first question, it was um, it's largely due to personnel. So the, the, the service level impacts and the equipment utilization is, is not, um, it's less a, a maintenance issue and more a personnel issue, availability. Um, in terms of uh, the QP letter, um, absolutely we plan on to, to digging into that further. There's a lot of things we um, agree with and, and, and improvements that we can make operationally uh, moving forward. So the equipment we got is the appropriate equipment that we have, especially with our changing climate? I think there's always options for increasing our efficiency and getting new equipment. Some of those uh, suggested changes are in the a la carte menu as well. But uh, certainly there's always opportunity for us to look at our equipment and, and uh, we, we review that each year as we go forward. Um, just my last comment is I agree with Councillor Rutherford as far as the, the sandbox program. Um, I'd like to see it cancelled. Oh, but on that, on that note as well is the, the piles of sand that we have accumulated now in the snow dumps, and one of them is just off 17th Street in White Mud here. Um, what happens, what's the cost of, of getting rid of that sand? Um, can we recycle it, reuse it? So, Councillor, I'll just provide a little context on the sand uh, program. So, following the sand recycling audit, there uh, was direction provided to uh, um, cease the sand recycling. And there was uh, sand that was picked up and had not been processed or recycled and required disposal. At that time, we were provided direction to look at alternatives uh, as well as um, the uh, uh, hauling uh, to landfill. So over a period of time, we looked at what alternatives could be uh, used for the sand, including use in berms or landfill cover. At the end of the day, the best option was to process that sand through uh, returning it to landfill, so basically uh, to, to waste. And that was uh, commenced last year. I believe we were about two thirds of the way through a disposal of that sand and the remaining uh, sand that was outstanding was to be processed over the course of uh, the first half of this year. The budget dollars were carried forward to accommodate that work, so that is in place. So any of the uh, outstanding sand that had been stockpiled uh, for processing uh, will be taken care of by the beginning of, I believe, beginning of July. And, and when you say processed, you mean returning it to waste? To, to waste to landfill, correct, yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. My time is long gone. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Tang. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. I think uh, many of my colleagues have asked lots of uh, great detail-oriented questions that um, I'm not, that I had in mind as well. Um, I guess just a final two, and I think I maybe just validate my thinking. Um, when we plan for snow on ice, how how has the city plan and the growth to another million people factor into our snow and ice approach? Do we keep that in mind? So, Councillor, I, I don't believe Ms. McCabe is available, but I'll, I'll try and provide some context on that. Certainly, I think as we grow uh, the city and and we we work towards the city plan, we do have there's there's definite intentional. Uh, densification and uh, you know 
a community of communities. So what we are looking at is how we combine that that transition into our service level. So for things like back lanes, you know, the lanes um, where we start having, uh, you know, garage suites and that type of thing, what level of service do we need to consider for back lane service? And that's all things that we're taking into account moving forward as we, we think about it. As well, uh, you know, the, the the team works closely with, with the development industry in terms of what we see as a, the best way to manage snow in some of the new neighborhoods. We know that, for example, areas that have boulevards have uh, a little bit more flexibility in where you can put the snow. So those are considerations uh, as we look forward uh, to building, you know, building that next uh, million people. All right. No, I, I, I appreciate that. And also when you do come back in June and you're providing um, the options for the service enhancements, would you also prioritize that based on public feedback through 311 or, you know, through the counselor's office and other means? So between now and then, I don't think there would be significant uh, engagement time. So we would look at what we found in the previous round of engagement in terms of prioritization. I would just say though, looking at, at this motion right now, so right now what we're seeing is um, a large list of, of items to consider, but I don't know if that gives us um, the time to action all of those. So say council chose to go ahead with all of these items. I don't know if we'd be able to action them all uh, for next winter. Um, because right now it's a bit of a, a, a list and we would need to build a programmed approach and integrate them. So we would have to look at, um, you know, some substantial, uh, I would say, integration going forward after that date. Just to augment uh, Mr. Sebrick's answer, we will be able to do some quantitative analysis, but there wouldn't be time, as he indicates, for qualitative engagement, but we feel we could do some additional survey work to, to get you closer to that menu of choices for Edmontonians. That's prioritized by Edmontonians. Yeah, and, and I'm not necessarily talking about brand new engagement, but certainly there has been a ton of feedback, uh, you know, even just this season. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Nick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, Active Pathway, one of the reasons I'm looking at this other option is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but when crews are clearing the active pathways under priority one, because they're out so early, the equipment that we need is different and it allows them to maintain it maybe to that higher standard. So when you go have those brushes and going out, whereas if you've got a trail that's been packed down with snow in five days, the equipment you need is quite different. So there might be value in saying priority one and two get done within 24 hours, 12 and 24, whatever it is, but get it done within 24 hours because the equipment needs would be different than if we waited for priority two to 40 hours. Is that is that a correct statement? Uh, yeah, not only equipment changes, but, uh, or sorry, not only equipment, but um, just the time it takes to clear that snowpack is, is different uh, when you can address the snow um, earlier. So that's why I think we need to the committee a different option for active pathways because in my mind AP1 still makes your life really challenging for priority twos. I don't think there's any way to get priority threes quicker unless we really change the equipment levels but if we look at a maybe you just define it as both within 24 hours the equipment you might need and the staffing you might need looks different than if we go with AP1. Is that correct? Yeah that's that's part of the program, we could we could look at adjusting those service levels. And just to, to make note, I confirmed over lunch that <clears throat> the priority three areas for active pathways do not use equipment. And it's not because the equipment isn't available or that we just don't have it. It's the nature of the work is such that it's around, you know, bus stops and glass and posts and sure. that the nature of the work uh, is such that it, it needs to be done by hand. So equipment isn't an addition for the priority three uh, for active pathways. Great. It's, it's very manual. So if I were offering advice to the committee, and if not, uh, I'll do it at council, um, I, I think there would be value in changing, instead of looking at AP1, looking at, call it AP1.5, where priority one and two are dealt with in a 12 and 24 hours in a three whatever time thing can be done, five days, I think, versus a six and 40. I think that's actually less efficient in a, in a worse use of money. So I, I'll leave that to the committee, um, and I can do it at council if need be. Uh, a few other options. Uh, none of these inc currently include the tow truck option, correct? Right now on the on the on the menu of s options. Okay, good. So I guess the question is, it's great to have enforcement, but 
what I've heard from the crews time and time again is unless the cars are off the road, they can't be as fast and as efficient as they would like. So I'm just wondering, unless there's any reason why we shouldn't have the tow truck option, I'd like to make sure that's there. There is a tow truck option. It's labeled. Oh, in I know it's there. It's just not on the motion right now. Ah, sorry. Is that correct? That's so I, I think we need to make that as an option because I what I've heard from the crews is that when the cars are on the street, it is hard for them to have to go in between. Is that correct? You're nodding. That's yes. Sorry, I see you. vigorous nodding. Yes. Okay. I'm out of time. I'll have a few more. Sorry. I just it's a lot. Thank you. Don't be sorry. I got some too. Uh, Councillor Salvador. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so, just want to ask a question about some of the quotes that were included in the staff survey. Um, yeah. So, just I guess general concerns around uh, kind of chronic understaffing and and the reliance on shifting those hours to existing staff as overtime. Uh, so I wanted to ask about our policy around 11 month contracts. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, is it possible that we could be better served by having a more skillful and experienced um, permanent staff? Uh, are there efficiencies to be gained there by moving away from 11 month contracts? Um, and, and I guess, is our labor force management being contemplated and considered as part of the options in front of us today? So, Councillor, very quickly, uh, it, it's not necessarily part of this, but that work is actually underway on a much bigger project in terms of looking at our seasonal workforce, both our provisional and temporary. So we have a project underway where we are doing the assessment to see where it makes sense to convert seasonal uh, workers into permanent. We just completed uh, the first phase of that with waste services and converted, I believe, it was either 46 or 48 positions to permanent. The work in this branch uh, started last year with a piece of work called a foundational assessment to really understand what resources it took for each program area because there are at least half a dozen different programs within the Parks and Road Services branch that have seasonals. So there is opportunity to connect those, those programs and convert seasonals in one area and another area into a permanent. So the work is underway. And that is part of what we are under, undertaking. We're also looking at opportunities, for example, in transit with our bus and LRT cleaning. So there's a number of different opportunities across the corporation to look at uh, moving from a seasonal workforce to a more permanent, stabilized workforce. Yeah, Councillor, I wouldn't mind just adding to this, Andre, here, just because this is a huge body of work. We, we absolutely want to want to do it. And uh, as we did recently in Waste with the 46 positions transferred to, to full-time FTEs, it makes sense. It makes good economic sense, too. Yeah. So I just want to make it clear that when we do this, there is actually increased efficiency because we're not offboarding and onboarding staff and training them and retraining them. But where I, I strongly believe we'll need help from Council on this is when Edmontonians start to see the rise of FTE numbers in our budget lines. So when we come this fall, you're, you, you're going to see larger numbers of FTEs because we're adding FTEs to the, to the and I'm, I'm committed to doing this, but that's where I could use Council's help going forward so that people understand why we're adding FTEs, we're not adding cost. Yeah, well, thank you for adding that, Mr. Corbold. And I, I agree, I think there's significant efficiencies to be gained, not to mention benefits to staff retention and morale um, by, by moving away from some of those 11 month contracts. So thank you for that additional detail. Um, shoot, I have one more. Apologies, I'll come back for a quick round. Thank you. Uh, oh, you disappeared. Okay. Uh, then I guess it's my turn. I have a few amendments to offer. Uh, so the first one is on that piece around residential costs. I think the clerk will just be bringing that up. So I'm hoping that's friendly. And that's just, as I was alluding to earlier, just a, a total cost one time to blade down to pavement, residential roads and coals de sac and uh, pick, up, pick up that snow. Uh, my question to you uh, is, if we did that, do we have capacity in our snow dumps to take on that snow? And my guess is no. You are correct. Okay, so I'll have a subsequent on that count uh, that I'll introduce later. Uh, I've got a second um, amendment that would add an item 2D that would be introduce a courtesy tow during parking bans program. 
three, Madam Clerk. I know I'm making you scramble. Uh, while you're doing that, I'll ask, I'll ask some questions. Um, windrows, again, on arterial roads. Um, seems to me we don't pick them up generally. Uh, and there's nothing offered a la carte to uh, introduce picking up of windrows on arterial roads. Um, and my view of this is that the windrows don't get all the way up onto the curb and off the road. So the turn bay that's a two-turn lane bay becomes a one-turn bay. The right turn bay becomes half a lane. A two-lane road becomes a lane and three quarters. The roads don't operate the way they're designed once those windrows are there. So have we thought about a program of picking up more windrows off of arterial roads? I think we do it downtown and that's about it. Councilor, you're, you're correct. The primary windrow pickup happens in downtown and in the other areas of the city, what it is, it's based on a lane width. So as long as we can maintain a specific lane width as identified in the guidelines, then we don't pick up the windrow. But if the encroaches beyond that and the lane is too narrow, we pick it up. So there are That's examples. all my experience, Mr. Sibrick. Sorry to interrupt, yeah. but that windrow creeps into the lane and then it glaciates and it's not moving for love or money. Yeah, there are there are examples because again we aren't meeting that service level. That's part of that P1 conversation as well in terms of us meeting it only 76% of the time. I would also add just on the um, on the options that are available to council today, increasing that ability for us to move through the streets quicker is and and do a better quality of service will help with some of the window issues. Thank you. I'm out of time. Uh, Councillor Neck. Oh, pardon me, Councillor Paquette would be next. He's only had one round. Councillor Paquette? Uh, I was not expecting to go right now, so I was taking some notes. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, <laughs> can we add like a, one more, uh, maybe seven, uh, the kitchen sink? I'm just kidding. So uh, the, my point here is uh, to administration, uh, this is a very prescriptive type of motion. And uh, it, in my mind, it shouldn't have to be. But this is where we're at. So I would just like to get some feedback from administration on this. So, Councillor, it does provide a lot of granularity in, in terms of some of the items, but I think one of the key, key things we want to get out uh, of today and, and ultimately if it's at Council in two weeks is some clear direction on what we want to, want to do. So if, if we want to spend a little bit more time on it now, um, that would be, as long as it comes out with some clear direction at the end of the day, uh, we're we're okay with that, but I think Mr. Corbo wants to add a bit. Yeah, I would just add that it's yeah, certainly not the ideal motion from a normal operating perspective for us, but we understand where we are and we understand uh, how important this is to Edmontonians and therefore to the council. And so I agree with Mr. Sebrick that um, this is one of those exceptions where this kind of clarity will really help us going forward uh, as we come back to council to make these detailed decisions and, and clearly uh, Edmontonians want councils to dig into this. We've heard that, so let's do it and we'll move forward. And But okay. certainly so, not day-to-day so -day operating kind of, we don't want to get into this all the time, but we're happy to move forward on this one. Yeah, let me be clear. I support the motion. I think it's necessary. My frustration is that it is necessary. And I think that's shared by the mover. Um, I don't want to get into a situation of being critical, but I understand that there has been some changes to uh, maybe the oversight on this. And my question is, um, you know, first of all, we need this motion for the, for the surety of council and for the public. But I guess what I'm looking for is surety going forward that um, a lot of things that seem to be common sense and should be anticipated will be 
as we move into th this next winter and successive winters. So, Councillor, I think we we share some of your your concerns, and obviously, as we dug into this work, we saw where uh, we weren't doing uh, as good as we thought we were or should be doing. So, we have um, you know used this as the I'd say the turning point in terms of building a stronger program, but we've also made um, made some prioritization changes with respect to how we provide oversight in 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 this program and our commitment is that we provide a higher level of oversight and um, through that I think we'll be able to provide that better level of service that Edmontonians and Council expects. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knack, I think. Councillor, pardon me. Uh, sorry, I'm multitasking here trying to get all these amendments. Uh, Mayor Sohi. Thank you. Uh, just want to hone in on the, uh, the the cost implications. So when you come back, you will definitely identify. We have some understanding. There's value attached to some of these things. But when you come back, would you come back with a strategy on uh, the some of the implementation? Because some would require hiring people, so you can't do it all once. So would you come back with... Uh, uh, with a strategy on funding? Yes, uh, Your Worship, we would provide uh, a strategy that would likely have some form, some form of phasing as well as, as what that timing would look like over this winter and potentially next winter, depending on how much we actually add to the program. Okay. And uh, and I, I share Councillor uh, Paquette's concerns about uh, some of the too much detail going into this, and I I, I also understand councillors' uh, desire that too, right? So I just trying to understand the that if you if you had say forty million dollars extra, right? Because uh, that's probably just the, all this these things are going to cost more than that, right? Would you not see that forty million dollar? Then you come come up with ideas how to best utilize that forty million dollars. To give the best service possible, instead of, I'm just trying to understand from your perspective. You will provide us. You usually provide us a professional ex expertise and, and and advice, right? But here we are very we are very prescriptive. So does that limit your ability to provide you that professional advice for the best use of that those resources that would be available to you? I don't think it limits our okay. ability to do that, Your Worship. Um, I, it does have us questioning our, the confidence we have, so we'll, we'll, we'll go forward and we'll do it as detailed as we can. Um, I think the reality is Council feels they have to do that, and we're okay with it. We'll, we'll move forward. Uh, yeah. But it's not going to limit our ability to add new ideas and add good yeah. uh, additional sort of analysis as we go forward. So would you be able to, I know I may not be able to do this because this is too prescriptive. Again, I just, I just want to understand that if you were given a certain amount of money and we tell, we say, you know, this is, this is the money you have, now come back to us with the best snow removal policy in place. That's not going to happen with this. Well, well I think we can be clear when we come back on areas we feel that perhaps this this level of detail is not in that. Okay. We can point that out to you okay. from an advice perspective. That would be good information. So, because I wouldn't assume that we'll, like we're not just going to blindly follow every every piece of direction without a, a, analyzing okay. its value to Edmontonians, and I, we're committed to bringing back. So, if okay. we see something in this and we feel that it's not the best use of money, okay. we'll make sure we point that out okay. to council when we come back, and then you can okay. Got it. perhaps consider it. That, that gives me comfort. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you very much. Um, just looking at the the contractor um, role, and I, I understand the need for it. We couldn't have all the equipment and people around uh, year round, or that would be 
um, horribly expensive and it also provides sort of that that competition um, but I'm just looking at the service level level standards for P2 um, and and that was only met to, what 36.5 percent is is there a way that um, I guess the, the the city work and the contractor work could be spread out between um, the different priority levels so that it does create sort of that that competition um, and that it's not all just concentrated um, in one area for the contractor work versus the, the city work? I think with the, the contractor work, um, there's there's a couple issues. One is we do need to revisit the contracts and what's in there in terms of the um, response times. Um, but there's also different equipment that's used. And, and so in the P2 areas, graders are used. Um, so shifting some of that work to the city um, would complicate some of the um, how we go about doing it based on certain piece of equipment that we do have. Uh, so in order to take over some of that work, uh, there there likely have to be some um, capital investments made, uh, or we'd be using the wrong equipment for, for those um, collector type roadways. Okay, because if they're not achieving their um, service standards for priority two, then that delays them getting into the priority three roads, right? Uh, no, the um, the priority threes and fours are done by city equipment. So oh, my misunderstanding. I thought they went to three after two. Themselves. Yes, the okay. city the city goes from priority one uh, to three, then four. Okay, so all residential roads then that's priority four, and that's done by the city. That's right. Okay, except for the what is it? The skid steers that clear the the driveways of the windrows. That, that's correct, Councillor. We we uh, don't have a lot of skid steer uh, work in in other seasons. So uh, when we do that residential blading, we do need uh, when row clearing at driveways, for example, we would use skid steers through contracted services. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. That's all I have. Uh, thank you, Councillor Mack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to ask about the double wide trailer uh, plows. Is that one of those expenses that um, essentially can get us more bang for buck? So, so is it worth us doing that capital investment, appreciating Councillor Cartmel's regular caution about not wanting to acquire a lot more equipment? Yeah, certainly it, it applies a level of efficiency to the service itself. So like the wing plows you see on the Hende, you'd get these on the freeways, the yellow head and the white mud. Instead of using four or five vehicles to go down that stretch of road, we would use two. So, and which point the other staff members can then be on other priority That's roads. Correct. So, so that one particularly feels like value where I, I might not want to buy other equipment for roads yet until we see how that goes. I, I would be interested in that. So um, I'll just explore that when the appropriate time is. Um, I think the other question I have is, uh, again, with Councillor Cartmel's earlier amendment about blading down to pavement and removal, you'll have that delta cost difference between what it costs to blade, blade down to five centimeters versus pavement, right? Uh, we did pull that together over the lunch oh, hour. Oh, even easier, okay. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll just defer to, to Valerie, who sure. <laughs> just trying to get the right chat up here. Uh, so the delta between the blading to bare pavement once or four times and a season long blading with uh, trucks, which would leave the five centimeter snowpack, the delta is about $83.3 million. But that's doing multiple times. Sorry, I'm just Correct. trying to, so we're dividing that by, so what I'm trying to figure out is if we did once blading down to five centimeters versus once blading down to pavement, Am I taking that number and dividing it by four? Because you just said that was on average four times. So because the um, blading to bare pavement is contracted out due to the type of equipment, um, that was for four times of blading to bare pavement. Oh, and then okay. the internal vehicles are the ones that do the five centimeter pass. I get that it. would be season long. So that'll be included in Councillor Cartmel's motion. We'll have a bit of an understanding of that. Okay, great. Or that, set, that additional amendment. Um, I've sent Councillor Cartmel wording for an active pathways sort of option three, if you will, that looks at a 12 hour, 24 hour, and then, and then five day uh, option. Um, as well as I think the, I think we do need to at least talk about clearing the remainder of our inventory because I think we are expecting uh, Edmontonians to clear their sidewalks in a certain amount of time. We need to clear all of ours. Um, Maybe the last question is, just with regards to enforcement a bit earlier, is there anything else you need from council 
to be able to be even more efficient with the enforcement so that you don't, I mean, I don't want everyone to be solely out in the field 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but at the same time, we don't want people have to come back to do certain things. I think that we would um, look at the program approach and then maybe make a recommendation on what type of enforcement would be required after that. Okay. And if I could just add to that as well, as I had alluded to earlier, we did implement a, a mobile app, which would allow us to be a little more present in the field. It did fall a little bit short in that um, it allows us to get, gather evidence so we can take photos, um, download fo our photos, notes, uh, and do the inspection work. But when it comes to issuing tickets and submitting the work orders, that is where our technology perhaps falls a little bit short. Um, and then it creates uh, more administrative work, which then takes officers off the road from doing the actual enforcement okay. of the snow bylaw. I'm out of time, but I need to close the loop on that, so I'll come back. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Okay, Councillor Salvador. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I should just say I would be excited about sort of a, an AP 1.5 as well. Um, I, I guess I have some questions just around around P3 for active pathways. Uh, have we ever contemplated kind of a complementary program partnership with EFCL, almost like I don't know an adopt a stop type program? Um, recognizing that P3 is, is essentially all manual. There's no specialized equipment required. Um, and then same thing for catch basins, any sort of partnership available there for adopt a catch basin, I think was one of the, the things that was mentioned in the stakeholder feedback. So councillor, I think there are opportunities for partnerships. Uh, we haven't specifically looked at adopt a stop. We did work with EFCL I believe it was three uh, winters ago and, and came up with a sidewalk symposium where we looked at options for supporting some of that type of um, community partnership. One of the things we did do was provide some surplus equipment to community leagues to use that um, to support some of the snow clearing on sidewalks in and around a community. So we have taken some you know, initial work in that area, but we haven't gone to um, the extent that you're talking about it in terms of a formal program for adopt a stop or um, similar to what we talk about with partners and parks. Okay. Okay. Interesting. I might contemplate that. And I guess that would not be considered under assisted snow programs. Uh, it, it, it could be. Um, again, something along that line, I, I, uh, I think it has potential, but I don't know if that, that would probably be something as part of a phased approach because I don't think yeah. something like that could be activated for next winter, but certainly a lot of opportunity in the future. Okay, great. Um, yeah, that's, that's it for me. Thanks so much for uh, dealing with all the questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. Councillor Rutherford. Great, thank you for the patience as I do another round, but a, a few questions that I don't think anybody's asked yet are s around the jurisdictional scan and the use of materials, including salt. And I think it's a bigger conversation in relation to some of the infrastructure wear and tear that we see. And so I just wanted to ask administration about a few things. Um, it says in the report that salt is added later in different quantities. What's the max amount that we mix our salt to sand ratio? I have to ask Val to provide uh, specific uh, information in terms of what that mix is. Thank you. So depending on the weather, our max mix can be 100% salt. So we are pouring 100% salt on the... Depending on the weather scenario, yes. Okay, and I know that, our, but we are pouring also over minus 15, right? And my understanding is it doesn't really work. Salt doesn't really work after minus 15. It actually can cause more problems. Is that correct? So when the weather drops, we decrease the amount of salt in the mix. So at below minus 15, we are at a greater than, I believe it's 50 to 75% sand to salt. So we have much less salt in the mix at that time. But if we have any salt in the mix and it's below minus 15, doesn't it just kind of actually reduce the effectiveness of the sand and create more of a, because it would just melt the surface, freeze instantly, and then you've got the sand kind of embedded? And I'm asking this because I think that, again, when we're looking at, these are the kind of things that 
it, we can do all we want on budget, we can do all we want on resources, but if we're, if we're not actually, um, you know, if we're, if we're creating more problems with some of our practices, then I, then I worry that this won't make a difference anyway. So, Councillor, just in, in terms of the, the mixed design for salt and sand, um, you know, we, we use our experience to adjust that, but also we look at um, other jurisdictions and, and uh, the Pacific Northwest Snow Fighters Association provides a number of guiding documents that we follow as well. So the mix, again, there's a base level of sand in, or salt in the sand pile to keep the, the salt from, or sand from freezing. And then salt can be added depending on the conditions of the roadway and that can include moisture, uh, humidity and temperature. But I think at a certain temperature, there's nothing that really has a big impact yeah. and that's what we try and go with is okay. depending Sorry, on the temperature. Sorry, just mindful of my time. I apologize, Mr. Seabrick, but I guess my last question then is if we're doing 100% salt, wouldn't that be more corrosive than sodium chloride? S salt is so sodium chloride, so we would be using or, that. Sorry, calcium chloride. I meant calcium chloride. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, tired Monday. Well, the, there are there are differences in in the corrosiveness and what what corrosion inhibitors you use with with either of the products and and how you apply it. But typically, the salt mix in its straight form and 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 Ms. Dasa can comment. But we we only use that in situations where. Um, you know that there is significant ice and and there's no other way around it right so it's not common practice that we're laying straight salt like some other jurisdictions would thank you I'm out of time thank you uh, all right so I'm going to um, move a few amendments as suggested by Councillor Knack and so the first is to add an item C to item 1 which would be to modify active pathways AP1 to AP3, which is 12 hours for P1, 24 hours for P2, and 120 hours for P3. Um, second amendment would be to add, and, and I'm presuming these are all friendly because the intent is that this all gets bumped to council and everybody gets to vote on every piece. So item 2E, uh, clear public squares and internal paved pathways and parks and playgrounds. And as Councillor Knack mentioned, that would mean we do all of our paths. Uh, item, add an item 2F, buy six double wide trailer snow plows. And um, my item six, which I think has already been added, uh, that administration provide a full cost breakdown of complete res blading, residential blading, including calls to sack to bear pavement and removal of windrows once, just modify this, Madam Clerk, once per winter season. So we have that single use, or that single time cost. Uh, so that's all I have, and I'll go to Councillor Knack. So very quickly, on the enforcement, is there anything you need in terms of motion or direction from council to look at the technology that we have to allow us to issue tickets using those mobile platforms? I think what we could do is um, with the, the enhanced parking ban and someone walk enforcement, we could take a look um, at that technology and provide that back at the next report. Perfect. As long as that's coming, I just want to make sure I can get you that technology because if that's holding you up, I'd like to help you. <laughs> so uh, if you'll bring it, then I, we, I don't think we need to add it. I uh, appreciate that. Um, a few other quick items. With some of this work, so let's take active pathways. If we do up this, would that also then help with something like spring sweeping? Because you'd have potentially equipment, you'd have more staff, you'd maybe be able to start your sweeping earlier in the, in the year. Is that fair? I'd say in, in general, um, any additional staff, what we would do is take that away and try to, how, how would we build um, those additional resources into an overall program and how can we leverage them in other areas? Would you include some of that as part of this information? Because that's what I'd like to understand. I recognize we might not have a full b body of detail by June, but just high level, they would be used for additional street sweeping, cleanliness. I, I don't know what you would use those folks for, but I'd be nice to know so that we know we're getting more than just snow removal. I, I think we can provide, you know, the opportunities for, you know, the, the resources to be used across the other areas of the 
the programs. Right. I think what, just to clarify though, I don't know if it would necessarily allow us to start spring sweep any earlier because that is really so weather dependent. Um, sure, sure. I, but, but the amount and quantity of resources would help. Excellent, okay. I'd love to start it earlier, but that's a debate for another day. Um, if we do, let's uh, again, same idea. If we did something like blading down to pavement once in a year, could that allow us to look at Instead of picking on, I don't want to add the clear areas around all intersections and alley crossings, but I also know that's a massive accessibility issue. So if we were blading down to pavement once, does that essentially let us get to do that once in the year? And, and would, or at least could we get some of that information to make it clear? Because I do think we need to address those areas. They're a problem spot every year. So, I'm just trying to understand what you, you were con So if we're blading down to pavement, as an example, that includes all intersections. It might not include all alley crossings, but I'm wondering if there's a, a, you know, economies of scale that we get that allow us to fill some of these other gaps by, by funding another area. So I, I think earlier when, when Mr. Robar um, referenced a programmed approach, I think that's what he's, he's referencing. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Real-time tracking, did I hear right, we, we are moving toward, or is there some, do you, so that's happening regardless of any motion today? Th that's right, there's, there's work underway for that. Fantastic, last question, uh, Mr. Corbold, uh, or anyone, but maybe to you directly on this. Um, having this level of data, data was really helpful to understanding the scope and scale of the problems. Are we taking this type of approach and applying it to other areas across the organization to be able to have this level of data, not for council, but for you to, to help decide how you're deploying resources, hitting targets, et cetera? Yeah, short answer is yes, uh, particularly in areas where we need to fix things and adjust things. Uh, and I think that really speaks to, you know, what's happened in the last three months. There's been a body of work that has not been done in 10 years, I believe, in the city on this particular issue. And that, you know, sometimes it comes to a head and we've, we've had to do that. but. We've proven that it can really get to the bottom of, of things. And so, yes, I will Fantastic. be encouraged to use this method for other things Fantastic. as well. Fantastic. I'm out of time, and I think I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Hi. No more questions for admin. I just want to clarify on um, the motion, uh, point 2D. Are we talking a courtesy toll or a courtesy tow? I think that changes the intent. Apparently there's a spelling mistake. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anything else? So again, just for absolute clarity, this uh, goes, this is a recommendation to council. So this will be discussed again at council in two weeks, um, at which time presumably someone will ask uh, for the each option to be separated for voting purposes and council can decide as a group which of these go forward and which don't. Any other questions, comments, speaking to? Uh, so we have a motion on the floor. Councillor Knack speaking to the motion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I wanted to just offer a, a closing thought um, when this comes to council. Uh, and I won't say the same at council unless we enter in a really long debate again. But I would really encourage all members of council to not ask for any of this to be broken up at that council meeting because all this is doing is getting us the detail to then decide if we want to actually budget for it. It's not asking for us to approve any of those when this comes back to council. It's just saying let's go get that next level of detail properly costed out and then use that to inform the final decision. So even if you hate certain parts from this, I think it's worth getting that data for all of it because uh, at least uh, one or more members of council have sort of identified these as some important pieces. Uh, a couple of other thoughts. Um, I uh, really appreciate point six and I, and I just wanna highlight point six, uh, the blading down the pavement and why I think we desperately need that because um, I, I think I'm now the only councillor who's been around when we, most of last term we didn't do residential blading. We went almost every year during the last term without blading because there wasn't enough snow accumulated. So we don't have that um, experience. And I can tell you uh, having that experience is that the amount of complaints you got on windrows this year pretty much match what I got in my entire first term on council. So that if we don't think about that option, uh, and so I just want to stress the importance of not breaking that one out, um, 
will get the same level of complaints about windrows, even if you keep a five centimeter snowpack. So that's something I found each of my first four years, and I think it's really important that we get that, that information going forward. Um, I appreciate that the, the other thing I want to highlight is that I, I do think, and I heard some of the conversation today around uh, what administration would do in terms of how they're prioritizing. I do think we have that direction now as well. We approved a new policy that I do think provides very clear direction about if you were to suddenly increase the budget of this file by 40 million or 50 million or 100 million, uh, that that prioritization is outlined in what is identified in a new policy which focuses on things like access accessibility and efficiency of movement. And so I think there is a way to help do that so that uh, while this is very much in the weeds and I appreciate that, um, there is a guiding body of work that we have that I think was really well done and developed with the public um, with this. Um, so, so this is something that we will never get perfect no matter what and, and I'm quoting Ben Henderson who quoted counsel, former counselor Ron Hader of saying that they'll never get it right, you'll never have a perfect year. Uh, but this is a pretty significant change. This body of work, this level of detail in this report is something I've never seen in my time on council. So I actually think it's really helpful to get us to a much, much better place than we were before. I don't think I took five minutes. I think I took three, but I'll just stop now anyways at three, uh, although I could offer some additional wisdom for two minutes, but I'll leave it for budget time. Thank you. Councillor Tang. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, just speaking to this uh, motion, which I think is actually quite overwhelming, uh, you know, but I think it's been a team effort to, between council members, with administration, with feedback from so many Edmontonians and from the labor union. Um, you know, I there's a lot there's a lot here, and um, but I think we need to understand the options from that budget standpoint, of course. Uh, and you know, if this conversation is a start of that. And if this is what it takes, uh, then I think so be it. We need to lay it out. Um, and I think at that time, you know, we are going to talk about trade offs. I don't think we'll, we will be able to, you know, achieve all of this. And, you know, I think I just want to maybe share some perspective from, from, from what, you know, my, my office has seen and heard um, and what my ultimate hope for this program will be. Um, We've really, uh, our office has collated our residents, every single email, every single telephone call with so much detail and shared it with the team directly working on the policy uh, in hopes that we can center on Edmontonians' experiences. The bleeding down to the payment as much as, you know, Councillor Nag, I you know I hear you, uh, but what we've seen this winter has been vastly unhelpful with so much challenges that outweigh the benefits. It is expensive and it's not conducive to accessibility, but not only on roads, but also sidewalks with particular impact on seniors for folks with accessibility needs, for young parents, for emergencies, et cetera. And I hope we can you know, not necessarily always prioritize this as an option. And ultimately, you know, what do I wanna see? I, I wanna see residents feedback be more positive. I think this should be seen as a key indicator for success. We want to see our frontline workers input be taken in with serious considerations in shaping the program forward. You know, a lot of what we're discussing here has been brought up, you know, and well in, in advance. I want, you know, the workers to feel empowered to make some real-time decisions and not feel like they're locked in by top-down directions. And I heard this quite frequently this winter. I want to see our equipment be fully maximized before even considering new equipment and that we have the full staff available to use those equipment. I want to see healthier relationship with our contractors, which, as the labor union had acknowledged, are necessary to working together with our city workers to achieve the services we aim for. And all of these feed into a cycle that contributes to workforce and public morale. And we need a positive one to make sure the service standards are achieved, in addition to you know, many of the pieces laid out here today. So you know, I think. My, my council colleagues asked some great questions, you know, really dove into the details, and I really hope that this will provide a bit of a blueprint um, to achieving the service standards we need. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll take a turn. I, um, first of all, really appreciate this report from administration. Um, I frankly, uh, and I think this echoes what Councillor Knack said, this is the first time I feel like we've received a forthright report of what we're actually doing with snow and ice. Uh, you know, that is a, effectively a data-driven report that is transparent and honest and open about what we've been able to do and what it would take to, 
to do what we thought we could achieve. I think that that's uh, extremely valuable. I appreciate that ethic, and I really hope that ethic takes hold not just in this department, but in the other departments, uh, you know, that make up city administration. Uh, I this this starts a positive conversation. This allows us to start with where are we at now, where are we at today, and what can we do. Um, this this motion is. Uh, effectively tells administration what council would like them to see uh, what they would like to see further developed in terms of dollars not necessarily as was mentioned not necessarily an approval of these things but where we want administration to dig in a little further and, and refine those costs so we have a menu of selections uh, but there is no way in the world in my view that we're going to be able to accept all of this in fact there's in my view no way in the world we are going to be able to do much more than see what we can do with our existing equipment, primarily on arterial roads, P1s and P2s. I do not think we should be chasing down the road, no pun intended, of blading to bare pavement on residential roads. I think that we, we need to develop an ethic that in the winter you're going to have to find your way three blocks out of your neighbourhood to get to a properly maintained and cleared arterial road. Uh, because otherwise we're going to be spending tens of millions of dollars every year picking up snow to watch it melt and I just really struggle with that I there may be some bleeding that needs to be done in the spring thaw or in those breakups but uh, and I think there's probably something to do with with uh, improving the walkability of some of our neighborhoods with some more focused work on pathways but picking up every speck of snow on every speck of asphalt in Edmonton and expecting that to be our standard I, I just think that's that's way over the top, but we'll see. We'll see what the dollars come back to, and we'll see where if we can build to that in a methodical way. Um, but we're talking about a lot of money in a very, very challenged environment. I, uh, if you're listening to this and your power bill went up and your diesel or gasoline bill went up, well, guess what? So did ours. And what we've heard is that this budget has gone down over five years, where all our city got 21% bigger in terms of the length of lanes that we have uh, in our inventory. Uh, that does not equate, and it sure doesn't equate when inflation is running somewhere between 5 and 10% on those basic uh, energy costs. So uh, we have a formidable challenge in front of us. So I support the motion, but not necessarily all the spending that it implies. I'll stop there and call the vote. I'm in favour. Jans. Thank you, Councillor Jans. We have four votes. Please display the vote. That is carried, so see you at Council in two weeks to further discuss that. I have a subsequent motion that I've shared with the clerk to make right now. I think this will be very quick. It's a seeking of information. for that to pop up. We're just getting it up right now. Uh, my motion is simply this, that administration consult with EPCOR to examine whether flood mitigation storage areas can also be used as snow dumps. So I'll briefly introduce this, uh, and this is, this is my understanding that, uh, well, it's my firm knowledge that EPCOR is undertaking a $500 million uh, effort over the next many years to uh, uh, provide flood mitigation solutions to our drainage system. Uh, essentially, they're going to create places where uh, water can be stored when we get those uh, great big storms in the summer so that uh, while the storm hits, water will overflow into certain places uh, and then trickle into our storm sewer system and ultimately to the river in a controlled manner so that we don't overwhelm our sewer systems and, more importantly, don't overwhelm our combined sewer systems. Those storage areas are going to be uh, some quantity of uh, storage tanks or cisterns or caverns or things underground and some amount of open spaces where water can flow over the ground and find the way back into the storm system in a managed and controlled way but in so doing be effectively filtered uh, through soils, through uh, ground filter systems, through other things that essentially extract the toxins from that water before the water goes into the pipe. Uh, if that's the case, there may be some uh, surfaces, some areas where we can put snow 
and snow can melt and find its way into that storm sewer system in that same controlled, filtered way. So it's an idea worth exploring. I don't know that it works for uh, snow that comes off of arterial roads that would have a lot of sand and salt and grit and other stuff in it, but it might be a way for us to do uh, a bit of more localized windrow removal, school zones for instance, uh, that uh, you know can be managed in a more controlled way and save us a the cost of making more and building more snow dumps and b the cost of trucks deadheading back and forth to essentially haul snow uh, part way across the city to one of the few dumps that we do have. So, not sure if this will go anywhere, but it seems like we have a confluence of uh, purposes here that we might be able to double down on the work that EPCOR is doing with their flood mitigation work. So, leave it there. Happy to take any questions. Effectively, this would just be a information report coming back to committee. If there are no questions, then I will call the vote. Is there, I just oh. have one. Oh. <laughs> so to the mover, can we just um, include um, to assess the environmental impacts? I know you've, you've talked about it extracting toxins. Well, this is, uh, EPCOR works to an environmental standard. This whole thing is oh, an environmental that'll... impact question, really. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I, I should have mentioned that. No other questions? Very good, I'll call the vote. We have four votes. Please display the vote. And that is carried. Uh, third item of business on our agenda is item 6.5. Uh, it is quarter to three. Uh, and I guess uh, just to our speaker on item 6.3, we may not get to 6.3 today. Uh, so stay tuned at your own risk, Mr. Rates. Um, we'll move to item 6.5. Before that, I will need a motion to add some speakers. So I will move that we hear from these additional speakers. Uh, Jennifer Petty, a resident of Riverdale. Uh, Maria Krzyzewski, Krzyzewski, sorry about that, and uh, Carol McDonald. Please vote on hearing from those speakers as well. Mr. Chair, are speakers number two and four the same? That's just an e-scribe, Councillor Jans. It will be corrected in the minutes. Got it, thank you. Yeah, these, we, have, we, we will ultimately have six discrete speakers here. In, in favor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jans. We have four votes. Please display the vote. And that is carried. Uh, very good. So, uh, to administration for a presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, councillors. The report before you today provides an overview of the current situation for people experiencing homelessness in Edmonton and provides detailed information on how the city will support Edmontonians this summer, including our encampment response approach. Next slide, please. Edmonton has made significant progress toward ending homelessness over the past decade. Over 13,000 people have been housed since 2009, and prior to the pandemic, the number of people experiencing homelessness has fallen to 1,300, levels not seen since the late 1990s. Edmonton has been considered a leader among Canadian municipalities in addressing homelessness through Housing First programs, which help people experiencing homelessness access housing and provide them with the wraparound supports needed to maintain it. But over the last 24 months, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to increased numbers of people falling into homelessness and widened gaps in services required to support them. The number of people experiencing homelessness in Edmonton has more than doubled since 2019, December. This has led to an overall level of homelessness that matches our historical peak experienced last when the Alberta economy entered recession in 2008. In addition to overall increased levels of homelessness, we have also seen a dramatic increase in the number of encampment related complaints. In 2016, we saw 790 complaints submitted to 311, while 2021 saw 6,204 complaints submitted. This trend is expected to continue this year. There are also signs that the number of people experiencing poverty and economic hardship have increased over the course of the pandemic. For example, food bank usage is up over 11% from 2020. 
Increases in poverty and economic hardship will increase the number of people at risk of or experiencing homelessness, which in turn will increase the number of people living in encampments. As the number of Edmontonians falling into homelessness increases, the gap in services widens, affecting service levels for housing supports, mental health supports, addiction services, and emergency shelters. Furthermore, emergency shelters will find it increasingly difficult to meet the complex needs of people experiencing concurrent challenges, such as severe mental health, physical health, or substance abuse, so sorry, substance use disorders. Finally, emergency shelter conditions themselves can impact shelter usage, as some will avoid shelter for fear of theft, threats to physical safety, a lack of personal space or privacy, and a lack of indigenous focused services, among other factors. This is the context that we are currently facing, and with that, I'll ask Crystal Kajenner to provide us with information about how the city supports vulnerable Edmontonians experiencing homelessness. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Flamin. <clears throat> Historically, between 2013 and 2018, encampments were mostly managed by the City of Edmonton through the Homeless on Public Lands Committee, and City of Edmonton efforts focused primarily on encampments in natural areas below the riverbank or in parks, where parks rangers would work directly with street outreach and city operations to coordinate cleanups and try to ensure street outreach had a chance to visit each camp before closure. Since then, administration has formalized and expanded its approach to focus on two outcomes. One, to coordinate the closure of low-risk encampments with clear and consistent connections to shelter and housing options. And two, to prevent the establishment of large-scale encampments that have negative health and safety impacts both below and above bank. When a complaint is received regarding an encampment, a combined team of peace officers and EPS members investigate the site and assign a risk level. The subsequent response is then driven by the risk level assessed. There are three potential responses. First, the housing focused response focuses on connections to housing through the multi-agency encampment response team. Sites assessed as low risk encampments are routed to the team, which includes partner agencies, Homeward Trust, Boyle Street, Community Services, and the Bissell Center for person-centered housing focused outreach. Additional efforts are made to connect individuals in these camps to housing prior to resolution, to their resolution. <coughs> Two, an accelerated response to encampments that pose a high health and safety risks to both individuals and communities is led by the city peace officers and EPS. Timely, um, and the timely resolution of these encampments is the priority. And the third prong is a coordinated approach led by the city and EPS to respond to large scale encampments should they occur with a corresponding governance structure. In all cases, cleanup crews are assigned to follow up after encampment closures to ensure the sites are restored. Also, it should be noted that both police and peace officers will enter any encampment at any location in the city if necessary to address safety and security concerns. Next slide, please. This summer, we'll see a reduction in available emergency shelter beds. As the provincial government continues to wind down the temporary investments it made in response to the pandemic, this includes funding for temporary emergency shelter beds, which has been decreasing since March of 2022 and is set to end by uh, June this year. The, de the decrease in available funded shelter spaces will amount to a 44% reduction in capacity from earlier this winter, or a reduction from 1,135 to 634 beds. According to emergency shelter occupancy statistics released by the Government of Alberta, last year during the months of April to October, the average number of people accessing emergency shelter each night was 715, ranging from 595 to 867 on any given night in the summer. However, the by-name list also shows a 29% increase in the number of people experiencing homelessness year over year. Although it is possible that some <coughs> excuse me, existing facilities may be able to increase their capacities over the number of beds they are funded for, administration expects to see an increase in the number of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness this year. Next slide. In response to this potential increase in demand, administration is working to augment its encampment response to meet these needs. In 2022, the staffing resources dedicated to support individuals and encampments will include approximately 58 FTEs broken down as follows. Nine street outreach workers, nine housing workers, six parks rangers, six EPS members, 14 laborers dedicated to cleanup, and 14 staff with the special downtown waste collection team. Parks rangers will be redeployed from other duties to ensure there is sufficient staff coverage throughout the summer. 
Administration is also working with the outreach teams to confirm plans to fund additional housing and outreach staff to meet anticipated demand this summer. An engagement process is also currently underway to determine the scope and focus of a new Indigenous-led outreach team, which is expected to be contracted later this year. In addition, the City is involved in the Coordinated Community Response to Homelessness Task Force, which has established multiple working groups to plan pilot projects to trial new approaches to addressing homelessness. One of these groups is focused on encampments specifically. Next slide. In addition to the encampment response described on the previous slide, the city has also funded these services for the summer of 2022. Expanded day service hours and services, drug poisoning response services, increased access to public washrooms, thank you, <laughs> and bridge housing spaces at three sites, which is in addition to the existing jockey dorms and plan for expanded extreme weather activities, including ensuring that vulnerable Edmontonians have safe access to city facilities to get respite from extreme heat and poor air quality, as well as 15 water bottle filling stations building on the successful pilot last year that transformed five fire hydrants into water bottle filling stations. Next slide, please. The city's efforts to support people experiencing homelessness are in tandem with work being done by numerous other organizations, including the provincial government, Homeward Trust, and a wide range of social service agencies. Together, all of these partners work to ensure that the safety and basic needs of vulnerable Edmontonians are met, as well as ensuring that people have connections to other critical resources that support um, them, including housing, addiction and mental health supports, employment, income, and wellness services. Agencies across Edmonton run day service programs for individuals and families, and most emergency shelters now operate 24-7, which creates more space for people to access services during the day. There has also been a growth in the number of outreach teams who ensure access to water, food, harm reduction supplies, and overdose response, as well as connection to housing and other supports. In addition to funded outreach teams, there are also volunteer mutual aid groups that supplement and support this work. Next slide. Based on experience and data, it has become clear that encampment response approaches and the delivery of emergency shelter services need to continually adapt and evolve in order to be effective at addressing unmet needs and achieving housing outcomes. To this end, administration has completed an evaluation of the 2021 encampment response from last summer and found that while we succeeded in enhancing collaboration between all parties and in preventing encampments from becoming large scale, Nonetheless, these efforts often simply displaced encampment occupants. This led to more small-scale encampments and higher cleanup costs. Encampment closures that frequently displace individuals could impede the goal of providing services and housing by reducing trust and making people less likely to engage with frontline staff. Encampment response teams are not adequately resourced to address the volume of encampments or the complexity of health and security challenges encampment residents face and there are challenges with data management that impact assessment, coordination, and performance measurement. Next slide. Administration recognizes that more work needs to be done to improve the response to unsheltered homelessness in our city. Administration is already working on a number of improvements to enhance our response over the short, medium, and long term. These actions are a direct result of the evaluation findings and is in alignment with the community safety and well-being strategy that will be presented to council next month. Some examples of steps we are taking in the short term include increasing our engagement effort, efforts with stakeholders, including uh, people with lived experience who are sleeping outside currently, improving our assessment tools, exploring improved and new processes, and continuing to encourage the adoption of minimum emergency shelter standards to help shelter, shelter operators better meet the needs of the people they serve. Next slide. Over the medium term, administration is exploring additional improvements, including enhanced coordination of multidisciplinary efforts, which could see an improved dispatch model, additional supports for neighborhoods, more outreach, and more health services integrated into the encampment response. Funding for an Indigenous-led shelter that would provide additional shelter capacity in a manner that aligns with the City of Edmonton's minimum emergency shelter standards and deliver culturally appropriate services for those who identify as Indigenous which represent more than 60% of people experiencing homelessness in Edmonton, as well as improved proactive planning for winter emergency shelter for as long as the number of people experiencing homelessness in Edmonton remains high. 
These improvements will be brought to City Council for their consideration next month through the safety, Community Safety and Wellbeing Strategy Framework Report and through the 2023 to 2027 proposed budget process. Next slide. While emergency shelters, day services, and encampment response strategies are crucial shorter term tools for addressing social disorder related to homelessness, the longer term strategy involves increasing safe, adequate, and affordable housing with appropriate supports in all areas of the city. This work is crucial for preventing housing insecurity and transitioning people out of homelessness. The city recently completed a fourth round of its affordable housing investment grant program intake um, or so, and is an intake for a fifth round of applications is set to open this summer. To date, the city has approved or committed to a total of 2,304 units and is on track to meet its five-year goal of creating 2,500 new units of affordable housing by the end of this year, including 600 supportive housing units. Administration is also currently undertaking engagement, working with an advisory committee formed of representatives from key Indigenous organizations to draft recommendations for the city to help increase Indigenous-led affordable housing supply. A dedicated funding stream will be required to help Indigenous organizations that want to become more involved in affordable housing overcome barriers to participation. The city has initiated conversations with the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation to understand how the strategy how our strategy can align with the recent budget announcement of 300 million over five years, starting in 2022 to 2023, of the federal, urban, rural, and northern indigenous housing strategy, and how other recent federal budget announcements can be leveraged to meet the city's goals. To ensure the city and its partners are able to reach city plan goals and the collective effort to end poverty and homelessness in Edmonton, administration is also preparing a four-year investment plan to create and reach new targets. Next slide. Before we close, an additional tactic that has been previously discussed and considered is the use of the managed or, or a sanctioned encampment. This type of intervention tends to be understood as an interim solution to address the immediate conditions of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness. In 2019, administration and Homeward Trust retained org code consulting to make recommendations around encampments. The ensuing report strongly advised against tent-based sanctioned encampment areas. In general, large-scale encampments are seen as unadvisable due to their difficulty to manage safety risks, including the weather, legal implications, cost, and their potential to undermine housing efforts. In addition, administration conducted a jurisdictional review that confirmed that there is little evidence to suggest that sanctioning encampments would keep people from establishing encampments in other areas, improve service delivery to unsheltered individuals, or provide sustainable and safe options for groups of vulnerable people with complex needs. Administration does not recommend pursuing a sanctioned encampment at this time due to its limited potential as an effective response to homelessness. Next slide. In terms of next steps, Council can expect to see a number of housing and homelessness reports coming forward this June, in addition to the related work in the Community Safety and Wellbeing Strategy Framework next month. These reports will cover a wide range of topics from minimum emergency shelter standards to an affordable housing investment plan update. Administration can also return to council, will also return to council at the end of the summer with an update on the homelessness response plan for this winter and beyond. We've reached uh, the end of the presentation and we're happy to take any questions that you have about this work after you hear from speakers. Just might add just a couple of points if I could. Uh, the first is that um, we don't have the details yet, but we're working closely with uh, members of the province and um, uh, down the Chinatown BIA on some uh, innovative pilots for some of the acute areas that we could also apply in other areas downtown. And we're also working, uh, again, don't have the details yet, but on, on some initial work on how we could discharge to supports rather than discharged into, into homelessness for um, emergency uh, facilities at hospitals and things. And we're working on a couple of early pilots that we might be able to provide more details in a few weeks to Council One. So I just wanted to indicate there's still other work going on as well. Great, thank you. Thank you for that presentation. We'll now move to speakers. Um, before we get started, just a reminder to our speakers, I think everyone is remote, uh, that you'll each have five minutes to speak in a panel, and after everyone's had their opportunity to speak, councillors will be able to ask questions of anyone in the panel, so you may want to stay with the meeting, and at least until all of the questions have been asked and answered of those on the panel. Uh, each person gets five minutes, so if you can keep a timer, we don't have a way of indicating otherwise, there'll be a timer on the screen, uh, but you might want to keep your own timer, and... Uh, with that, I will go to uh, Christy Morin, followed by Jim Gurnett. Uh, Ms. Morin, over to you. 
Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks, thanks for uh, letting me come speak. I definitely am supportive of uh, continuing to support houselessness and homelessness in our city, as we know that there is just so major, so many major issues and uh, gaps in what's happening right now. So I appreciate the, the team that's putting this together and uh, sharing what's happening in our city. As far as uh, whether or not I support it, yes, I do support the um, the non-managed or sanctioned encampments. Um, we, we in our neighborhood call it the Indigo Mile um, from uh, from the Yellowhead down to 111th Avenue, which is 12 blocks, we have now five uh, five ho new housing components, whether that's um, the Sands Hotel, the Coleman Inn, Jockey's Quarters, a whole bunch of other great places um, that are wonderful and support a lot of people in need. The concern that um, I bring, and I guess the question is, you know, I know that we say that we're collecting engagements and we're doing data collection, but I'm wondering where the amount of information that has been collected, even through the um, emergency um, emergency uh, quarters, you know, through the winter time, we are meeting with the city on a regular basis as community and uh, sharing our concerns of, you know, the citizens that are inside the um, the shelters, when they leave, there's a lot of um, concern as to if they're high-risk individuals, um, violence, that type of thing that's happening, needle usage and stuff, and, and what is happening to the community around it. Um, I was surprised that there was no data collection around community engagement that we've been meeting, but no kind of information, other anecdotal stories were heard. And when asked what kind of you know, why we did these engagements, it was so that we could be heard. And that's lovely heard. I'm just wondering about what action around that for the community that is surrounding these areas on an ongoing basis. And also, and I know that in the study it, or in the um, presentation, it was talking about, um, you know, not spreading this out across the city, but keeping them sort of closer together. And I have to say, um, a bit of a concern about what happens to community when we put too much of one type of individual in in a community that could be across the whole city and whatever type of uh, individual we're talking about. So um, really looking at being able to um, give an opportunity for health for the people that are going to be in a shelter so they're not walking out the door to a trigger area and community. And um, same thing with, uh, you know, when it comes to encampments and, and these extraordinary um, pieces that we're putting together for housing during hot days and that kind of stuff, what kind of supports are around the community because we um, really care, but we are over capacity with how to care. And um, to call in all the time, it would be great to actually have a 24-7 team that is actually riding bikes and calling stuff so it's not uh, weighted on the community to make always those calls. Um, so thank you again for your care um, up upon the uh, vulnerable community in the city is just some areas that I think um, are some, some, some more gaps that just need to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morin. We'll now go to Jim Garnett, followed by Natalie Napier. Mr. Garnett. Well, the Edmonton Coalition on Housing and Homelessness appreciates this chance to, to speak, and we want to caution councillors to approach action on this issue only when you have better information than today's report provides you. Uh, addressing the living situations of people in informal, temporary, or portable housing is complex, but an approach that further erodes the dignity and assaults the safety of people who live in this way is at least not respectful and probably a violation of their human rights and a factor increasing their unwellness. Remember the context. For nearly 30 years, governments have dramatically underfunded non-market housing in Canada. We have failed to use public funds to ensure adequate housing for people with inadequate financial resources. People living rough are a consequence of failed public policy and investment not a story of failed human beings. The city's own director of affordable housing and homelessness is a signatory of a letter calling for human rights to be the basis of decisions for dealing with homelessness and to ensure that actions in this area do not make things worse for people. The report before you is not consistent with that. This report does not evaluate the implications of court decisions ruling that informal temporary housing has legal validity and cannot simply be removed. 
the report asks for support to continue an approach to people living in informal temporary shelter that has been a demonstrated failure for years and has no likelihood of being better at the very time when the numbers of such people are increasing. It does not always accurately present even key information as it tries to minimize the severity of the situation. For example, the report states, and I quote, the city of Edmonton is making investments in the following additional services, expanded day shelter services and hours of operation, a Bissell Center, end quote, when in fact, the hours of day service at Bissell Center will decline from the current 91 hours per week to 42 hours on May 1. The report does not provide you with vital information. Our written submission lists some questions that need to be answered. The report does not offer an adequate review of the rich variety of possibilities that sanctioned approaches may offer. A few months ago, ECHO hosted a presentation about one such possibility. It does not adequately identify the significant problems with the current removal approach that have been well described by research. This report does not invite you to consider the human rights based advice presented in the National Protocol for Homeless Encampments. That document basically describes how failure by government to provide adequate services and facilities leads to people making their own solutions. And then when they do this, they are criminalized or further disrupted by public authorities for doing that. This report offers no perspective from people who are living in these situations with their voices about what the current way they are treated means to them and what they think might be a better approach. Before members of city council use this report to arrive at conclusions about how to approach the issue, ECHO encourages you to go to any location in the urban core and observe as the removal forces arrive. Watch an already in adequate temporary shelter that is home for a family being taken apart as the people living there sit in shock, having everything removed around them and tossed in the back of a dump truck. Watch the frightened or angry faces of people rushing to pack as much as they can into a rickety grocery cart before the truck reaches their location. Watch city and EPS personnel standing about chatting while this desperate flight is happening. Watch the people who have just had their homes torn away from around them, trudge a block or two and begin setting up a new shelter an hour later. We appreciate the knowledge and commitment about the right of all people to adequate housing that city councillors have clearly expressed. We encourage you to make a brave, exciting commitment to finding a better way to address the reality of people living in informal and temporary shelter. Doing more of a terribly failed saying, hinting that somehow it will now be done better, is not good enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Natalie Napier, followed by Jennifer Peedy. Uh, Ms. Napier. Thank you. I have a slide presentation coming up. I believe the city clerk shows, shares it. Yep, we're just getting it loaded. Just a second. Okay. There we go. Good morning. Or good afternoon now. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Natalie Napier, and I am here on behalf of In With Forward, a social design team that has been working with Recover at the City of Edmonton for the last five years. We also do cross Canada research with people experiencing homelessness. We think it's important to bring the perspectives of some of the many campers we've spent time with to the conversation today. Our work with the city's Recover Urban Wellness Initiative began with ethnographic research to understand how unhoused Edmontonians understood and experienced well-being. I think that research, as well as more recent research in Toronto's shelter hotels, can illuminate some opportunities for Edmonton in this moment. Slide. In With Forward has partnered with Recover as an organization with a mission. It's our ambition to transition 
Canada's social welfare state from safety nets to trampolines, meaning to redesign supports that help people bounce up and move forward to lead flourishing lives according to their values. Slide. When it comes to housing, we've had the real privilege to, speak, uh, to spend time with individuals like Jen, who can help us understand why some people reject housing supports. This is Jen singing her heart out at karaoke in the Mustard Seeds Church Street location at the end of 2017. She spent much of that evening visiting and caring for people in her extensive network. That included mediating a dispute at a couple's request. Before closing, she led the women in a cleanup of the washroom, as was her routine. She had a new job cleaning office buildings at night, which she said was filling her with a sense of purpose. In the wee hours of the morning, she made it back to her urban camp. And the next day, the camp was removed and Jen started looking for her next spot. When asked about housing, Jen was frank, quote, I don't think I'm quite ready to have a home yet. I don't utilize the services available to me because I'm not ready to respect the rules they have, end quote. For Jen, her role in community came first and staying housed meant making a break from the street community. Slide. I met Renee in Strathcona in January, 2019. Renee had been camping for two years in the River Valley with her adult son after two unsuccessful attempts at housing. Renee spoke nostalgically about when she was housed, um, and, but her hosting of her son and his friends had twice led to eviction. Renee described her experience with shelters as one of always being sick and feeling unable to sleep. So Renee camped while dreaming of housing where she would feel less surveilled. Slide. More recently, I had the opportunity to spend time in one of the shelter hotels the city of Toronto has used to empty camps and bridge to housing. Meet Richie, one of many hotel residents who were struggling with their new environment. For Richie, his preference for the encampments was all about relationships, agency, and autonomy. In the camps, he built trusting relationships that gave him a sense of safety and security. He felt empowered to solve his own problems, and he quite successfully held down a job uh, on an eviction prevention team, perhaps ironically. In the hotel, he was censured for taking initiative and expected to let staff handle things for him and to wait for a response, which he had trouble with and he was eventually evicted. Slide. When we looked at the stories of 60 street involved Edmontonians in the round, clear priorities emerged. While housing, meals, clothing and money were real stressors in people's lives, they were at best a means to an end. And the ends people were after were non-material. Slide. And too often they experience services and supports as interfering with these outcomes that they value for themselves. Slide. Recover has taken this learning on board and called for a few rebalancing acts. They, that looks like a shift away from framing problems solely in terms of material lack, for example, lack of housing, to taking a yes and approach. Yes, people have material needs and they have non-material needs like a sense of purpose that need to be met concurrently. Recover has also identified, you can see on there, <laughs> Recover has also identified more powerful levers of change that can expand our thinking from infrastructure and programs to the roles, interactions and experiences that happen in those buildings and programs. Slide. Because it's what happens inside encampments shelters and housing that determines outcomes. Slide. The opportunity here is to experiment alongside campers, shelter users, and people on a housing journey. We can experiment with new kinds of roles, interactions, and experiences to find out what might work for whom, when, and under what conditions. Slide. Thank you. Luckily, the city of Edmonton, sorry, I've got two slides left. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'll have to cut you off there. We just we're got a few more speakers yet, so, uh, but I'm sure there'll be some questions for you. Uh, we'll go next to uh, Jennifer Petty, followed by uh, Maria Krzyzewski. Thank you. Um, if you can, I think my slide deck looks like it's right after, um, after Natalie's, if you can pull up that slide deck. Uh, while they pull up the slide deck, I'll just introduce myself. So good afternoon. Um, my name is Jennifer Petey, and I'm a resident of Riverdale uh, in what we call north of Rowland, um, which is the area immediately adjacent to Dawson Park. 
Uh, I was born and raised in St. Albert, but I have chosen to raise my young family in Riverdale and Edmonton because uh, I love the proximity to downtown and the River Valley. But there's a it has a whole other side uh, to that that I think it's important for City Council and particularly this committee to appreciate when they're making important decisions in respect of our homeless strategy. Okay, uh, next slide. So as you can see on this map, uh, and I, um, I gave this presentation um, to this exact committee in 2019. This is the exact same slide deck. Um, but what I think is particularly important for this committee to understand, given we have a whole new council effectively, um, I acknowledge that we've experienced COVID-19 uh, since this deck was given, um, but our experience on the ground as a community in the area where it is most concentrated uh, has not changed. And I would say arguably in the last 11 years that I have lived adjacent to this in Riverdale. Um, even worse, what concerns me is our homeless population is now more than double what it was. And the emergency housing that was in place during the pandemic is no longer. So if the city doesn't address this issue, we are gonna have a massive crisis on our hands this year. Um, Anne shared with me the administration's report that was shared, um, but as our elected officials and in keeping our community safe, including those of us who are living immediately next to these encampments, I'm pleading with you that we can do better as a city. Um, <clears throat> please challenge the status quo because it, it's not proven to work. And I would be happy to join and I invite all of you to come and we will walk the trails with you um, and show you what we can see. These pictures, uh, that I've got in this deck. I'll, you can flip to the next slide. Um, they speak louder than words. So I'll just quickly go through those um, and then to give you a sense. So this is Dawson Park. Those are the, we're just adjacent to downtown. These are the hoodoos. My kids love to play on there. Um, there's been discarded needles found there. Here's the great bike trails, but often there's discarded garbage all over those beautiful bike trails. Next slide. This is what it looks like within about 50 meters of behind the backyard to my home. These pictures were taken in 2019, but my neighbor was up there yesterday. It looks exactly the same as it did in 2019. Just wanna point out there's propane tanks there and discarded needles. And this is uh, what would be an abandoned camp. And there's hundreds of them out there, I would say. Next slide. Our homeless neighbors are often trying to stay warm, but what they're doing is it's putting our River Valley and our homes at risk. These are pictures that I took. This is a camp that's visible from my our, my daughter's bedroom window where there's a fire and we ha and explosions. And you can see here, this is what it's left after the fire department leaves, it's just discarded. And then they move on. Next slide. This here is a picture I put, took from my daughter's bedroom window. You can see where that arrow is. That's where the camp is. And that's where there were, I think almost 10 explosions and fires in 2019. And the season has started again. Last week I called 911 twice because there's been fires there. You can see again here, this is my neighbor's patio. And again, you can see how close these camps are to our homes. Next slide. This is the stairs, that is my commute. I love living close to downtown and walking up to downtown. This is what I pass on a daily basis. Repeatedly, we've been asking the city to send crews to keep this tidy. It doesn't make you feel safe when you walk past this. I don't take my children up there. Um, and it's costing a ton of money for the city to kind of keep this clean, but it's not even scratching the surface. Next slide. Here again, um, this is a typical day in the life of living north of Roland. Is these are a list of all the fires. I won't go through them for the interest of time. But then there's also the situations of screaming person who is either on drugs, schizophrenic, or having another mental health crisis. Um, and we don't know who to call. This is a constant, constant occurrence. And we've just hit a point of almost apathy. But this is what it's like every day. Even last night when I was reviewing the report, there was people screaming in the bush as I was sitting on my deck. So we need to recognize that this approach is not safe for our communities and it's not safe for the homeless people who are living rough. Uh, as a community who's directly affected by these account encampments, we again, similar to one of the other speakers saying, we feel the burden of having to, to constantly report these camps and it shouldn't be our burden. This is the highest concentration area and there's no solution there. Our suggestion, one, uh, are, they're sort of falling on deaf ears and one we need the city to think differently about this. So I liked Natalie's presentation on thinking differently and looking at different ways we can approach this because it's not working the way it is. And I just wanted to close with a quote of a piece of paper that I found when I toured the camps. We took all of the or any candidates during the election period that were willing to tour the camps with us. We walked them through and was one of several of those that did. And I found a scattered abandoned camp. There was prescription bottles, needles, 
and then photos of an indigenous woman and child from school pictures. And there was a, a journal in there. And I, I'm going to read you a quote from this because this is important, I think, to understand. And this is a direct quote from her. I understand that there will that they're undoubtedly in power was power in sobriety and staying away from illicit drugs. I am mentally ill. I need you to transform me by renewing my mind. If it be your will, take me out of such a high risk environment. It is extremely difficult to stay sober here and oppression drives me insane. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next we have Maria Krasuski followed by Carol McDonald. Good afternoon, everyone. In a perfect world, everyone would have a home. As a regular volunteer with Inner City Pastoral Ministry, I meet people who live in encampments that spring up in the area around 96th Street and 105 Avenue, and in ravines and parkland of our River Valley. Now that spring is here and shelters have closed, I see the tents, tarps, and lean-tos that house folks who have no choice but to sleep rough because they can't afford rent or are otherwise unable to be housed. I also notice how these areas are frequently removed by EPS and city cleanup crews only to spring up against the next fence or further down the river valley. The suggestions of the current city strategy for homeless encampments before you looks just like a continuation of what has been a proven failure. Many homeless people form loose communities that look out for each other and share resources in our inner city streets. In dismantling their living spaces and disposing of their possessions every couple of weeks, the current city response, the homeless crisis, only increases homelessness and mental health concerns and moves them around. If you are serious about finding solutions to homelessness and encampments, I would ask that you please ditch the plan you have before you and read the report I've emailed to each of you individually. It's called a National Protocol for Homeless Encampments in Canada. It's less than 40 pages and it offers solid ideas for working with the Edmontonians who are being displaced every few weeks, who are actually experts at housing themselves, but lack resources the city should be able to provide somehow. I believe that if our city could use this report as its blueprint, we would save a lot of resources and have a much better chance to help homeless brothers and sisters in our communities. I'm just gonna read you the principles, the eight principles of the report. Principle one, recognize residents of homeless encampments as rights holders. They're not problems, they're human beings. Principle two, make ensure meaningful engagement and effective participation of encampment residents. This is big. Principle three, prohibit forced evictions of encampments. Principle four, explore all viable alternatives to eviction. Principle five, ensure that any relocation is human rights compliant. Principle six, Ensure encampments meet basic needs of residents consistent with human rights. Principle seven, ensure human rights-based goals and outcomes and the preservation of dignity for encampment residents. Principle eight, respect, protect, and fulfill the distinct rights of Indigenous peoples in all engagements with encampments. I believe that Edmonton can do this. I hope you will all read the report I'm sending and work for its implementation rather than continue with the current plan that's not working. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to suggest we have one final speaker, so I'm going to suggest we continue to hear from that speaker and then uh, we'll get into questions after the break. So uh, if that's okay, I see nodding heads. So we'll go to uh, Carol McDonald. I believe Carol's unable to make it. Um, so she asked to have the time given to me. Um, what I thought I would, if, if it's okay, I would just no, like I'm to sorry, read. We can't, I'm sorry, Ms. Petty, that's oh. not the way it works. It, it's uh, uh, each person gets five minutes to speak, so we can't, we can't delegate that way. Uh, can I read her submission? Uh, uh, like I have it, I have it verbatim. I can read her submission on her behalf. No, I'm She's sorry. just got a medical appointment. I, I understand and I'm sorry for the circumstances, but uh, we just can't have it that way. Otherwise it, it, it tends to run our processes. Uh, 
uh, we, we need to stick to our rules. So uh, if there's no other speakers then, uh, I would suggest that we uh, take our break now. We'll reconvene at uh, just at 3.45 and we'll go to questions of our speakers. Okay, thank you. We're in recess.
Thank you for your patience. We'll get started again. And we'll move to questions of our speakers. Uh, we'll start with uh, Councillor Tang. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I will like um, Ms. Napier to finish her, you know, her last couple points. Uh, I'm assuming you were about to talk about uh, the well-being framework um, and how that may or may not apply in this case. Yeah. Um, would it be possible to get it up on the screen? Uh, if you're able to, maybe you can just go ahead and, and, and speak. Sure. Thanks for the question, Councillor Tang. Um, so I was saying that, you know, the city of Edmonton is invested in research and development um, and the recover well-being framework is an example of that. It's centered around desired outcomes of connection and well-being, which came out of that ethnographic research. And the outer circle of the framework offers up levers of change that can influence whether people feel a sense of connection and well-being. And Recover uses a prototyping process that experiments with different levers of change, such as resourcing unusual suspects to play different kinds of roles that convey meaning and purpose. And then the middle ring of that framework offers up some different kinds of metrics to help us understand what it might look like when people are feeling a greater sense of connection and well-being. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, I guess, uh, you, you know, your team works a lot, uh, spend a lot of time with folks on the margins, uh, whether it's in Edmonton or other uh, cities. What are some of the key pieces of information that you search for that are essential to uh, human centered design, which the report talks about? Yeah, so um, with every ethnography that we do, we use different methods to understand pain points and stressors uh, as people experience them, as well as values and what people consider to be good outcomes for themselves. And we observe to see what is working for people, how they behave in different environments, how they solve problems, um, what kind of solutions they gravitate towards. And we prompt using designed tools to understand what's appealing to people, what they're drawn to. And all of that gives us clues to begin to generate ideas and design alternatives that might work better for different segments of people. And we do that with people as well. Yeah, no, uh, that's really a critical uh, lesson. Thank you. Um, so this report focuses a lot around the services and the programs and the changes that they may undergo as part of, as a result of the human centered design research uh, work. And in your experience, whether it's with Recover or with other initiatives, when organizations wants, wants to push forward uh, incrementally um, to improve the status quo in favor of disrupting the current understanding of problems and the solutions, what is needed? Because I feel like uh, it's, we're really focusing on incremental change here. And what I'm hearing from the speaker is that's not good enough. Hmm. Well, um, we do need to be able to have some conditions for experimentation alongside delivering current services and programs. Um, so we can create space to do small scale experiments that are safe to fail and don't need to conform to all the regulations and protocols and norms of the current system. Um, so that can look like a you know, creating a culture of learning and curiosity. So for example, there's, I think, 54 full-time equivalents referred to in the report. And some of those folks might be um, trying to experiment um, with some different ways of doing things. Um, and I mean, because it takes all kinds of skill sets and sensibilities to um, test different ways to get to future states to imagine possible futures um, all alongside implementing the current system. So we have to have um, people doing both kinds of work. Um, and we have to have an appreciation for different ways of knowing. We have to blend design thinking or our team, we, design, we blend design thinking with social science, psychology, philosophical approaches um, that emphasize experiential ways of knowing and we're influenced by indigenous and other non-Western cultural traditions. So it's yeah. important, I think, to value other I have ways one, that we can understand. Yeah, I have one more question for you and I wanna circle back to some of the other speakers. Um, just in terms of your work uh, in Toronto this past summer, in terms of their encampment strategy and relocating folks into the hotels, what are some of the key lessons there that you think, you know, um, Edmonton should really heed? 
Yeah, so that was actually this last winter. Um, and um, I think that we need to understand what kind of transition do people want if people are moving into a transitionary, like a transitional housing? What is that a transition to, and who who makes those decisions? Um, how can people be more involved in the governance of those spaces? Um, how can people bring the values that they're drawn to in encampments into those spaces and find ways to um, make them their own? So, in short, center on the on the people who are going to be most impacted. Thank you very much. I'm out of time. Thank you. Mayor Suhi. Yeah, thank you everyone for uh, for being here and for your presentation. I just want to follow up on uh, Councillor Tang's questions around, like the, the encampments are symptoms of a bigger problem, which is uh, the uh, lack of affordable housing, which is the lack of supportive housing, which is the lack of uh, wrapped around services for people to deal with trauma, with mental health, and addictions crisis, right? But in the meantime, we as a municipality in this case is picking up the pieces. We are the one who are the front line dealing with the symptoms of uh, that lack of investment. And Ms. Petey, you are feeling that as well in living in the neighborhood uh, where uh, you're being impacted by it. And there are many, many other communities and neighbors who are being impacted by that. And you ended your remarks by saying, you know, status quo, status quo is not working and we need to look at different ways, uh, new ways. Just want to pick up, what are, what are those new ways? Have you any, any ideas? Like, uh, and this is to uh, Ms. Napier as well. Maybe, well, I'll start with Ms. Petey first. Like, what are the new ways that we can look at? Well, and again, I'm an accountant by profession and a resident, so someone. But I'm not an expert in this field. But what I find is I'm I have been a very empathetic as a community, and and we've had long conversations with our previous councillor and our current councillor as a community on the impact of this, and we understand the complexities. And I, I didn't read it, but in my slide, it, I understand the people that are living this are are probably the hardest to house, the most complex needs, and we fully appreciate that. Um, but I, I, one thing that I am excited about in the report that has I have not heard from previous city administration is an Indigenous-led um, approach because I can say anecdotally, um, like what we see here, like I would say we live, I work downtown too, so like you see there's sort of different types of homeless, I would say, if that's, if that's appropriate to say. But the ones that are in the valley are often the really rough, like yeah. living as rough, like they, they aren't, they don't have a bed at night. They, 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 and they, they are very overly represented by the Indigenous community. And as part of my own truth and reconciliation efforts, like this is something I want to be a part of, of how do we do that? But one thing that we really need the burden taken off the communities of whatever the solution is, because we, the constant thing is report it to 311. Like I have to almost laugh at those stats because I go for a walk and on an average walk with my dog or my kids, I'm logging like 10 to 12 tickets. That is not good for my mental health to yeah. continuously focus on that, on the negative in my community. And I know that we aren't reporting all of it um, because what happens is nobody comes. They'll be like, you'll report it. And then six months later, that abandoned camp is still there. So it's just like, what's the point? So the data, I would say, is completely unrepresented. But one of the solutions that I raised to our counselor is, why can't we have a, like a caretaker for our park? Like We really just need somebody who walks the trails because the rangers don't get out and go up in the trails. They, the police will go up there if there's a nighttime incident. The fire is goes and puts up the fire, but they don't actually connect the people with anybody. But that's who we're seeing on a regular basis. Those are very extensive services. Yeah. We have crews and we know the people, the crews, like I know the crews that are out here. And I met a lady just out, out with her truck and I point out, can you go pick up the box spring and mattress that just appeared here the other day? And she said, yeah, I'll go get that. She was one of the city crews phenomenal woman and I was like she should be the park caretaker like you need someone to walk around who cares and just sees and you know builds those relationships with those people I know the outreachers are out there we see them occasionally with their backpacks but there's also a very under-resourced like neglect of the abandonment like this is not there's I think there's mm -hmm. two separate issues in some respects because even the abandoned camps aren't being cleaned up in okay. any timely fashion yeah, and well you if you drive down towards Riverdale, it looks like a garbage dump at the corner of Alex Taylor Road and Roland Road. And that's how people get to downtown to our beautiful ice district. Like it's, yeah. it's embarrassing. 
and it looks like someone just took a dumpster, but there's nobody living there. There's no reason that that cannot be cleaned up because it's not, it's a step, but what we're finding is they keep saying these, oh, it's encampment and they're too stretched and they have to make point of contact with these individuals. And I get all of that, but that's not all of what we're seeing and they're not, well, the other stuff isn't being solved. Yeah, and I know I will, these schools work really, really hard, but they need more money, more crews. We had a not-for-profit that we put forward as a community a few years ago um, that was that was employing hard uh, former homeless people to go and clean up. Like this is dealing with, you have to have, you know, toxic um, training and hazardous waste stuff, but it doesn't necessarily even need to be city crews. Like why can't we just hire a not-for-profit that does clean up to just deal with the abandoned ones and then let the other skilled people, you know, target where they need to make contact with these people. There's lots of ideas, but we just keep seeing the same thing over and over. Report the tickets. We're working on it. We're under-resourced and even like we are the highest concentration and have been for 10 years. Yeah. Well, we don't we'll have ask. anything dedicated to us at all well, and never have. Yes. So um, that's what we need. Good. I'm out of time, but we'll ask those questions to admin as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councillor Paquette. Thank you, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start with Jennifer since you're already on a roll. Um, what we're seeing as a result of underfunding of mental health supports, addiction supports, and the results of over a century of federal policy toward Indigenous peoples. Um, we see the result of those other orders of government's decisions on our doorstep. We don't have the money. I'm going to say it really plainly. We don't have the money to deal with it. We could, but that would mean an incredibly large tax increase for the people of Edmonton, which may be the people of Edmonton are supportive of. From that perspective, where do you think we should be focusing the majority of our efforts? Uh, <laughs> I'm an accountant by trade. Okay. And yeah. so my view is, um, that's not entirely valid. Okay. I pay very high property taxes where I am, but there is so much inefficiency in the current system. So this is why I'm suggesting like a park care ticket. For example, if I log a ticket and there's a garbage overflowing at the end of my street that is full of a mattress, there's a crew that's like privatized. That's we, we outsource that. No, it's, it's city, city workers. It's city workers. I live here. It's city workers. They drive up in a city okay. truck. Well, I've heard differently, but okay. Yeah, they pick it up. The bus stops are privatized, but the, the city workers pick it up. But then I'll say, okay, well, there's for something just down the trail, like 50 meters that way. And they'll say, oh, that's not in my zone. <laughs> I can't go pick that up. You'll have to log that through yeah. it's a ticket. But literally, they're like right there with the truck. Like there's all kinds of things like that. that okay, I can, so there's, there's money in the system. Good point. That. Point taken. Privatizing that will have to be taken up. Profit cheaper than paying union, union employees. Like, it's not skilled labor necessarily for some of the needs. Some of it is, yeah. some of it's not. Okay. So, do you feel that the money we need for this will be found in the system currently, based on what we've received from the auditor's report and multiple years of the city actually having reduced buying power? So we've well, had made have, massive cuts year after year after year. Yeah, well, I think I think there's always there's always opportunity. Like I do, we this is not a well-oiled machine. <laughs> I can tell you from having spent time on logging tickets and things. Like I think there's always money to be had. But even if there is not, I would pay money to have my quality of life back because it is it is at the point where people do not want to live close to downtown. Yeah, no, and point taken. And by the way, I'm not disagreeing with you, but the frustration you feel, believe it, we feel just as much. Oh, no, because, and I fully appreciate yeah, the, I want the you to know that. government. And we're writing to all and levels of government. And we know very, very clearly that the, the real culprit here is the underfunding of mental health and Absolutely. addiction supports. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and federal approaches to Indigenous issues that they caused. Yeah. So... Thank you so much for that. I, I, it sounded a little bit confrontational between you and me, but I think what it is. No, no, no. I, no, I, I, I totally agree. Issue. I totally yeah. agree because it is a yeah, big, yeah. that's what my, I want to just, it's a complex issue and it's not the city. It trickled down, but we got to, we live here. We, this is our it, city. It would be like as if we said to community leagues, hey, how come you're not dealing with the uh, homelessness problem in your area? <laughs> you know, it's, it was, wouldn't be a fair thing to say. Uh, so I'm going to move on. Thank you, by the way, very much for everything that you've uh, submitted today. Um, 
I want to move to, to Jim. Uh, same kind of question, because uh, you mentioned it's an opportunity for the city to be bold uh, and exciting. Um, where do you draw the line between do, uh, take, taking this burden on property taxes uh, and the city can't go into deficit and a provincial government or a federal government who absolutely goes into deficit whenever they want to and for whom the solution to this would actually be a blip on their budget, which is incredibly frustrating. For us, it would be a massive impact on our budget. For them, it'd be a blip. Where's the excitement and what the city can do, I guess, is what I'm looking for. Well, I, I think I'm entirely sympathetic to the to the idea that uh, um, we need to continue to keep the pressure that you folks have done so well on, on other orders of government to come up with the real money that's needed to address some of these things. Um, but but in the immediate context, I also think that that it's prudent to look at how much is being spent to do what we're doing, which I think, as all of the speakers said this afternoon, uh, is is continuing to not succeed in any way. Um, if if those millions of dollars that are doing what doesn't work were creatively reinvested in some some uh, experiments around whether we could have sanctioned opportunities for people that were living in informal settlements, we might be surprised at at the fact that we could have a better quality of life and avoid some significant problems uh, without spending more money. Not so, to say that we back off on continuing to advocate for the other money. Yeah, so I'm out of time. So you're saying just a reallocation of funds could potentially solve the issue. Thank you. We'll move now to Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thanks very much. And thanks to all of our speakers for being here uh, today. I just wanted to hone in on a few key points. Um, so Ms. Morin, I, uh, Ms. PD, I'll come to you as well. But Ms. Morin, you really spoke about the burden of reporting on communities. Um, if, if I'm hearing from you, something that would really help uh, lessen the impact of surrounding communities would be to have the city doing some of that, that proactive inspection or, or um, surveying? Yeah, that's exactly right, Councillor. I think often to what Jennifer spoke to, I mean, the, the health and well-being of our, of our community that lives in and around these areas is, <clears throat> is really at a fragile place. So to be able to have people that are not just doing business hours, you know, nine o'clock at night are actually out and about and hearing the screams. It is like when you hear that at two in the morning, it, it is like you cannot go back to bed, counselor. Like you are like literally on pins and needles calling 911, not knowing where this scream of this individual is coming from and if they're safe or not. Should you leave your home? Should you go and look? I mean, so it's not just the regular hours that I would say we need support in. It's the after hours as well. Yeah, thank you for that. And and so, um, Ms. PD, maybe you could speak to that as well. Just sort of where, when when you need those supports there as well. When are sort of uh, key key hours of activity that uh, that you may need people around for? So I would absolutely echo what Kristen said. That is absolutely our lives here every day. So I don't want to that I would verbatim say what she says it's the screamer in the middle of the night it's and what what is tricky is it leaves us as a resident in the position of it doesn't fit in a bucket like i don't need to call 911 when somebody is probably having an, a hallucin a hallucination in the bush because they're high on something but on the same token i don't know that maybe it's something completely unrelated but we've become desensitized to it and as a as a human it makes me feel awful because i'll call and then they'll say you go and call 911 and they go to the police and they're like, well, what, is they, what do they look like? What are they saying? Is it a domestic dispute? And then they're like, is it in the bush? Okay, we can't come there. And then you just, you, you've now spent 45 minutes at three in the morning on the phone. Like, and then you, there's, we've been given flow charts by the city of like, call 211. You call them, they're like, oh, we're too busy. We can't come. Or what does the person look like? We might be there in an hour. So can't call the fire department. So, and so the other point I just want to make is the, the reallocation of resources. We are calling 911 sometimes. That is not a 911 issue. Mm -hmm. There's money. That's a very expensive resource. Yeah, well, and I think, you know, you spoke to the frequency of calls that you're making to, again, some of our highest cost uh, services, yeah. absolutely. Um, also, just just very briefly, and then I have another uh, question for Mr. Uh, Gurnett as well, but I, I've heard from you as well, just that concern around the service level expectations on the cleanup. So even when cleanup crews come, it's maybe not not to the extent that, that communities might hope for. 
Is that the absolutely case? yeah? I like for example, I'll tell you like last week, a bunch of neighbors took it upon themselves to pull out an abandoned camp right out of the bush behind them. They had reported it twice. It was closed 184 days, I think, on the ticket on 311. Never, no one ever came to clean it up. They pulled it all out, and then still the garbage sits there. So mm -hmm. it and that is that is the norm yeah, here. Right. That, and I and I, that's why I wanted to make the distinguishment of abandoned camps versus active camps are very different issues. And we just kind of stop reporting them because it's no one comes and cleans them up. Yeah. No. Thank you for that. And I'll, I'll certainly follow up with some questions of administration. Um, just, just to uh, Mr. Garnett, I, I really and and Miss Napier as well. I think I really appreciate your points around needing to include the voices, the folks who who are living in informal shelters. Do you do you have any quick feedback or insights for us in terms of? Um, things that you hear in terms of specific sort of immediate responses that those individuals may may like to see or is the call really just that 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 further work needs to be done um, so that we have that information uh, well uh, I, I can start maybe and just say that yeah when whenever you have conversations with people who are who are living um, uh, in these kind of informal settings, they have lots of ideas, and, and often they're very simple things. Just having having places that uh, are are a little more established, where they have access to, to sanitation, where they have access to some sense of security um, uh, as they live there. So I, I don't think they're costly ideas. Some people have even more elaborate ideas about little little uh, mini villages, almost with with all kinds of services, but. But yeah, I, I think if we get out and, and listen, um, there's there's lots of, of evidence that's out there of workable options that would that would be a positive approach. Whereas a lot of the discussion that we've been having these last minutes is is focusing around all the problems that continue to arise because we keep doing what we already know doesn't work. And and so uh, I'm just uh, excited to see us. Couldn't we try some of these things that people have talked about, and even things that they've they've done successfully in some other communities and municipalities around North America over the years, and and see what happens instead of always deciding that that those kinds of experiments can't work. I mean, we made this same presentation in 2019, and I made this same presentation to councils almost 15 years ago to show that there are things that could work. And there's there's lots of great ideas out there when you stop and chat with the people that are that are living in these us uh, in these encampments. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Chance. Thank you, um, to Mr. Garnett. Would you agree with the statement "housing is a human right"? Yes, I, I mean, I I think that uh, one of the other speakers, Maria, highlighted very well that that if we base the decisions around what we do with people living in these circumstances on a human rights basis, that will uh, that will immediately take a new tack. And would you agree that a bed that does not meet our shelter standards is not? actually a bet at all and we shouldn't be because if it doesn't meet our standards we shouldn't be expecting an Edmontonian to to go and stay in it exactly the I mean the international agreement about what the human right to housing means is is specifically that it's adequate housing that is it's safe secure healthy um, that that you know it's a place that's dignified to live as a person one of the concerns I have with tent clearing, is that if we clear some neighbors on 105th Street from their tents that it's not like they can just, if they're not willing to, or or there's, well, the report has acknowledged that there's not enough shelter space available, period. If they're not able, able to get into a shelter that they'll just have to go and set up a camp now on 103rd Street. And all we're really doing by tent clearing is just displacing folks from one area to another, traumatizing them and getting them essentially worse off. Are you aware of a um, a managed encampment strategy that you would prefer to point us towards in another jurisdiction or 
or or somewhere else. And if I lost Mr. Gannett, I could ask Ms. Napier as well to respond. Um, I'm not sure about managed encampment strategies, but I think that there's a lot to leverage in neighborhoods. I think there are, uh, it's not just about having more professionals. There's a lot of folks who would like to be able, who are frustrated because they want to know how to be proactive and um, just filing tickets is um, not not very satisfying. No. Uh, in our last year, we prototyped uh, two different ways to connect regular Edmontonians um, across lines of difference with their neighbors. And one of them was around grief, loss, and healing. Um, and we found that we were able to bring support around um, Edmontonians who'd experienced grief and loss and who had um, wanted to go through a creative process um, with strangers. Um, we were able to help them figure out how to navigate that and that everybody felt more connection and belonging and healing through that process. Um, so I think there's lots of ways that we can bring neighbors together in these areas and prototype some different roles and relationships. Can, um, is um, Miss uh, Maria, I'm sorry, I don't have your last name here, Maria Kay, still with us? Might have lost her. Is yes, I'm here, I'm here. I was Hi Maria, just... sorry about that. Yeah, um, I was wondering if if you could confirm, I think I think you referenced it, um, in Toronto, when they did the encampment clearings this past year, I think they spent over $2 million. Um, have you seen other financial figures about um, the cost of encampment clearing? I'm the wrong person to ask that question. I'm simply a volunteer in the inner city, and I would, I would suspect that the uh, city should have record of how much it's costing them to um, send out the police and the the workers who throw everything into the dumpsters or the the trucks, and and leave our people with nothing. Yeah, no, no, I I uh, I might have I might have misheard who who mentioned Toronto. Sorry, I think um, I did. A coverage of those events showed oh, that see. they hired paramilitary. I understand from the people that I spent time with, it, it was quite a traumatic and a really um, full force kind of event when they cleared Trinity Bell Woods. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, maybe I'll, I'll ask um, uh, Miss, uh, Miss Pede, uh, Pede? Pede, yeah. Pede, sorry. Um, were you aware that your counselor Stevenson tried to bring forward a motion to uh, reconsider a $25 million spend downtown to try and have that money prioritized for housing and other other initiatives earlier this year yeah i'm aware that there's there's motions for for housing for those kinds of things yes but um recognizing again the complexity of the multiple layers of government that sure. are needed and um you know i i don't know how i feel about managed encampments to be honest um, all I can tell you is what we're doing right now isn't working. I do think the Rossdale situation, I actually thought that was excellent because what it did, I felt like as a community here, it's so hidden in the valley that even people who use the trails don't necessarily see it. But what that did is it brought it to the forefront of people who were out and about, uh, like it made it so visible. And I was, I thought that was fantastic because I was like, this is actually an issue to people everywhere in the city, not just because it's easy to just turn a blind eye to it. And if you don't work downtown or you've been working from home for two years, like you don't realize what's going on. It did. So I, I think what we're doing isn't working and it's wrecking our river valley and our communities, um, but it's not good for the people either. So uh, that's why, you know, we can lead to all levels of government, but at some point we have to just deal with what we've had handed in some token and calling 911 in the middle of the night may not be the right thing. There's probably better approaches. I apologize. I'm out of town. I out of out of town. Wow, out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Hi. Thank you very much. I, I think uh, Mr. Gannett's back online with us. Is he? Yes. I hope I am. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, thanks, Jim. You you talked about it's a human right for for safe and and security and and healthy um, housing options. But as I understand it, those that are living rough don't necessarily see that in our shelters um, as being a, a safe and, and healthy environment for them. So are these 
are these encampments the right answer then? Well, I think like you say correctly, many of the people that are choosing to live informally in these ways, it's because they're not comfortable with what's available in the in the existing emergency shelters. But the conditions they're living in, as as my as Councillor Jans was mentioning, are not really very good in many cases either. The quality of life is poor, unhealthy, dangerous. And and so that's this is why I think that uh, a careful exploration and, and maybe experimentation with the possibilities of, of supervised managed um, sites would would show some positive results. It's a path in between. We, right now, we're, everybody loses with what we're doing now. The people themselves who are living in the informal settlements, the people who are living in the communities where they are, and, and so we know it doesn't work and we've known continuously that it doesn't. There's, there's a great research document mentioned in, in our written submission that looks at this across North America and demonstrates all the, the problems created by renewal, re removals and, and uh, t dismantling of camps. So to honor people's human rights, we've got to do something better and make a commitment to that. I don't think it would cost a lot more to do that either than what we're doing now. And would these managed sites be viable year round? I mean, given our minus 30 and 40 degree temperatures in the winter? Well, I, I mean, I'm not the expert on that, that but there's, there's certainly possibilities for that. Um, and I think there's there's a, a lot of cases we could look at that would tell us more about what could be done, what needed to be done to, to make them viable. Um, and uh, it, it, there may not be a perfect solution, but if we if we had a more dignified approach that honored people's human rights, it might also cause people to be more open to also look at some of the other options in bridge housing that are already available to them instead of being so reticent about that as well. Okay, so there is more that we need to, to look at then. Okay, thank you very much. I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Uh, on the second round then, Councillor Tang. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I just really want to thank all the speakers. You know, I think there is a couple of themes that are coming through loud and clear across several speakers. I just want to pick something up that um, I think Jennifer and Natalie you both mentioned, just in terms of some roles and uh, interactions. And I think Jennifer, you mentioned really well how uh, there could be perhaps refresh, renew different kinds of roles that folks who are living rough can can take on in in terms of contributing to the community. Um, have you ever contemplated perhaps roles for the local residents like yourself? Because what I'm hearing too is right now you take on this role of reporting, of calling through, and of being very much on the lookout. Um, did that ever just, and if there's an opportunity to have a conversation, would you be interested? Uh, we, I guess we are act, we have been advocating for this with the city administration for over a decade. Okay, I'm not alone in this, I'm speaking for, and so um, with bated breath, I'm interested in talking with the administration, but I, we've been promised a lot of things that haven't materialized and it just is like the same thing. It's like being on a hamster wheel, like, but, um, uh, and that being, I want to just like, we, we do interact with the homeless and, and we, you know, we Absolutely. give them water and all of those things. But, um, I think we want to be part of the solution, but it just, it, it, it also, it's a burden on the same token. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, what I want, I like the conversation around thinking differently and maybe trying something smaller scale. Like the, the answers we keep getting is like, well, we're going to have another committee and then they're going to talk about this for three years and then nothing's going to happen. But I like the idea of like, why can't we just experiment? Like maybe something neat works in just Dawson Park. And then there's yeah. some great relationships built there. We had washroom attendance last year with COVID funding and they had great relationships. They were like university students or something. We knew yeah. them, they kept, made it feel more safe. They interacted with the homeless. There's opportunities there that are pretty low hanging fruit to think differently in each community. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Natalie, do you wanna just respond to that? Also, I'm curious, some of the research you have mentioned pre pre previously, which I am familiar with, this is work City already has done, uh, you know, where are some of those literatures, where is it housed, uh, just in terms of solutions that do think differently? 
Yeah, well, I mean, I couldn't agree more with Jennifer. I think uh, having those opportunities to start doing things in community and getting feedback on what works and what doesn't and seeing the effect of behaving in different ways, trying out different kinds of um, relationships with people and being able to kind of change some power dynamics is um, really exciting. Um, in terms of where we keep things or <laughs> what's been done, um, Recover has over 60 individual profiles for folks who are street involved. Um, there are reports or what we call playback books for each of four rounds of ethnographic research in the core in Strathcona with users of 24-7 crisis diversion in City Centre Mall. Um, all reports present top pain points and opportunity areas and identify possible starting points for prototypes. Um, Recover has access to all of that, and their website also has reports and blogs about all the prototypes over the past five years, some of which have their own websites, uh, like cool. solos.ca. Yeah, no, uh, thank you so much. I'm out of time, but just to say that there's, it seems like there's a lot to build off of. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. I believe Councillor Paquette's on for administration. So that uh, completes uh, questions of our speakers. So we thank all of you very much for joining us today and sharing your perspective and, and making your presentations. I realize my camera was off. Uh, we'll now move to questions of administration. Now, Councillor Jans, you uh, exempted this item, so we can start with you if you're ready. Pass, please. Fair enough. Uh, Mayor Sohi. Yeah, I'm cognizant of the time because we only have 35 minutes left, right? And uh, so I'm going to get quickly into questions. Have we looked at having small supervised managed sites? Um, th uh, thanks for the question, Councillor Sohi. We have looked at it in the past, um, examined it, especially during the course of the pandemic, like at the very beginning in 2020, there was some guidance from the CDC around not moving encampments to reduce the spread of COVID-19. And so we did investigate the prospect of a sanctioned encampment at that time. And what we found was that cities who had experimented with sites often ran into one of two challenges. One is that they were well managed by having adequate services and supports present, but they were very costly and the costs were similar to an, in, an internal, like a, an, a building or a solution that was inside essentially. Nice. Um, or in other cases where they weren't as expensive or they maybe were less um, extensive, then they quickly became unmanageable and untenable. And, posed a number of safety risks that ultimately res resulted in them being closed. So you'd rather see that money go into permanent solutions instead of temporary solutions. I get that. Okay. And, and what, I, would, I would also say, Your, your Worship, that, uh, you know, we've had some conversations. Nobody in this city, from what we could tell, wants a managed encampment in their backyard okay. uh, and near their community uh, based on our discussions with some of the BIAs and others. Okay. So when uh, encampments are dismantled, uh, whether by force or uh, uh, or uh, other ways, right? Uh, I understand there is a high risk uh, enforcement team, place of city and EPS. Have we looked at a more of a tripartite approach, the way we do with transit now, having uh, more com community involved and more compassionate approach to uh, uh, to moving people if they are posing a safety to them, a safety risk to themselves or to the community? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Mayor Sohi, that is something that was um, came out through our encampment evaluation that we did of the response last summer, is that there may be an opportunity to have outreach participate in those um, closures to, prov to be the messenger of that clear and consistent connection to housing options, and that is something that we're looking at. Are we looking at or are we implementing this, that tripartite governance structure that we have similar to We're implementing where it can, but we have to be cognizant of the numbers. We removed 1,765 camps last year. There is not the capacity to add social services to every one of those removals, or if we were to wait to have a social service there every time we did that, there's no way we could remove uh, that many encampments. We've already done and we've cleaned up 322 in this fiscal year already. Yeah. Well. I would love, definitely love to learn more about that because I think that's the better approach than uh, more of an enforcement approach. But uh, I would say to your worship that I, to assume that just because a social agency is not yeah. there does not mean it's not a compassionate approach. Oh, I and understand. I think it's important, no. But I think it's important to state that because the police and our bylaw officers and those involved 
are very compassionate in their approach to, to when they that, do this. I, that's not what I meant. I'm sorry if I it's, came across no, that. No, no, but, but it's not done in the, in the manner described by some of the speakers, I would say, as well. Yeah, so yeah. there's a lot of compassion involved. So why don't we uh, uh, clean up abandoned encampments quickly? We, we clean them up. We, we, so like I said, we cleaned up 1,765 last year. These there were are abandoned 20, ones, okay. Yeah. There are 28 reported vacant encampments awaiting cleanup and removal that are on our list right now. Uh, we are doubling our cleanup crews from last year to this year, 14 last year. We're up to 28 this year with 14 of them focused on the downtown area. Okay, got it. And the idea from uh, Ms. Petey about uh, having more of a coordinated park caretaker uh, that is out there building that relationship and uh, identifying uh, problem abandoned sites instead of citizens calling 311 and be burdened with that kind of work. Yeah, I think it's a really good idea and one that we should follow up with, with her and with other communities. Okay. And then also looking at uh, some of the social enterprise opportunities like we have for washroom management, right, and all attendance, right? Can, are we kind of looking at that, those kind of options? Yeah, and in fact, we are funded for that with some of the decisions that were made in the fall budget for attended bathrooms, which, which are part of our plan. Yeah. Okay. And my last question is related to uh, the uh, city working with neighbors. I know it's a burden on the neighbor, but uh, we are a community. And we have, as a community, have a responsibility to look after each other. I understand concerns from Ms. Petey, but do we have a structure in place where city works with the neighbors to give them tools to engage or I mean, uh, provide some sort of support for to? Uh, um, Council or Mayor Sohi, we do do that in an ad hoc way currently, where there's like hot spots or periods of particular consternation, like the areas around the Spectrum Building um, is more in reference to engagements that we've done. Um, we do focus, but what we are proposing in the CWSB framework and also coming to you as part of the budget is two strategies for better addressing it, and it was addressed in the report, but one of them would be a multidisciplinary team to work on encampments, which would incorporate members of NET, which is the city's um, community safety team that is a, common, a partnership between our staff and EPS, and they work directly with neighbours to address community safety concerns, and we would see them being part of a multidisciplinary response okay. in the future to work directly with neighbours. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Tang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you to administration for the presentation. I do have quite a bit of questions and a motion. Um, but maybe I'll start with the questions, if that's okay. Um, just in your previous encampment uh, responses, how successful are we at um, finding living spaces for those folks, like permanent? Uh, do we have any data on that? Um, yes, Councillor Tang, I can tell you that of all the people housed last year, approximately 17% of the people housed were f living outside at the time that they were housed. Um, which is significant given the number of barriers faced by unsheltered people in accessing housing. As you know, it can take an average of 59 days to house someone from a tent into um, a permanent house. And um, that process has been expedited more recently by investments in bridge housing, which I think is part of why we had um, reasonable success last year around that. And those 17% of the folks have stayed housed, would you say? I can't tell you specifically around the number of unsheltered folks, but I can tell you that the Housing First programs in Edmonton have an average retention rate of approximate, or success rate of approximate over 80%. So the yeah, vast majority be, of them would. Yeah, I would be really curious about the retention rate of those who um, maybe have historically um, lived outside. Um, I guess in this report, we talk about a, a more robust encampment response for this year. Um, and I guess from a service delivery, you know, I can see that's more robust because we're adding more resource and personnel uh, to that response. I guess I'm just thinking, if you are thinking of the experiences of those living in the encampments, what experiences do you hope that they will have with that reinforced, um, robust encampment response? And how are you measuring these impact and how do you, they fit into research and evaluation? Um, so for, I can speak from the housing side of things, although there's obviously other parts of, in te of teams of the city involved in this. Um, and we, so we track the number of people that are housed by the outreach teams that we employ to engage with encampment residents. So certainly one of the outcomes that we hope for is that more people out of encampments are re ac accessing both bridge housing and permanent housing. And those are two evaluation metrics that we track in yeah. response to our ongoing re response. 
Yeah, and 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 I suppose you know I'm also thinking those who are housed and you know, who are outdoors, uh, there's they're quite diverse as well, and there may be a segment that maybe housing isn't the outcome that they want. Um, and I guess I'm also wondering, you know, do you beyond some of the ethnographic research that was shared earlier by one of the speakers, do we have other you know baseline data or uh, is that part of the ethnographic research that you're planning to undertake as described in the report? Um, yes, Councillor Tang. So we do have extensive research from the org code report that was done in 2019 that spoke to 60 people sleeping outside at the time and talked to them about the barriers that they face in accessing both shelter and housing. Um, but we are renewing our efforts around engaging people with lived experience this year. And we've contracted MAPS Alberta, which is another firm that works with vulnerable people to do journey mapping of someone's experience in an encampment with the goal of being um, really clear around where the pinch points are in the process for them and how we can help remove those barriers to shelter and housing because obviously I think that's the goal that we have for everyone who's currently sleeping outside is that they'll be able to access you yeah. know permanent yeah. safe housing. I want to follow up on that in my second round. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I'm glad to hear um, that there has been contact with um, with those that are um, living rough that um, I think you mentioned um, 60 people we're, we're included in sort of your survey. Um, that was sort of my concern is, is are we reaching out to them um, to see what their needs are? So I'm glad to hear that. In the report, it talks about new strategies that are being discussed um, and potential pilots. What are some of those new strategies? I'm, I'm thinking, you know, have we looked at existing campgrounds within the city? Is there um, tiny homes, something like that, that we could provide? Um, so uh, uh, there's a couple questions. So in terms of our, what's currently being explored, the two major strategies that are most related to unsheltered homelessness would be an augmented encampment response team approach, which would be more multidisciplinary, have longer hours of service beyond like the business hours referenced by the speakers, and also incorporate healthcare professionals and net team members to work directly with neighbors. So we do have a, a proposal to pilot it, um, an approach like that, that will be included in the CWSB work that you um, council will see next month. In addition to that, we also have developed, are working on developing a proposal around an indigenous led shelter. It has been acknowledged that indigenous people are disproportionately are included amongst the people experiencing homelessness in Edmonton. And I would say they're also slightly overrepresented in terms of the unsheltered homeless as well. And so an Indigenous-led shelter that um, incorporates, you know, a more comprehensive well-being framework in how they engage outdoor sleepers to help bring them into shelter, we think would be an important intervention that could work towards um, increasing shelter uptake. Okay, and for the, the augmented encampment that you spoke about, like, would that be a, a large population or like smaller to manage? Uh, we're the, team, the proposal that's fleshed out in the CWSB framework is looking at about uh, nine FTEs. Um, so they would work with the existing resources that are on the, in the, also being applied to encampments currently, but look at augmenting um, the approach so that it includes all these different disciplines. And then if that's successful, obviously we would look to scale um, an, an approach like that. But what we've found is that um, sometimes people need access to connections to service while they're waiting for housing as well. And that can help them in the housing engagement process, which is why we're interested in trying to incorporate mental health and addictions workers into the encampment response. Okay, okay so that's staffing. I, I'm wondering how many clients does that serve? Then? Oh, sorry, thank, oh, sorry. Um, you know, um, ultimately, we haven't gone that far in terms of modeling the exact program and, and caseload, but somebody, uh, I could get, I can get back to you in terms of how many FTEs, what that would translate into a caseload. Someone on my team will have that if you give me a minute. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. My time is just about up, so I'll yield the rest. Thank you. Councillor Paquette. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's just, uh, okay, so encampments are not desired by any community. Uh, they um, are generally unsafe uh, for a lot of folks uh, who are being taken advantage of um, and exploited. Uh, there's also the element of community within encampments, which is healthy, but then there's also the difficulty for access to services and things like that. So these are the challenges we're facing there, right? Along with sanitary issues and so on. 
Yeah. Yes. Those would be some of the challenges. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So when it comes to uh, housing, the challenge is, of course, just money and capacity to build. And then for supportive housing, we need that provincial partnership for uh, the supportive services. Yeah. Yes, that's cor uh, yeah. that's correct. Okay, so I'm just I'm, I'm detailing the issues. Now we hear that some people say uh, I'm hearing this uh, concerning thread of people saying like, oh, you know, some people don't want to be housed. Okay, that's an outlier, and I'm worried that that will become a predominant uh, um, talking point, and I hope that uh, it does not, because that is those are very much outliers, and it's not even that they don't want to be housed. In many cases, it's, it's just that our current model isn't really functioning for them. So my question uh, is, knowing that we are looking at uh, yet another year that represents a train wreck of human misery, um, I haven't seen anything that represents any sort of transformational change in how we're approaching things. We're approaching it from an iterative perspective, which I totally appreciate, keep building those blocks. But for the public, it's not enough. And I didn't see any. I didn't see anything presented to council for us to consider that would represent something that would mean a massive shift. How come? Um, well, Councillor Paquette, I think because quite simply, there the challenge is pervasive and it's, comp it's complex. And ultimately, the thing that's going to be transformational is c consistent, persistent effort uh, that continues to build off the system that we have and works to scale it up and to meet people's needs in a different way. I wish that we could provide you with a um, brand new out of the box solution that was going to house all 800 people sleeping outside on any given night in the very short term, but without an extremely significant investment of resources, um, solutions like that just don't yeah. exist. So I should clarify, I don't blame you for that uh, in any way, shape or form. This is, as I said earlier to the speakers, a failure, a massive, unmitigated, and absolutely inexcusable failure on behalf of the federal and provincial governments. Yes, they put money in, but nowhere near enough to satisfy the need, and municipalities across Canada cannot bear the burden. Sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. I am very frustrated at this, Mr. Chair, and I'm out of time. Uh, you actually have a couple more minutes. The time error was incorrect. I don't know if you have any other questions, Councillor Pekin. Well, I do, <laughs> but I don't know how much time I have. Uh, one minute and 40 seconds. Okay, so this is the situation we're in. We've written letters, we've advocated, we've pried a few dollars out. What is it going to take? Maybe this is directed toward uh, Mr. Corbald. What is it going to take for us to see a meaningful difference so that we can stop having people dying on our streets simply due to the fact that there is a failure of government policy. Well, I would agree with uh, Ms. Kajener that we need to continue to keep working on it and keep pushing on it and and just not, not ever give up. I believe that area of work needs to focus on mental health. Uh, you know, if you want something systemic and transformative, it should be in the mental health area. It should be in the, in the opioid uh, crisis and drug poisoning area. And the one thing so we, the one thing we the have tried to do- The city can't do that though, Mr. Carbo. Well, we so, don't have yeah. the authority or the, or the money. No, but that we just gotta keep pushing the province. Now the one thing, uh, there's two other things we can do from a, a municipal perspective. The first is to keep on pressing and pushing and showing hard data to the province, which we are doing. It hasn't made a difference yet, but we, we, that's important because in some cases we have different data sets that we can't correlate. Some of the decisions they're making are based on different data. The other thing is in this report in attachment one, we have tried to take a human-centric approach, so we are trying to consider the encampments from the person who's in them and making sure they have access to whatever needs they might have, from basic needs like water and food and bathrooms to housing needs if they're willing to go there. Yeah, and that's what it is. We at the city do everything we can. We're putting every dollar we can into this, barring exponentially increasing taxes 
So I appreciate everything that uh, our administration is doing. We've heard that you could do it better, but then we hear that about every single item and it's probably true. That's just the spirit of continual improvement. Uh, and that's not a knock on anyone. That's just a, that, that's the way the world works. Okay, well, uh, I think I'm probably out of time at this point. Yep, thank you, Mr. You Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Uh, Councillor Salvador. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I absolutely share Councillor Paquette's frustration by the utterly inadequate levels of support provided by other orders of government. Um, the report that's in front of us today makes it incredibly clear that we're facing a significant increase in the number of Edmontonians who are experiencing homelessness. And I guess for me, despite that increase, I don't really see a significant shift in our, our response or, and our approach that is kind of commensurate to the challenges that we're facing. So I guess I worry that, you know, we're gonna see increased displacement of community members who are experiencing homelessness and kind of a pattern of, of shutting down camps without viable housing options and supports for people to turn to. Um, so I wanted to just follow up on Councillor uh, Tang's question around, you know, how many people are actually being transitioned? Um, you mentioned 17% of the folks who were housed uh, last year were living outside Ms. Jenner. And, and I'm wondering, you know, when we are trying to connect people with services, um, is that the 17% that you're referencing? And does that mean that the vast majority of folks are, are still gonna be living unhoused uh, just in a different location? Um, so Councillor Salvador, just to explain that number a bit more. Um, last year, a total of 291 people, so that's that 17% was 291 people who had identified that they were sleeping outside were housed last year. And that 291 is 17% um, of the total number of people who were housed last year, which is 1,719 total people um, were housed by the homeless serving system in Edmonton last year. Is that answer your question or is there another question? Uh that, that answers part of it, yeah. So then I'm just looking for clarity, you know, when we are, um, again, going in and to a high-risk encampment, for example, and, and trying to connect people with supports and services, what is that rate of folks who are being successfully transitioned to uh, shelter or bridge housing, as opposed to just kind of moving um, to a different location, still, still living unhoused? Okay, okay, now I, I understand your question. Um, so in terms of the high risk encampments where the priority, where there is like the imminent risk or public safety or individual safety risk, like presence of some like fire risk or um, there is, you know, predation happening or gang presence, those kinds of pieces, I will say that the uptake on shelter or housing options from those encampments is often not um, high uh, just because you know, like it's difficult to establish the relationship that's necessary with people to get them into housing when you, when um, removing the encamp is par is is a priority due to the safety risk. Okay, okay, I might come back to that one, but I appreciate the answer. Um, and I, I just want to get to one of the I guess options that some of our speakers brought up around having a willingness to experiment, um, potentially pilot some options that we haven't tried before. And I'm thinking about some of some of the locations like Dawson or Canard Ravine um, that have been typically more more challenging. Uh, is there is there room within our current approach to to try different different methods that are again rooted in um, housing as a human right, rooted in the compassionate approach? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Councillor Salvador. There, I think there's the, if I can speak for the people in administration and our partners who work on encampments, we're constantly trying to find ways to do this better. No one is satisfied with the status quo. Um, the real, and, and we've done a ton of work in, in recent years that maybe this council hasn't received, but we could refresh. Like there was a report that went in 2019 that looked at, you know, 20 different options around interim housing, everything from tiny homes to mobile shelters to a managed camp and provided information around costing around that. And what came out of that report was the jockey dorms at Bridge Housing. That is an innovation that we came up with in the last three years in response to encampments um, is to try and scale Bridge Housing as a proven solution in our city. 
Um, other examples of that include the encampment evaluation. We just did a 61-page evaluation of last year's encampment response that includes all manner of recommendations related to how we can um, both improve coordination and communication with um, neighbors and residents and um, the teams on the ground. Um, and we are, and identified areas where we need to do more to continue to try and evolve our response, including talking to people. But on balance, and, all, and then also I would mention in the, in the pandemic, we looked before opening um, the Tippanawa shelter at the convention center, we explored probably 10 different other potential solutions before we landed on the Tippanawa shelter as being the best solution in that moment. We've done a ton of research into different types of examples. It hasn't been for a lack of willingness to explore. It just on balance, the two solutions that stand out as the most likely to be successful to us in this moment are an Indigenous-led shelter, which is why that's coming to you through that CWSB work, and a multidisciplinary response team that's that's focused on encampments and incorporates new disciplines that haven't been at the table yet. Yeah, and I would just add, Councillor, that just because we're not recommending the managed encampment, which we looked at very carefully, uh, the reason we're not recommending that is because there's a lot of other evidence that say it doesn't work in other municipalities that have tried it. So we're also presenting you that, you know, we have checked from a jurisdictional scan perspective. We've looked at where it's taken place and where it hasn't worked. And so we could try that for the sake of trying it, but but the evidence shows that we've been able to see that it, it's not going to be a good solution. So that that is our recommendation for now. Thank Great. You. Well, I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thanks so much. A, a lot to unpack and, and obviously a really complex issue. Um, and, and I am struggling, you know, we've talked about how, how a lot of the report is sort of maintaining the status quo, maintaining the approach. So, so setting that aside right now, I guess I'm, I'm still not clear if this is the model we're moving forward with, have we adequately resourced that model? So for example, do we, I know, you know, we mentioned, um, additional cleanup crews, but is that going to be adequate given that we anticipate a rise? Um, what, what, I, what I'm not seeing in the report is what the budget implications are. Is it going to be sufficient to meet, to meet demand? Or is it just going to be more than it was last year? Well, I would say, Councillor Stevenson, we've received an unprecedented growth in the number of encampments, right? The report references that there were 721 complaints in 2018, and now we're up to 6,000. And so um, we believe that adding more resources is going to improve service levels, but ultimately, in the absence of defining a service level, it's difficult to say well, whether it'll be enough. I mean, this is, I think, something that we're struggling with on all manners of our unsheltered homelessness response, which is um, the city's role in light of the increased ne demand and need for our services when it's caused by, um, you know, this growing issue that is a complex issue that requires all the partners to be at the table to ultimately reduce demand. So I think we're, we've put what in the report what we think will be effective at maintaining um, the service levels we currently have in light of the growth in demand. Um, but ultimately, if council wants us to accelerate some of those service levels or improve upon them, then that would need to be a budget conversation. But like I said, in our we do have those CWSB profiles coming forward, which are two further strategies that we would recommend if council does desire to put more resources into something as being helpful for achieving the goal and the permanent solution, which is resolving unsheltered homelessness. And I would just add, Councillor, that you know, it depends on what the definition of adequate is. Like, we're not going to be able to clean up camps within sort of two days of them being identified, even if they're abandoned. We don't have those kind of resources to surge in sort of mm -hmm. all the time, 24 and 7, but... Yeah, and I, and I think it's like those are the, those are the things that I, I hear is what the community is looking for and what the community is asking. And so to not have a... I, I'm... Because I would be interested at least to understand what the resource implication for that would be if we, if we did want to go that direction. Because I, I mean, I think at this point it really is... Um, for lack of a better word, and I'm, I, I, maybe I'm a, I don't know, thinking on the spot, but like it is a harm reduction approach in the sense that we're just trying to minimize the impacts, right? Very true, yeah. And, and I feel that some of the, the key impacts that we're hearing from the community around, around cleanliness, um, that, that onus of reporting, um, and also the trauma that people are experiencing when they are displaced, we're not really tackling those things uh, maybe as directly as we could. Um, 
so sorry, so short on time, but you know, again, just really wanting to question, you know, the comment earlier that that the idea of having a social service agency representative for those high risk responses that that wouldn't be feasible. I just I want to dig into that a bit more. Yeah, I didn't say it wouldn't be feasible. I said it wouldn't be feasible in seventeen hundred camps because of the capacity issue. So. Right. And would that be, so just maybe to break out the numbers, so the high risk, was that there were 1,700 high risk responses? No, I believe that was 1,700 total camps that we cleaned up, yeah. Yeah, because I think I think that the the non-high risk response seems to have have some level of, of um, community involvement built into the process. It's slower, it's more of an outreach approach, but it's really those high risk ones where I see the greatest um, concern just in terms of that that trauma and just again wondering if we can embed those so social service e agencies just in the high risk responses. Yeah, I think that that's something we could absolutely pilot. Like, And we've already been trying to find our own management resources internally to be able to contract additional outreach workers. It's just, um, it's just, it takes some time. Like, and, that, and so when I say we're exploring it, it means like we're moving towards that path, but it takes time to amend the agreement, <laughs> hire the person, and then figure out who the right personality is to, you know, be, deliver that effective message in, the con in a context that sucks, right? Like no one wants to be displacing anybody, um, but it, when there's the threats, safety threats, then it's an, it's an, an unfortunate reality. 100%, I, I see that, and I and I wonder too if there is also just a, like an observer role that can happen with some of the mutual aid societies so that they are informed when a closure is happening, that they have the opportunity to be there if they, if they elect to do it as well as sort of a, a midterm solution as well. Um, I think, given just the operational nature of like the process and how the teams are um, assessing uh, risk, I think ultimately there's probably, we could, like, we could look at trying to inc increase communications around that, but I'm not sure that that would be um, operationally feasible to have someone present every time that that's happening, just given the volume of complaints that we receive and the number of, that we're receiving. One thing we are also looking at though is having um, outreach involved in the risk assessment process as well, because right now that is primarily an enforcement-led process, and we think having an outreach worker provide their input into that risk assessment might lead to some um, different outcomes, and that's something that we also are looking at piloting in addition to some changes to the risk assessment that we've identified through the evaluation report. So all of those things would fall into the continuous improvement that we referenced in the report. Thank you. Thank you, so we've uh, pretty much run out of time. Uh, so I think we're going to have to requisition this to City Council to continue the conversation. Uh, so, you want uh, to move that? I will say requisition and for yep. other. Mayor, you have to actually say the word. Mayor. Yes, we requisite this to Council. Okay, so we'll pick up the conversation then. I understand there may be a motion or perhaps more than one. Uh, so that deals with item 6.5. Uh, next on our agenda is item 6.3. I'm going to suggest that we refer uh, this. Point of to order, Mr. Chair. Are you able to say what date this re previous report is now coming to City Council? The next City Council meeting. Two weeks. Do, do we do we know the date of that? or? Yes, it's in your calendar. Two weeks. Got it. Okay. Uh, okay, so it doesn't have to be assigned. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, item 6.3. Then uh, I'm going to suggest that we... Uh, refer this back to agenda review committee. Normally, I would suggest we review it, put it back to community and public services committee. But the May 18th meeting, three weeks from today, is going to be a very busy meeting. Uh, that's our community safety and well-being uh, conversation, and there's uh, several agenda items coming to that day. So we'll refer this back to agenda review and try to find a spot for it and make that time specific so our speaker can. Uh, share his comments. So I'll move that. Please vote. Didn't, didn't, I didn't see the call. Thank um, you. Yes, yeah. We have five votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Uh, are there any notices of motion or motions without customary notice? I have a notice of motion that I think I shared with the clerk. I 
I don't nope. believe All I right. have record Sorry. of that. Bear with me then. Sorry. Apologies, uh, Madam Clerk. I thought I had sent that to you earlier, so I put that in a chat to you. And as that's coming up, I'll just read in. This is notice of motion. So at the May 9th City Council meeting, I'll move the following. That administration provide a report on the progress of land development at Blatchford that provides the following. One, a summary of the goals contained in the original business case that led to the council decision to close the airport and an analysis of whether or not each goal has been met. Two, a summary of all costs from the closure of the airport to now, including but not limited to all consultant costs, design competition costs, direct salary costs, development costs and carrying costs. Three, a summary of all sources of revenue, municipal, provincial, federal and private. Uh, four, a summary of the original project schedule, specifically regarding the pace of development and predicted sale, sales absorptions by year. Uh, five, a detailed analysis comparing incurred and expected expenditures to realized and expected revenues on a net present value basis. And six, a detailed analysis of potential development options that would see fast realization and maximization of lot sales revenue, including options to engage private sector partners to develop some or all of the remaining undeveloped land. So we'll get a chance to, to talk about that at the next council meeting. Are there any other notices of motion? Hearing none, we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody.